Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 3 of what if I was reincarnated into the Naruto world with the Skyrim system. Let the tale begin. Chapter 62, Let the Oblivion War Begin What about you, Ko? Naruto asked as we climbed to the top of the Hokage Tower. Naruto already summoned Jitengu and told him he wanted to go there to train. Much to the latter's delight. I will also go to the land of my summon and try to solve the crisis there. It will be training and recruiting. If I can pull it off, not only will I get stronger, I will also have different summons that can help me further in the future. I answered. This was my plan for a while now. I want to go to Oblivion to put some sense into other Deidre. How dare they rise against me? Okay, good. Naruto smirked as he looked at me. When we return, I will show you once and for all who is the elder brother. Sure, sure. I copied his smirk as I clasped my arm on my chest. Work hard, Naruto, and remember what I told you. He looked at my eyes gazing at his belly, he understood what I meant. I told him long ago to talk with Kurama to mend their relationship and not so subtly nudged him to believe Kurama was also a victim. After hearing it so many times, he too started to believe it. Now, they were talking often, but still Kurama wasn't fully trusting him. Hopefully in the years he spends in Tengu realm, he will learn how to fully work with Kurama. If not, I have a bad foreboding feeling that something can go awry. Soon, Naruto disappeared in smoke and only Tsunade, Kakashi, Jiraiya and I were left on the rooftop. Fifth Sama, if I may suggest, I think it would be wise to reach out to other villages and let the existence of Akatsuki and their goal be known. Why should we help other villages? Tsunade asked. Enemy of my enemy. I said only, then vanished as well. What they did after that wasn't my concern. Although I wanted them to form an alliance early to battle against Akatsuki, if they didn't, it wasn't the end of the game either. I have full trust in my abilities. Especially after a few years I will spend in oblivion. This kid is weird. Nothing like a thirteen-year-old. Tsunade shook her head, her eyes filled with both confusion and admiration for the young shinobi, Kaoshin. He was a prodigy in his own right, demonstrating skills and wisdom well beyond his years. Despite his young age, he possessed a mature, strategic mind and an uncanny ability to read situations and anticipate the needs of his teammates. How trustworthy is he? Jiraiya asked with a squint, trying to get a better understanding of the boy who had managed to gain the trust of so many within the village, including the Hokage herself. It was rare for someone so young to be trusted so implicitly, and Jiraiya wanted to know just what made Kaoshin stand out from the rest. I would bet my life on it. Kakashi said without hesitation. Kaoshin had saved his life twice, and on multiple occasions had gone out of his way to help others, even when it wasn't necessary. He had no doubt where Kaoshin's loyalty lay. As a member of Kakashi's Team 7, Kaoshin had formed a strong bond with his teammates, Naruto and Hinata. His unwavering support and quick thinking had often been the key to their success during missions. I also fully trust him. He is a good shinobi and brother. He wouldn't do anything to hurt Naruto, Tsunade added, her voice firm and determined. Jiraiya wanted to say something but, seeing as he was outnumbered, he shut his mouth and looked at the mountain. Seeing Minato's face, he helplessly sighed. He always thought he would make up with Naruto after he grew up, but now, he missed his chance. After all, he abandoned him when he was little. Kaoshin had proven himself time and time again, not only to his teammates but also to his sensei, Kakashi. His incredible skills and dedication to the village had earned him the respect and admiration of many. Tsunade also had a soft spot for Kaoshin, as he had stepped up to help on several occasions, always putting the needs of others before his own. In his very first mission, Kaoshin's keen instincts and intelligence had led him to uncover a secret ploy that ultimately saved the lives of three young jinnins. His resourcefulness and courage under pressure were traits that made him an invaluable member of the team. Not only was Kaoshin an excellent team player, but he was also an innovative thinker. 
He had invented a few variations of the Raisin technique and generously shared his discoveries with the village without holding anything back. His selflessness and commitment to the growth and protection of his fellow shinobi were traits that endeared him to both his peers and superiors. It's not just Naruto and Hinata that he has helped either, Kakashi continued. Kaushin has shared his insights with many others in the village. Ino, Shikamaru, Choji, Shino, and some others have been given brand new, innovative techniques no one has ever seen. If they can learn them, their power would soar. Tsunade nodded in agreement, that's true. He has been instrumental in helping the younger generation of shinobi develop new skills and techniques. It's impressive how much he has contributed to the growth of our village in such a short time. Jiraiya couldn't help but be impressed as well. It was clear that Kaushin was truly a special shinobi with a bright future ahead of him. But he still couldn't help but feel a pang of jealousy. Kaushin robbed his chance to connect with Naruto, and there was no one else to blame but himself. I appeared in the Maroon's temple and there stood the servant of this realm on her knees. Beside her was female arachnoids and Harada tribe with tens of Atronax. Shadowmere also came close to me and nudged me with her nose. I petted as I looked at all of them with a smile. Long time, no see. How have all of you been? We are great, my lord. Waiting for your return. The servant of this realm said as she too smiled. Good, this time I came here to conquer other planes of oblivion. Get everyone ready for battle. As soon as you are ready, we will charge to the closest plane. I ordered. As you command, my liege. All of them kneeled at the same time. After I dismissed them all except the servant of this realm, I sat on the throne. She was still on her knee. Tell me your name, calling you the way you introduced yourself as a mouthful. I said with a tired sigh. My name is Silva Vesuius, my lord. I was the priestess of Great Dagon. But in this realm, I am your servant. She said as she lowered her head further. I see. I nodded, rise Silva, since you are the only one who obeyed me, you will be my right hand. When I am not around, you are in control. Thank you, my lord. I will not fail your trust. She said with a full zest. Good. Now tell me the closest plane. I asked. There are several planes under different Daedric princes, and in all those planes there are different Daedras. Some of them are much more dangerous than others. Although I ordered them to prepare to battle to the closest plane, I am not planning to charge blindly. I will assess the situation first, then battle. Closest to us is Shivering Isles, my lord. Silva said. Gnarl, Bailiwog, Scalen, Grumite, Elytra, Skinhound, the Undead Shambles, the Daedric Golden Saint and Dark Seducer, the Hunger and the Flesh Afterneck. I muttered as I tried to remember. How do you know all of that, my lord? Silva asked in shock. I am the Chosen One, remember? I smiled lightly as I asked, do you think we can conquer there? It will be done, my lord. You just watch. She bowed as she reassured. All righty then, I will follow you and act if something goes awry. Chapter 63 Shivering Isles As the sun began to rise over the Shivering Isles, the sound of clanging metal echoed across the landscape. The armies of the Daedric Prince of Madness, Shiagarath, were mustering for battle, and their commander, Haskell, was overseeing the preparations. Haskell stood at the top of a hill, surveying the battlefield below. He watched as his troops assembled into formation, their armor glinting in the morning light. The Golden Saints and Dark Seducers, two rival factions of Deidre, stood side by side, united under Haskell's leadership. The conflict between the two factions of the Shivering Isles, the Golden Saints and the Dark Seducers, had been raging for years. Their bitter animosity towards each other had been fueled by differences in their beliefs and practices, and had led to countless battles and skirmishes. However, their long-standing feud was about to be overshadowed by a much greater threat. Rumors had reached them of an outsider, a powerful warrior known as the Dragonborn, who was coming to conquer their lands. The news sent shockwaves through both factions. 
Despite their mutual disdain, they knew that they would need to put aside their differences and work together if they were to have any chance of repelling the invader. It was a bitter pill to swallow. The Golden Saints and Dark Seducers had fought each other for so long that they had forgotten what it was like to stand together. But they had no choice. The Dragonborn was a force to be reckoned with, and they would need to pull their resources and skills if they hoped to defeat him in normal situations, but now, the same Dragonborn had conquered Deadlands and gathered all the Deidre under his banner. Now, he was charging with soldiers of Deadlands following behind him. The two factions met to discuss their plan of action. There was tension in the air as they negotiated, both sides still feeling indignant about the other's past transgressions. But they put their grievances aside and worked towards a common goal. As the Dragonborn's army approached, the Golden Saints and Dark Seducers stood side by side, their warriors locking shields and raising their weapons in unison. There were moments of hesitation and doubt, but ultimately, they would fight with all their might, determined to protect their lands and their people. The general could feel the tension in the air. His army had never faced an opponent like this before. The outsider, known as the Dragonborn, had come to conquer the Shivering Isles, and his reputation preceded him. Haskell knew that this would be a battle for the ages, one that would test the courage and mettle of his troops. Haskell barked out orders, directing his army to fortify their positions and prepare for the coming onslaught. The Dark Seducers and Golden Saints exchanged nervous glances, but they trusted their general's leadership and followed his commands. As the Dragonborn's army approached, the nervousness among Haskell's troops grew. The sound of the enemy's footsteps filled the air, and Haskell's heart pounded in his chest. He knew that this battle would determine the fate of the Shivering Isles, and he was determined to lead his troops to victory. He had been warned by Akatosh when he first came to be to bow down to the new ruler of Oblivion, but as soon as Akatosh vanished, all the other leaders turned their back to that order. All except one, Silva. At the time, some of them offered to take down Silva, but Haskell thought it was unnecessary. With time, they forgot about it. But after twelve years, they learned that the Chosen One had arrived. Kaushan stood at the edge of the Deidre army, his hands crackling with electricity as he surveyed the battlefield. He knew that the Deidre of Shivering Isles would be a formidable opponent, but he was confident in his abilities. Haskell's army consisted of the Narl, Bailiwog, Scalen, Gramite, Elytra, Skin Hound, the Undead Shambles, the Daedric Golden Saint and Dark Seducer, the Hunger, and the Flesh Atronach. They had formed a shield wall, and their lines were filled with the sound of metal scraping against metal. On the other side, Kaushan's army was made up of scamps, Clanfear, Daedroths, Flame Atronax, Frost Atronax, Storm Atronax, Spider Deidre, Anzivali, Harada Roots, Bloodgrass, and Spittle Plants. They formed a V formation, with the Atronax taking the front lines and the rest of the army behind them, ready to strike at any moment. Suddenly, Haskell emerged from the crowd, his dark robes billowing in the wind. He surveyed Kaushan with a cool detachment. I am Haskell, the slave of Shiagarath, Prince of Madness, he said, his voice tinged with a hint of amusement. This realm has always been his and no one else's. Kaushan merely smirked in response. I am Kaushan, the chosen of Akatosh, he said. This realm is my birthright. I would give you a choice to hand it over, but you already turned down that option years ago, am I right? Haskell's eyes narrowed. You have a lot of nerve, outsider, he said. Akatosh has no power in this realm. It is Shegarathas. With that, Haskell unleashed a torrent of dark magic towards Kaushan. Kaushan responded with a flurry of lightning bolts, the crackling energy tearing through the air towards Haskell. The two combatants clashed, their magic spells colliding in a spectacular display of light and sound. As they battled, they exchanged words. You are no match for the power of the Deidre, Haskell taunted, his voice tinged with amusement. Whatever party trick that you are using is not as powerful as magic. He. Kaushin chuckled, his voice laced with confidence. Let's see. I expected more from you, Haskell said, his voice tinged with annoyance. Kaushin merely chuckled in response. Let's start the real thing then. 
Kaoshin activated lightning chakra mode enveloped his body, crackling with electrical energy. His speed and reaction time increased dramatically, making him a blur as he moved around the battlefield. Haskell raised his hands, calling forth a barrage of magical words to try and slow Kaoshin down. But the blonde shinobi was too fast, dodging and weaving through the barrage with ease. Kaoshin closed the distance between himself and Haskell, launching a flurry of lightning-infused attacks. An eastern dragon made of lightning weaved through the battlefield as it approached Haskell. The latter's magic shielded him from some of the attacks, but Kaoshin was relentless, pressing forward with his assault. Haskell tried to fight back, using his own magic to counter Kaoshin's lightning attacks. But he was struggling to keep up with Kaoshin's speed and power. The blonde shinobi's lightning chakra mode was just too much for him to handle. Wards that could counter magic attacks were almost useless against Jutsu. Chapter 64 vs. Haskell Kaoshin smirked, seeing that he had the upper hand. He decided to unleash one of his original Jutsu lightning blade. This was something he came up with after he learned Chidori from Kakashi. Basically a bladed version of Chidori but his version was vibrating constantly. He focused his chakra into his hand, creating a sharp, jagged blade of lightning, vibrating as it cried. Haskell saw the attack coming, but it was too late. Kaoshin's lightning blades sliced through his defenses like they were paper, striking Haskell squarely in the chest. The Deidre general staggered back, his magic faltering. He knew that he had been defeated. Kaoshin stepped forward, his lightning chakra mode still active. He looked down at Haskell, who was struggling to stay upright. You fought well, Kaoshin said, with a mockery-laced voice, but it's time for you to admit defeat. Haskell nodded, acknowledging his defeat. Will you spare me? I will serve you. He. -he. Kaoshin chuckled. You should have waited on your knees, then you might have become my left-hand man, but now, I will send you back to your precious Shiagareth. The clash of the two armies echoed throughout the Shivering Isles as the Daedric forces of Kaoshin charged against Haskell's army. The scamps and clanfears led the vanguard, their claws and teeth gleaming in the sunlight. The Daedros followed behind, their massive size and brute strength crushing any resistance they encountered. Haskell's army responded with a barrage of Gnarl and Bailiwug, their swift movements and powerful strikes causing havoc among the Daedric ranks. The skin hounds snarled and bared their teeth, tearing apart the flesh of their enemies. The undead shambles and the Daedric golden saints and dark seductresses unleashed waves of powerful magic, blasting their foes with fiery spells and lightning bolts. But Kaoshin's army was not easily deterred. The flame Atronax let loose jets of flame that incinerated everything in their path, while the frost Atronax covered the battlefield in a blanket of ice, slowing the enemy's advance. The storm Atronax summoned lightning bolts from the sky, striking down any who dared to challenge them. The spider Deidre and Zivali struck from the shadows, their sharp blades cutting through Haskell's army with ease. Harada roots, blood grass, and spittle plants erupted from the ground, ensnaring their foes and pulling them underground. The battle raged on for hours, the Daedric forces of Kaoshin and Haskell's army locked in a deadly struggle for supremacy. The ground shook with the impact of powerful attacks, and the air was filled with the cries of the wounded and dying. Silva charged towards the enemy with her sword in one hand and her staff in the other. She was a sight to behold, with her black hair flowing behind her and her armor shining in the sun. The army behind her was inspired by her bravery and followed her lead. The battlefield was chaotic, with spells and weapons flying everywhere, but Silva remained calm and collected. As she battled, Silva also commanded her troops, shouting orders and rallying the soldiers. For our sovereign, Kaoshin. For oblivion. We fight for a united world. Her words echoed through the battlefield, inspiring her troops to fight harder. Silva used her staff to cast powerful spells, while her sword slashed through the enemy's defenses. She was a force to be reckoned with, taking down enemies left and right. As the battle raged on, Silva's determination did not waver. Finally, after hours of intense fighting, Silva emerged victorious. She stood amongst the defeated enemies, her sword and staff at the ready. 
Akatosh created Oblivion for the Chosen One, Dragonborn, she said, her voice ringing out across the battlefield. And today, we have fought to unite it once again for our sovereign, Kaushin. We have shown the enemy that we are not to be underestimated. We have proven our strength and our loyalty. The troops cheered as Silva stood tall, victorious. They knew that they had a true leader in her, someone who was not afraid to fight alongside them and command them to victory. With Haskell dead, and most of their troops lying in blood, the rest of Haskell's army threw away their resistance and knelt on the ground, in front of Kaushin who looked down at them with cold indifference. Hey! Servants of Isles, I come before you today with a promise. I have taken the Isles, and soon I will take the rest of Oblivion. Those who obeyed me from the beginning, those who saw the truth of my rule and submitted willingly, will be rewarded. They will be allowed to continue to exist under my rule, and will benefit from the peace and prosperity that I bring. However, there are those who resist me, who choose to cling to their old ways and their old loyalties. They choose to stand against the inevitable march of progress, and for that they will be punished. They will feel the full weight of my wrath, and they will learn the hard way that my rule is absolute. But do not fear, my little Deidre, for I am not a cruel ruler. I am simply a just one, and those who stand with me will be rewarded. The rest will learn to fear me, and will eventually submit to my rule. Such is the way of things, and there is nothing that can be done to change it. So I call on all of you to kneel. Kneel before your true ruler. I am the sovereign of oblivion. These lands, all of these, everything you see and beyond your comprehension are my birthright. Bow to my rule. First to fall was Silva, who was awed by the sudden aura unleashed by Kaushin. She had never felt it on him before, but as he looked at the dead bodies, all of a sudden this magnificence appeared out of nowhere. Rest of the Deidre soon followed suit. They were on their knees, looking at Kaushin with apprehension and awe. Oh, how they were fooled! If they knew the Dragonborn was the born leader of these realms, would they even resist? Haskell tricked them into believing Dragonborn was just a mortal playing with gods. How did they fall? Silva, rise. Kaushin said. You don't kneel ever again. Those who bowed to my rule at the beginning also rise. You will be the leaders of your races as we conquer more lands. Your destiny will start from now on. Chapter 65 Madness Magic It is hard to act like an edgelord. I sighed as I looked at the battlefield filled with dead Deidre bodies covering as far as the eye could see. I had to though, as this was how princes of oblivion acted. If I had been merciful or listless, I still would have conquered shivering isles, but their respect wouldn't be from the heart. That would be troublesome, wouldn't it? Meh, I just want to get this over with. Master, we had killed the traitors. Silva reported. After the battle, she took her trusted minions to kill those who went into hiding. When Haskell died, some ran away, and they had to be killed or that was what Silva said. Good job, Silva. I nodded as I walked to Haskell's body. I mentally selected the search option and a list of items appeared on my face. At the same time a smile crept up to my beautiful face. Perk points. Yes. Score. I started to dance awkwardly while my new minions were questioning their judgment, but that wasn't all. I saw something interesting in the list. Take all. I commanded and a key appeared in my hand then it melted into a wisp of energy. As soon as it did, I felt a foreign energy entering my body, filling my groins where my chakra stored. What is this? Realm of Prince of Madness had been conquered. You are now the sovereign of Shivering Island and acquired a unique perk. Madness Magic Learned Madness Magic, once a week, you can use this magic to change any item to something random. The effect will be permanent or temporary depending on the user's will. The changed item can become something better or worse depending on the nature of the magic. Silva I called out as soon as I finished reading the new ability. Master? She knelt on the ground as she looked at me weirdly. My voice was demanding now. I acquired the key of the realm from Haskell's body, marking me the sovereign of the realm. 
I said as I looked at her face to see her reaction. As I expected, she started to shake in distress. What about the key of the Deadlands? Master, I didn't betray you, I promise. Silva said with a pained look. Explain yourself. I demanded. I had enough of this for now. Deadlands is different from others, as it is the first realm you landed. The key will only reveal itself when you conquer all the other realms. I did know its existence, but didn't share it because I thought it would deviate you from your goal. I am sorry to make such a decision on my own. Silda's face was on the ground as she explained. Could Haskell use it? I asked with a sigh, holding back my anger. No, master. No one but princes can use the keys. Silva reported in hopes of redeeming herself. Don't make decisions on your own. I said and walked away to the other Deidre to loot them too. Sadly not all of them gave perk points, but there were a lot of dead bodies on the ground, so the spoils of war weren't low. After I was done with it, I returned to the Deadlands and sat on my throne, looking at the perks. Why is it so hard to earn perk points? I lamented in hypocrisy. I just acquired more than fifty in one battle yet still my greed was as boundless as ever. Elemental Affinity, I looked at the perk under the ninja to skill tree. The first two perks were activated due to my innate elements. Katan and Raitun. And the third one costs fifteen perk points. This greedy shithole wants to rob me of my perk points. Five perk points increase for each element. I used to lament at this but now it seems so little. Ah, how unfortunate that the rich are. The higher you rise, the further the sky gets. Anyways, take my fucking fifteen perk points and get me my new element. I sighed as I commanded and fifteen points were deducted from my total. Let's go with Dotan. Why Dotan? I am glad you asked. See, I can implement Katan with it. That is the first. Increases defense, that is second. It is also the other element my team lacks. Naruto is the master of Futon, and Hinata is Suetun. As I feared, the cost increased to 20 points for the fourth element, which begs the question. How much do I have to pay for Kekiai Jinkai? Well, let's look at the perk at the top of the tree. Elemental Fusion, mixing two or more elemental natures. Cost extra 50, Perk points for each element. Fuck sake. It means creating any Kekiai Jinkai would cost 50 plus 100 is equal to 150 perk points. Tota, 300, perk points, Yanka, 500, perk points, and Kekiai Mora, 850, perk points. Do I look like some sort of perk point tycoon? I am just a pauper person that loot suckers he kills. Yeah, no. It is too much. Although Mora is strong, I cannot use it as I am now. What am I going to do with truth-seeking balls? Shove them up my ass? Other perks are better anyway. Let's start with Summoning Tree this time. After all, I got new minions. Summoning Proficiency 1 out of 5 increases the proficiency with Summoning Jutsu, allowing you to summon more powerful creatures and control them more effectively by reducing chopper requirement. First one activated itself when I dropped my blood in Deadlands. Which meant I signed a contract. Second one requires ten, perk points and five more for the next. Summoning Bonds Increases the user's bond with their summoned creatures, making it easier to summon and control them. One time only, but not sure if I need it. I will conquer the lands and they will bow to me. Though, I guess there is a merit in allowing them to bond with me. Not expensive anyways, just 15, perk points. I will consider it. Multiple summons 0 out of 5. Allows the user to summon multiple creatures at once with less chakra consumption. Basically chakra saving perk. I can already summon multiple summons, though it would be a heavy toll on my chakra. 5 for first, 10 for second. Summoning trap. Allows the user to set a trap that summons a creature when triggered, catching their enemies off guard. Now this is something amazing. I can mark a place with this trap, 
and depending on the trigger I choose it can summon itself upon my enemies. It is 50, perk points, but it is definitely worth it. Not now though. Healing summons. Healing my summons instead of offing them like regular summons. Not bad, I say. It uses my chakra to heal them from a distance. But it is too expensive. 100, perk points. Chapter 66 colon 3 keys. What is the next plane? I asked with blood dripping from my body. Not my blood though, I guess it was a werewolf or werebear. I don't know, were something it was. Furry motherfuckers of hunting grounds. They were one of the first to deny my sovereignty according to Silva. Master, Silva knelt, I think we should skip the next one and leave it as the last. Hmm. I looked at the kneeling general of mine with a frown. It has been almost a year, and I conquered four other planes. In order, Moonshadow, Azure's plane. The cunt's priestess was a pain in the ass, but in the end, I was able to bring her down. There were only winged twilights, and a single moonshadow elf that was the priestess. She single-handedly commanded the rest of the denizens of the plane and put up a harsh battle. If it wasn't for Deidre that joined me after I conquered Shivering Isles, I could have lost more than I gained in that battle. At least the key I acquired upon conquering wasn't that bad. Twilight Key, this key would grant the user the ability to manipulate light and darkness while creating illusions. Sounds lame, right? Right? But guess what? When merged with my body, suddenly Yin and Yang nature transformations were activated without me spending any perk points, which was a win if you ask me. After all, those two fuckers, despite almost all creature having those natures since birth, were separated in my perk tree. I had to spend more than 50 perk points to activate them, so not only does this key allow me to manipulate light and darkness when creating Jinjutsu, it also saves 50 perk points. The next was Attribution's share. Bothia's plane. An even bigger cunt than Azura. There were snakes. Lots of and all kinds of snakes. It was basically Orochimaru's wet dream. After all, Bothia was infamous for betrayal. The cunt's cult was based on betraying your companions. The key was good. Not only good, it was mouth-watering. Attribution's share key, the golden key shaped like a quill pen. When merged with the user's body, it grants the ability to speak with great eloquence and persuade others with his words. The user can also use this ability to inspire his allies and boost their morale in battle. Not only did it increase the level of speech, it also gave these unique abilities. I was already overpowered when it came to convincing others, and now, with this ability, I will be unstoppable, baby. Maybe Naruto was born with something like this? Food for thought. He has one overpowered talk no jutsu after all. Third, the fields of regret. Clavicus Viles Plane. Boring, boring, and boring. It was boring. Key of Redemption, this key grants the user the power to heal wounds. Once in a three years, the user can use it to heal himself or someone else of physical or emotional wounds. When used on an item, it can repair and restore it to its original state, even if it was previously broken or damaged. Thoughts? I don't know. Is it better than healing jutsu? Hell yeah it is. Not only can it heal physical wounds, it can also heal lunatics. Which, in Naruto world, is like a golden hand. I can become Midas with this shit, but three years of cooldown. I really don't know. Need to test its limits before knowing. The last one, and the reason why I am bloody right now, Herson's hunting grounds. The furry fuckers were endless. They came down on me like a torrent. With bloodthirsty fuckers upon my army, it was one hell of a fight. If it were only werebitches, it wouldn't be much of a deal, but there were all kinds of hairy creatures upon me. At the forefront wolves and bears. I looked at the last ability I gained in distress. I am not sure if it's good or not. Key of Transformation, this key allows the user to transform into different creatures and gain their abilities. Once a day, he can use it to transform into a powerful beast or animal, granting him enhanced strength, 
speed, and senses. One of the perks of Hinge Skill Tree was Animal Hinge, which allowed me to turn into animals without gaining any extra. When the key merged with me, the ability awakened the perk, which is a win. After all, the perk costs 40 perk points. But now I can only use the perk once a day, even if I don't want to use extra abilities that come with the transformation. The fucker fucked me good. On the other hand, it is way above Henge. If I turn into an animal, no one, not even Sage of Six Path, can differentiate me from a regular animal. Which makes it really overpowering. Nothing I can do about it. I shook my hand and looked at Silva and finally, why do you think we should skip the next one? The next plane is Apocrypha and its guardian is Miric. Silva said with a wry smile. Miric? The fucking ancient dragonborn who made pact with floating eyeball. That fucker is in Apocrypha for years and waiting for me? Talk about challenges. Man, why do I have to deal with these arrogant bastards? Akatosh, with all due respect, but fuck you. Couldn't you exclude these cunts when you created this oblivion for me? Do you want to watch me squirm or watching me getting my ass kicked, get you off? What is your deal, oh god of dragons and cunts? Yup, we are skipping all right. That fucker is a guardian? Hell to the no. A dragonborn on my ass. Nope, thank you. I am not even sure if I ever want to go there, ever. Miric with all those shouts can send my ass back to Kanoha. What would I tell my darling if I appeared but naked in front of all of a sudden? God damn it! Chapter 67 Shinobi on a Shadowy Steed A year and a half had passed since Kaushin left the village for training. Ino, Choji, and Shikamaru had grown and become stronger under Asuma's guidance. They had been assigned a dangerous mission deep within enemy territory, one that required their full attention and skill. As they began their journey, Ino couldn't help but think back to the time she had spent with Kaushin. The laughter, the teasing, the unspoken affection that had always lingered beneath the surface of their banter. She remembered the warmth of his embrace, the way his eyes sparkled when he smiled, and the gentle pressure of his hand in hers. Ino had grown into a beautiful young woman, her hair now longer, cascading down her back like a velvety sun. Her eyes, like the sky, were as blue as the sea. Her heart ached with longing for her dearest friend, and she couldn't help but wonder where he was now, and if he still thought of her. As the memories washed over her, she clutched the bag on her belt containing the vial of blood and chakra papers tightly in her hand, a constant reminder of the promise they had made to one another. Eno knew that Kaushin was out there somewhere, growing stronger and braver by the day. And she drew strength from that knowledge, determined to make him proud and prove herself worthy of his love and affection. The mission began smoothly, with the team infiltrating the enemy's base and gathering crucial intel. However, things quickly went awry. A sudden ambush by the enemy forces separated Asuma from his students, leaving Ino, Choji, and Shikamaru to fend for themselves. As they looked around, their hearts sank in despair. This was it, the end of the road. No hope of escape, no chance of survival. They were trapped, surrounded by their relentless enemies, who had planned this ambush with ruthless precision. The air was thick with tension as they braced themselves for the inevitable. They could see the glint of weapons in the hands of their adversaries, tens of them, all strong and determined to carry out their promised death. At that moment, time seemed to slow down, and they knew that this was the end. The leader of the opposing forces sneered, his intentions all too clear. You're a pretty little thing, aren't you? I think I'll have some fun with you before I kill you. We will definitely have fun. Eno's body trembled, her mind reeling with a potent mix of dread and despair. The enemy leader's cold, cruel eyes bored into her very soul, promising nothing but pain and degradation. She couldn't bear the thought of being subjected to such inhumanity, of being defiled by this monster. Her thoughts raced, consumed by a desperation that threatened to drown her. She couldn't see a way out, couldn't find an escape from the nightmare that was unfolding before her. As she stared into the face of her tormentor, she began to contemplate the unthinkable, choosing death over the fate that awaited her. In the midst of her turmoil, 
she remembered the promise she had made to Kaushan, and the fierce love and devotion that had fueled it. Her mind replayed his words, his fierce determination to protect her, to stand by her side no matter the cost. If I have to die to save you, I will, he had whispered, his eyes blazing with conviction. I would rather die with you than live in a world without you. Eno's heart clenched at the memory, tears streaming down her face as she realized the gravity of her decision. To choose death would mean breaking her promise to Kaushan, leaving him to face the world alone without her by his side. But the alternative was too horrifying to contemplate. And so, with her body shaking and her spirit crushed, Eno made a silent vow to Kaushan, a final hesitation to honor her promise or prepare to meet her end. I'm so sorry, Kaushan, she whispered, her voice choking with emotion. I shouldn't. I don't want to summon you to this hell, but I have to. I can't live through what they want to do to me, I would rather die. I hope you'll forgive me for wanting to die with you. I hope you can hug me in my death. Her heart was heavy with conflicting emotions. Was she selfish to want to be joined by her beloved in death? Was love truly about sacrificing oneself for their partner? Or was it something more profound, something that transcended the boundaries of mortality and bound them together even in death? She couldn't help but wonder if their love would be stronger if they passed on to eternity hand in hand. It was for this reason that Kaushan had made her promise to summon him in her death, so that they could depart from this world together. And she was determined to honor that promise, to be together till the very end. For she knew that she couldn't bear the thought of Kaushan dying alone too, without her by his side. She would rather be summoned by him too. As she steeled herself for the end, she reached for the vial of blood and chakra papers with trembling hands, a final, desperate attempt to summon Kaushin and honor their bond. The enemy sneered at them, a look of contempt etched on their face as they watched them standing there, their bodies trembling with fear and desperation. They wanted nothing more than to see them crumble, to kneel down and beg for mercy. It was all just a game to them, a chance to revel in their own superiority and assert their dominance over their hapless victims. With their overwhelming numbers, they had them firmly under their control, and they knew it. The end was inevitable, or so they thought. Suddenly, the enemy leader's gaze fell upon the paper clutched in her hand, and he burst out laughing, a loud, boisterous sound that echoed through the air. Without warning, he swiped his hand, unleashing a powerful gust of wind that threatened to knock them off their feet. But even in the face of such overwhelming power, they stood firm, their fear giving way to a steely resolve that burned deep within their souls. They would not kneel, they would not beg. They would face their fate with courage and dignity, even if it meant staring death in the face. The chakra paper, now stained with Kaushin's blood, was snatched from Eno's grasp by a sudden gust of wind. Her eyes widened in terror as she watched it float away, her last hope seemingly slipping through her fingers. The enemy forces laughed cruelly, relieved that nothing had happened. Looks like your pathetic last attempt has failed, girl, the leader sneered, stepping closer to Eno. Now, where were we? Ah yes, let's free you from those bothersome clothes. Eno's heart pounded in her chest, her eyes locked on the chakra paper as it drifted further away. She felt torn, wondering if she should risk wasting the last drop of Kaushin's blood or accept her fate. As she hesitated, the paper finally settled onto the ground, seemingly forgotten by everyone. And then, in her darkest moment, when all hope seemed lost, a miracle happened. Just as the enemy forces turned their attention back to Eno, a powerful reverberation shook the ground beneath their feet. The sound of pounding hooves echoed through the air, growing louder and more menacing with each passing moment. A figure on horseback appeared, silhouetted against the setting sun, charging towards them with a fierce intensity that made the enemy forces falter. Eno's heart leaped into her throat as she took in the sight of the figure on the horse. Could it be? As the rider drew closer, she realized, with a mixture of shock and relief, that it was indeed Kaushin. He was taller now, his shoulders wider, his body packed with slender muscles. His purple eyes, reflecting the full moon, promised cold brutality, and his hair was a tad longer, falling to his neck like a mane of sun reflecting the setting sun on his back, a great contrast to the moon in the sky. As he approached, Eno's heart swelled with a mix of relief, 
happiness, regret, and desperation. She could hardly believe that he was really there, that he had come to save her. The enemy forces were numerous and strong, and she knew that the odds were stacked against them. But, even if they were to die together, they would do so with their promises to each other fulfilled. His steed, a creature seemingly born from the shadows themselves, was an imposing sight. Its dark, glossy coat gleamed in the moonlight, and its fiery red eyes blazed with a fierce intelligence that reflected the dusking sun. This was Shadowmere, a creature of legend, and together with Kaushan, they made an unstoppable force. Kaushan rode an abyss black horse, standing two meters tall and rippling with muscle. Eno had never seen such a fearsome creature before, but she instinctively knew that it was on their side. The horse's very presence seemed to strike fear into the hearts of their enemies. As Kaushan closed the distance between them, Eno could see the fierce determination in his eyes, and she knew that he would do whatever it took to protect her. She couldn't help but feel a pang of guilt for summoning him into such a dangerous situation, but her heart swelled with gratitude and love at the sight of him, willing to risk everything for her. Kaushan rode his horse with lightning speed, positioning himself between Eno and the enemy forces. His gaze never wavered from the enemy leader, his eyes cold and unforgiving. He raised his voice, his words echoing through the battlefield. Stay away from her. You will not touch her, or any of them, not even a single hair, he snarled, his tone leaving no room for doubt or negotiation. The enemy leader sneered, trying to appear unfazed, but Eno could see the flicker of fear in his eyes. And who do you think you are, he challenged, trying to maintain his bravado. Kaushin, he replied simply, as if the name carried the weight of a thousand warnings. And I am here to keep my promise. Eno watched from behind Kaushin, her heart pounding with a mixture of relief and worry. She had faith in Kaushin's abilities, but the enemy forces were numerous, and she knew that the battle ahead would be fierce. With a mighty roar that echoed across the battlefield, Kaushin charged forward, his heart blazing with a fierce determination to protect the ones he loved. In front of him lay a sea of enemies, their numbers seeming almost insurmountable. But Kaushin was undaunted, his resolve unbreakable as he rode his powerful steed into the midst of the fray. As he fought, his eyes were fixed on the battered forms of his comrades Eno, Choji, and Shikamaru lying helplessly behind him. He would not allow them to be harmed, not while he drew breath. And as he looked at Eno, his love, he could feel his anger boiling over. The lustful gazes of the enemy upon her only fueled his rage further, and he swore to himself that he would make them pay for their insolence. With each swing of his weapon, Kaushin moved with a grace and ferocity that left his enemy stunned. He fought with an otherworldly skill, honed by his time in the dangerous realms of oblivion. Drawing on the power of the Dominion's grasp key, he weakened the willpower of his foes, making them vulnerable to his Jinjutsu. As his enemies fell before him, their once confident gazes replaced with fear and submission, Kaushi knew that victory was within his grasp. But there was one foe who still stood in his way, the enemy leader, whose iron will had managed to resist Kaushin's full power. Kaushin and the enemy leader faced each other, their eyes locked in a deadly stare. The air crackled with electricity as they both prepared to unleash their most devastating techniques. The enemy leader had the power to use the jutsu of a powerful Jounin, hoping to catch Kaushin off guard when he attacked. But Kaushin was ready, dodging and weaving as he launched a barrage of right ton, Rasen Senmen attacks that rained down on his opponent like lightning bolts. The enemy leader tried to retaliate, using a combination of Dotan and Katan jutsu to create a shield and deflect Kaushin's attacks. But Kaushin was undeterred, unleashing a powerful Katan, Rasen's spear that shattered the enemy's defense and left him vulnerable to Kaushin's next move. With lightning-fast reflexes, Kaushin closed in on the enemy, his fist covered in a spinning mass of earth and stone, Dotan, Rasen Knuckle. He slammed his fist into the enemy's chest, sending him flying backward with a sickening crunch. But Kaushin was not done yet. He wanted to make the enemy pay for what he had done to Eno and her comrades. He continued to toy with his opponent, unleashing a barrage of right ton, Rasen Simbin attacks that sliced through the air like a thousand razor-sharp needles. The enemy leader tried to fight back, but he was no match for Kaushin's sheer power and skill. 
With each passing second, he grew weaker, his movements becoming slower and more labored. And as Kaushin landed the final blow, a devastating right ton, Rasen saw an attack that tore through the enemy's body like a buzzsaw, the other enemies could only watch in horror and despair. They knew that they were facing a force unlike any they had ever encountered, a shinobi whose power and skill were beyond measure. As Kaushin emerged victorious, his enemies lay broken and defeated at his feet. He had shown them what true hopelessness looked like, and he had avenged Eno and his comrades with a brutal and unrelenting ferocity that left no doubt in anyone's mind. As the dust settled, Kaushin turned to face Eno, who stood in awe of the man who had come to her rescue. Their eyes met, and for a moment, the world around them seemed to fade away. Emotion swelled within them, a mixture of relief, gratitude, and the deep bond that had always connected them. Eno ran towards Kaushin, her arms open wide, and he enveloped her in a tight embrace, lifting her off her feet as they held each other tightly. Their hearts beat in unison, a tender rhythm that spoke of their love for one another. Her emotions were in shambles. She had hoped to die with her beloved, tearing her heart in two by staying loyal to her promise to summon him to his death, but despite what she thought, Kaushin was able to beat numerous enemies, not only saving her and others, but also avenging the desperation they felt. Shikamaru and Choji, exhausted but alive, watched the emotional reunion from a distance. They exchanged a knowing glance, silently agreeing to give their friends some space to reconnect. As they tended to their wounds, they couldn't help but feel grateful for Kaushin's timely arrival and the incredible power he had displayed. Kaushin slowly lowered Eno back to the ground, their eyes never leading each other's. They were both a little older, a little wiser, and the intensity of their emotions had only grown in the time they had been apart. Their hands lingered, their fingers intertwined as they took a step back to study one another. You've changed, Kaushin, Eno said softly, her eyes shimmering with unshed tears. You're, stronger, more confident. But your heart is still the same. You came for me when I needed you most. Kaushin smiled, a warm, tender expression that reached his eyes. And you, Eno, he replied, his voice thick with emotion. You've grown into an even more incredible Kunoichi. I'm so proud of you. Eno blushed at the compliment, her heart swelling with happiness. The world around them seemed to fall away as they stood there, basking in the warmth of their connection. In that moment, all their fears and doubts faded, replaced by a sense of belonging, of knowing they were meant to be by each other's side. Kaushin reached up to brush a stray lock of hair from Eno's face, his fingers gentle against her skin. I missed you, Eno, he murmured, his voice barely more than a whisper. Every day, I thought of you and wondered if you were safe, if you were happy. Eno's eyes filled with tears, and she leaned into his touch. I missed you too, Kaushin. So much. But I always knew, deep down, that we would find our way back to each other. As their emotions threatened to overwhelm them, Kaushin leaned in, pressing his forehead against Eno's. They stood there, their breath mingling, their hearts beating in sync. It was as if they were speaking without words, their souls connecting on a level beyond the physical. Eno's eyes flickered with uncertainty as she reluctantly pulled back from their tender embrace. Kaushin, she whispered, her voice wavering. Do you, do you have to leave again? Kaushin's expression shifted, a mixture of determination and sorrow crossing his face. He hesitated, his fingers gently tracing the curve of her cheek. I... I have to, you know. There are still a few more problems I need to solve, and it might take some time. I wish I could stay, but... Eno nodded, her eyes glistening with tears. She understood the weight of his responsibilities, the sacrifices he had to make for the greater good. But it didn't make the prospect of losing him again any easier to bear. Promise me something, Kaushin, Eno said, her voice barely more than a whisper. Promise me you'll come back to me. No matter how long it takes, no matter what challenges you face, promise me you'll find your way back. Kaushin's eyes shone with unshed tears as he took Eno's hands in his. I promise, Eno, he vowed, his voice thick with emotion. No matter what happens, I will always come back to you. You are my anchor, my guiding light, and my heart. 
I can't imagine a life without you by my side. The corners of Eno's mouth lifted in a playful smile as she whispered, You are still the lame dork. The words, though teasing, were tinged with a tenderness that made Kaushin's heart swell. Laughter trembled in his voice as he responded, his eyes shimmering with love. I guess some things never change, he murmured gently. I'll always be your lame dork, Eno. Their laughter intertwined, creating a harmony that echoed through the night, a testament to the unshakable bond they shared. Embraced in each other's arms, they found solace in their connection, a love that had transcended time and distance. Tears of longing and relief flowed down Eno's cheeks as she leaned in, capturing Kaushin's lips in a fervent, soul-searing kiss. Their love, a force both fragile and indestructible, bound them together in a way that defied logic and reason. As their lips parted, Eno nestled her head against Kaushin's chest, the steady rhythm of his heartbeat an anchor in the storm. For that fleeting, precious moment, they were whole, their souls woven together in a tapestry of love that reached beyond the confines of the world around them. But the harsh reality of their circumstances soon encroached upon their stolen reverie. With a heart heavy with sorrow and resolve, Kaushin reluctantly extricated himself from Eno's embrace, his eyes brimming with unspoken promises. I have to go, Eno, he whispered, the words a bitter pill on his tongue. But remember, I will come back to you. I promise. Eno nodded, her heart clenched by the agony of their imminent parting. As Kaushin mounted Shadowmere, his silhouette melted with the moonlit sky, an image forever etched into her memory. The wind caressed them gently, weaving their promises, dreams, and love into a tapestry of unbreakable devotion. As Kaushin and Shadowmere vanished into the darkness, Eno clung to the memories of their stolen moments, the love they had shared, and the promises they had made. She knew that soon, Kaushin would return to her, and their hearts would be reunited once more. Until that fateful day arrived, she would hold on to the love that bound them together, using it as a guiding light to navigate the darkest nights, the most turbulent storms, and the fiercest battles. For deep within her soul, she knew that Kaushin was hers, just as she was his. Their love, a powerful force that defied all odds, would be the beacon that illuminated their path, leading them back to each other's arms, where they belonged. Chapter 68 Merrick Kaushin stood tall on the battlefield, his hands on his hips, surveying the enemy forces with a smirk. Beside him, Silva Vesuius, his trusted general and right-hand woman, exuded an air of confidence and determination. Kaushin's loyal Deidre army from the various realms he conquered spread out behind them, an intimidating sight to behold. The Deidre forces were a diverse and powerful bunch, with scamps, Clanfear, Daedroths, Flame Atronax, Frost Atronax, Storm Atronax, Spider Deidre, and Zivali, as well as Harada Roots, Bloodgrass, and Spittle Plants. Each Deidre stood ready for battle, eager to follow Kaushin into victory against Merrick's forces. As Kaushin locked eyes with Merrick, the dragonborn of the past, he couldn't help but grin. Well, well, well. If it isn't the legend himself, Merrick. Didn't anyone tell you it's rude to crash someone else's party? Merrick glared back, clearly unamused. Chosen one, you may have conquered the other realms, but Apocrypha won't fall as easily. My army is unlike anything you've faced before. Kaushin chuckled, unfazed by the threat. Oh, I'm well aware of that, Merrick. But you should know by now that I'm not your average, run-of-the-mill Nords. I've got tricks up my sleeve you can't even imagine. Behind Merrick, his army of seekers, high seekers, lurkers, lurker vindicators, lurker sentinels, lurker guardians, Saratar, and other dragons stood their ground, watching the exchange between the two powerful leaders. Merrick, himself, was a force to be reckoned with, wielding the abilities he possessed in the game. Silva stepped forward, addressing Merrick. You underestimate Chosen One at your own peril. The combined might of all the Deidre from the realms we've conquered is nothing to scoff at. Kneel now, and we might just spare your life. Merrick snorted, clearly unimpressed by Silva's bravado. Empty threats, Silva. You know as well as I do that only one of us can walk away from this battlefield. It's either you and your precious Kaushin, 
or it's me and my loyal army. Kaushin clapped his hands together, a mischievous glint in his eyes. All right then, Merrick. If it's a fight you want, it's a fight you'll get. But let me just remind you, I've come this far, and I don't plan on stopping now. So, let's get this party started, shall we? With a nod from Kaushin, Silva signaled the Deidre forces to advance, their battle cries filling the air as they charged toward Merrick's army. Merrick, in turn, ordered his own forces to meet the oncoming enemy head-on. As the two armies collided in a storm of chakra, magic, and brute force, the battlefield erupted into a chaotic maelstrom of violence and destruction. Kaushin and Merrick, however, held back from the fray, each assessing the situation and looking for the perfect moment to strike. Daedroths clashed with lurkers, their powerful forms locked in deadly combat, while Atronachs of various elements engaged the dragons, filling the sky with a dazzling display of fire, ice, and lightning. Zivili and Spider Deidre fought viciously against the Seekers and High Seekers, their otherworldly abilities tearing through the ranks of their enemies. Amidst the chaos, Kaushin caught Merrick's eye, a wicked grin on his face. You know, Merrick, I'm almost disappointed. I expected more from the great dragonborn. But hey, there's still time for you to turn tail and run. Merrick scoffed, his own eyes narrowing in annoyance. You really love the sound of your own voice, don't you, chosen one? Just remember, the battle isn't over yet. And I've yet to reveal my full power. With that, Merrick let out a deafening shout, his Thursday um ripping through the air as the very ground beneath them trembled. Kaushin could only watch in fascination as the dragonborn's power swelled, a testament to his legendary status. Silva, sensing the tide of the battle shifting, called out to Kaushin. My lord, it's time for us to join the fight. We cannot allow Merrick to gain the upper hand. Kaushin nodded, his purple eyes gleaming with determination. You're right. Silva. It's time for us to show them what we're made of. With a burst of chakra, Kaushin leaped into the fray, his powerful jutsus and abilities tearing through Merrick's forces. As he unleashed his arsenal of ninjutsu, taijutsu, and jinjutsu, Silva coordinated their Deidre forces with military precision, ensuring that no advantage was lost. Merrick, watching the battle unfold, knew that he couldn't sit idly by any longer. With a snarl, he too joined the battle, his Thursday um shattering the very air as he commanded his dragons and powerful lurkers against Kaushin and his forces. As the two leaders met on the battlefield, their powers clashing in an epic struggle for supremacy, it became clear that only one could emerge victorious. With each clash of their fists, each exchange of Jutsu and Thursday um, the fate of their realms hung in the balance. The battle raged on, both sides pushing themselves to their limits, neither willing to give an inch. And as the sun began to set, casting an eerie glow over the battlefield, it became apparent that this was a conflict for the ages, one that would be remembered for generations to come. High above the battlefield, the dragons under Merrick's command soared through the sky, their wings casting dark shadows over the carnage below. These mighty beasts unleashed torrents of fire, ice, and lightning upon Kaushin's forces, intent on decimating the Deidre that opposed their master. In response, Kaushin's aerial forces rose to meet the threat. A combination of flame, frost, and storm Atronax, along with Zivili adept at flying on summoned mounts, took to the skies, ready to defend their lord's claim to the realms of oblivion. The sky became a battleground of its own, a symphony of clashing elements and snarling beasts. The dragon's roars shook the heavens as they unleashed their elemental breath attacks, the raw power of fire, ice, and lightning scorching the air. Atronax retaliated with their own elemental assaults, their flames, frost, and storms colliding with the dragon's breath and cataclysmic explosions of energy. Zivili, mounted on Daedric steeds, weaved through the chaos, their skill in aerial combat unmatched. They struck with precision, their deadly weapons slicing through dragon scales as they sought to bring down the colossal beasts. In response, the dragons lashed out with tooth and claw, snatching Zivili from the sky or attempting to crush them in their powerful jaws. As the aerial battle intensified, the Deidre forces began to coordinate their attacks. Flame Atronax, soaring through the air like burning comets, 
teamed up with Frost Atronax to create devastating combinations of fire and ice. Storm Atronax manipulated the lightning, creating powerful gusts and storms to disorient the dragons and throw them off balance. The dragons, however, were not to be underestimated. Wise and cunning, they used their own mastery of the elements to counter the Deidre's assaults. Frost dragons, sensing an incoming wave of fire, unleashed a chilling breath of ice, neutralizing the flames before they could do any harm. Lightning dragons, in turn, redirected the Storm Atronax electrical attacks, turning them against their foes. Both sides of the aerial conflict were locked in a deadly dance, their powerful abilities tearing through the sky in a breathtaking display. The fate of the realms hung in the balance as the dragons and Deidre fought, each determined to defend their master and secure victory. It was a clash of titans, a whirlwind of elemental fury and primal power that would be remembered for eons to come. And as the battle raged on below, Kaushin and Mirak continued their own epic struggle, their fates intertwined with those of the dragons and Deidre in the skies above. On the ground, the battle raged with equal intensity as Kaushin's Deidre forces, led by the indomitable Silva Viciuius, clashed with Mirak's formidable army of seekers, lurkers, and other fearsome creatures. The once quiet battlefield had been transformed into a cacophony of clashing weapons, cries of war, and the roars of enraged beasts. Silva, clad in her imposing Daedric armor, commanded her forces with a keen strategic mind and unwavering determination. Her weapon, a fearsome Daedric greatsword, cleaved through the ranks of Merrick's forces with brutal efficiency. She was a whirlwind of destruction, inspiring her troops with her ferocity and skill. Merrick's army fought back with relentless aggression, their ranks filled with nightmarish creatures. The Seekers and High Seekers, their tentacle forms writhing and shifting, launched devastating magical attacks from a distance, tearing through the Deidre with bolts of dark energy. Lurkers, their massive, hulking bodies towering above the battlefield, charged into Kaushin's forces with crushing force, their powerful limbs and vicious maws wreaking havoc on the front lines. As the two armies clashed, the earth trembled beneath their feet, the very ground becoming a canvas for their brutal struggle. Kaushin's Deidre forces, each a deadly combatant in their own right, fought with fierce loyalty and determination. Scamps and Clanfear darted through the chaos, their agility and cunning making them difficult targets for Merrick's forces. Daedroths, their powerful jaws snapping and their armored hides deflecting blows, rampaged through the enemy ranks, tearing through the creatures that stood in their path. Spider Deidre, with their eerie, chittering cries, skittered across the battlefield, their long, spindly legs impaling foes and dragging them into the shadows. The flora of oblivion, the Harada roots, bloodgrass, and spittle plants entwined themselves around Merrick's creatures, constricting and crushing them in their deadly embrace. Despite their ferocity and skill, Kaushin's forces found themselves hard-pressed by Merrick's relentless assault. The Dragonborn's army fought with single-minded devotion, their monstrous forms and horrifying abilities threatening to overwhelm the Deidre at every turn. Yet, through the chaos, Silva's keen tactical mind and unwavering determination held her forces together. She directed her troops with precision, exploiting weaknesses in Merrick's ranks and countering their devastating abilities with the diverse skills of her own army. The ground battle was a maelstrom of clashing steel, chakra, and magic, a testament to the will of two powerful leaders and their unyielding desire for victory. As Kaushin and Merrick continued their own titanic struggle, the fates of their armies, and the realms they fought for, remained uncertain, each side giving their all in this cataclysmic confrontation. Chapter 69 Victorious As I watched Merrick cut down one of my loyal Deidre, I knew it was time for our long-awaited one-on-one -on -one showdown. I cracked my knuckles and grinned, all right, Merrick, it's just you and me now. Let's see who's the real deal around here. Merrick glared at me, his eyes filled with anger and determination. You'll regret challenging me, chosen one. My power is beyond anything you've ever faced before. You should have stayed in your pitiful realm, content with what you have. I smirked, undeterred by his confidence. Heh, aren't you a self-righteous bastard? Your existence is due to me. You should have kneel and accept my superiority. With a swift motion, I formed hand seals and launched a barrage of fireballs toward Merrick. 
He responded by letting out a powerful Thursday um, deflecting the fireballs and sending them flying off course. As the flames dissipated around us, I couldn't help but chuckle, you know, I've always wondered if dragonborn tastes like dragons or not. I bet it's quite the delicacy. Merrick clenched his fists, clearly irritated by my banter. Your jokes will be the death of you, chosen one. He charged at me, his sword glowing with an otherworldly energy. I quickly formed more hand seals and summoned a Razengan, meeting his attack head-on. Our powers collided with an intense burst of energy, forcing us both to leap back and reassess our positions. As we caught our breath, I couldn't resist poking fun at him once more. You know, Merrick, I expected more from someone who claims to be the greatest dragonborn. Maybe you're just rusty from all that time in Apocrypha? Merrick's face twisted into a snarl as he shouted again, this time unleashing a blast of frost aimed directly at me. I countered with a right ton, lightning ball, the two attacks colliding and filling the air with a cacophony of crackling eyes and electricity. Taking advantage of the momentary distraction, I quickly closed the distance between us, my body moving with the grace and speed of a seasoned taijutsu master. Mirak, however, was no slouch either and parried my attacks with his sword, sparks flying as our attacks clashed. As we continued to trade blows, I found myself genuinely impressed by Merrick's skill and power. You know, I have to admit, I'm having a blast here. It's not every day you get to fight a legendary figure like yourself. Merrick gritted his teeth, refusing to be drawn in by my words. Your taunts won't work on me, chosen one. I won't be defeated by the likes of you. We continued our dance of death, our powers and abilities pushing each other to new heights. With each strike, each exchange of Jutsu and Thursday um, it was clear that we were evenly matched. And as our battle raged on, I couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement and exhilaration knowing that I was truly facing a strong opponent. I unleashed my full arsenal of Jutsu against Merrick. I created a battalion of Kage Bunshin, each armed with their own Raisingan, and sent them charging at Merrick from all directions. He countered with a whirlwind of Thursday um, his shouts creating an impenetrable barrier of elemental fury. However, I wasn't done yet. As my clones continued to press the attack, I combined Katan, Dragon Fire Technique with Right Ton, Lightning Beast Tracking Fong, creating a searing, electrified inferno that raced towards Merrick. His eyes widened in surprise, but he managed to dodge the brunt of the attack with a well-timed whirlwind sprint. Not giving him a chance to recover, I followed up with a barrage of shuriken imbued with chakra, making them faster and more accurate. Merrick struggled to deflect the onslaught, his sort of blur as he tried to keep up with my relentless assault. As the battle raged on, I felt the adrenaline pumping through my veins. The thrill of facing a powerful opponent, a true challenge, was something that I had longed for. And Merrick didn't disappoint. He countered my assault with a ferocity that matched my own, his Thursday on blasts rippling through the air like waves of force. I dodged and weaved, my reflexes honed by years of training, but it was clear that Merrick was a master of his craft. His swordplay was precise and deadly, and his Thursday on was a force to be reckoned with. But I refused to be intimidated. I knew that my own skills were formidable, and I wasn't about to let Merrick get the better of me. As he lunged at me with his sword, I sidestepped and unleashed a swift kick to his midsection, knocking the wind out of him. He stumbled back, but quickly recovered and lunged at me again. I met his attack head-on, parrying his sword with my jutsu and countering with a flurry of blows. Our attacks clashed in a symphony of sounds, sparks flying as we battled with ferocity and skill. But even as we fought, I knew that I needed to find a way to gain the upper hand. Summoning my chakra, I focused my energies and unleashed a devastating fire jutsu that sent Merrick reeling. He staggered back, his eyes wide with shock as he struggled to regain his footing. Sensing an opening, I pressed the attack, unleashing a barrage of jutsu that pushed him back further and further. But Merrick refused to go down without a fight. He countered my attacks with a ferocity that matched my own, his Thursday on blasts knocking me back and forcing me to regroup. As we continued to battle, I felt a sense of excitement and exhilaration that I had never experienced before. As Merrick lunged at me with his sword, 
I sidestepped and unleashed a powerful Jinjutsu that left him disoriented and vulnerable. Taking advantage of his confusion, I struck with all my strength, landing a blow that sent him crashing to the ground. Sensing an opening, I quickly formed hand seals and activated demonic illusion, tree binding death, trapping Mirak in a powerful Jinjutsu that made him believe he was ensnared by monstrous, chakra infused roots. With Mirak temporarily incapacitated, I took the opportunity to launch my most powerful attack yet. Merging my elemental affinities, I created a Raiden Enhanced Katan, Great Fire Annihilation, a massive wave of electrified flames that threatened to consume everything in its path. This attack was painful. Even with all the perks and masteries I have, it is searing hot to combine two chakra. Mirak, struggling against the Jinjutsu, could only watch in horror as the devastating attack bore down on him. In a final, desperate attempt to defend himself, he unleashed one more powerful Thursdayum. The two forces collided, the resulting explosion shaking the very ground beneath our feet. As the dust and debris settled, I stood panting, exhausted but triumphant. Mirak lay on the ground, his once proud armor cracked and scorched, his body battered and broken. Despite his immense power and legendary status, he had been bested. And in the end, it was my cunning that won the day. Breathless and battered, I stood over Mirak's prone form, my heart pounding with a mixture of triumph and relief. It had been a hard-fought battle, but in the end, I had emerged victorious. Coughing up blood, Mirak glared up at me with a mixture of hatred and grudging respect. You, you defeated me, Kaushin. I never thought I'd see the day. I stood beside him, offering him a small, condescending smile. It was an honor to fight you, Mirak. Well, not really. You should have accepted it that you are just a pitiful minion, and your lord is waiting for you to kneel, but you didn't. You had to become ambitious. As the life faded from his eyes, Mirak whispered his final words. Fuck you, chosen one. With Mirak's death, the battle between our forces came to an end. As I stood amidst the carnage, I couldn't help chuckle. Who would have thought? Fucking challenge and everything with it. It took me more than two years to conquer all this shit that should have been mine from the beginning. Anyways, at least I gained new abilities. Chapter 70, 12 Keys of Oblivion Let's recap. I sighed as I looked at all the abilities I have gotten from the realms. I managed to conquer 12 planes, each with its own unique challenges and rewards. Let me tell you, this shit wasn't easy. But I took them down, one by one, and gained some interesting new abilities in the process. The first one Madness Key. Madness Magic, once a week, you can use this magic to change any item to something random. The effect will be permanent or temporary depending on the user's will. The changed item can become something better or worse depending on the nature of the magic. I have tried it a few times on random items, and it is lackluster. No different than Wabajack in the game. I mean, it can turn stone into a mighty sword, but what are the odds? There are trillions of things in existence. Am I exaggerating? Think again. Toilet paper is an item, paper is another item, toilet seat is another. Why am I listing items that can be found in the toilet? I don't know, maybe I am in toilet at the moment, but anyway, there are trillions of items in existence, and this fucker magic can turn an item to any other item. Does it make it useless? Of course not, it is mighty useful. How? Simple, imagine a person throws me an explosion tag, I can just touch it and turn it into something else. Imagine I am in front of a sealed door, I can just touch it and turn it to something else. Imagine I am trapped in a cave. Touch and turn. So, yes. It depends heavily on luck, but is it useless? I don't think so. Second, Moonshadow, Azure's Plane. Twilight Key, this key would grant the user the ability to manipulate light and darkness while creating illusions. I explained this one, so I will just pass. The next was Attribution Share. Bothia's Plane. Attribution Share Key, the golden key shaped like a quill pen. When merged with the user's body, 
it grants the ability to speak with great eloquence and persuade others with his words. The user can also use this ability to inspire his allies and boost their morale in battle. Next, the fields of regret. Clavicus files plain. Boring, boring, and boring. It was boring. Key of Redemption, this key grants the user the power to heal wounds. Once in a three years, the user can use it to heal himself or someone else of physical or emotional wounds. When used on an item, it can repair and restore it to its original state, even if it was previously broken or damaged. The next one was Malakatha's Ash Pit. The fuckers there were tough as nails and stubborn as hell. But after a long, grueling battle, I emerged victorious and got my hands on the resilience of the Ash Pit Key. This bad boy grants me increased endurance and resilience, allowing me to withstand harsh conditions and recover more quickly from fatigue and injury. It also grants me the ability to temporarily increase my physical strength. Not too shabby, I guess. Then I ventured into Mephila's spiral skein. The place was a twisted labyrinth, with webs and traps around every corner. But I managed to find my way through and defeat the guardians, earning the web weaver key. This key granted me the ability to create and manipulate intricate webs of chakra, which can be used to ensnare opponents or create barriers for protection. The user can also use these webs to transmit chakra-enhanced messages or signals over long distances. It's a hell of a versatile tool. It is really different from the norm. I mean I thought I had perfect chakra control until I acquired this perk. Now, I can weave my chakra so thin and so strong it is unfucking reliable. It is just awesome. It helps with chakra construct as well, so it is safe to say that I can create more variations of Raisingam with ease from now on. Next came Meridia's colored rooms. The place was a psychedelic wonderland, with rainbows and shit everywhere. But the inhabitants weren't as friendly as the scenery, and I had to fight tooth and nail to conquer this realm. I was rewarded with the Purity's Radiance Key. This key granted me the ability to purify and cleanse my own chakra or that of others, removing any negative effects or debuffs. Additionally, I can use this power to dispel illusions and reveal the truth. Quite a handy little tool, if I do say so myself. I mean, if I didn't have disenchant, I could have gotten rid of Orochimaru's cursed seal with this perk. Also, I can now banish Kyuubi's chakra from Naruto's body with ease. Welp, if that blonde shit hasn't managed to become friends with Kurama by now, I am just going to kill him, but anyway. The only downside is I can only use it once a month. After that, I ventured into Molag Ball's Cold Harbor. This dark, freezing hellhole was one of the toughest battles I've ever faced, but I managed to come out on top. I acquired the Dominion's Grasp Key, which grants me the ability to temporarily weaken an opponent's willpower, making it easier to capture, subdue, or control them. However, the effect's duration and potency depend on the target's mental fortitude and resistance. It's a bit of a gamble, but the payoff can be huge. I mean, all of these can translate into less Jinjutsu resilience. So, yeah. I can put others into Jinjutsu with much more ease. Tested when I was summoned by my pumpkin. I then tackled Namara's scuttling void. The place was dark and creepy as fuck, with bugs and all sorts of nasty creatures lurking in the shadows. But I conquered it and gained the void's embrace key. This key allows me to temporarily become invisible and undetectable by normal means, making it easier to move stealthily or escape from dangerous situations. It basically activated one of the best hinge perks, Chameleon. Basically I can hide in plain sight and even can turn invisible for short durations. It's like a ninja's wet dream. The second to last plane I conquered was Periites the Pits. This place was like a toxic wasteland, with diseases and poisons everywhere. But I managed to survive and conquer it. Welp, Purity's Radiance Key was really helpful. It can expel poison from my system, so yeah. And was rewarded with the Balancing Plate Key. This key allows me to manipulate diseases and toxins, using them to create unique debuffs or afflictions. I can also use this power to heal or cure diseases and poisons, effectively turning the tables on my enemies. 
but I have to be careful not to overdo it, or I could end up causing more harm than good. It's a double-edged sword, but one that can be extremely useful when wielded properly. And finally, I conquered Hermias Mora's Apocrypha. Tome of Secrets Key This key, allowing me to learn new jutsu or spells at an accelerated rate. However, the sheer volume of knowledge can be overwhelming, and I have to be careful not to lose myself in it. If I use this power recklessly, I could end up damaging my own mind or going mad with power. But if I can keep my shit together, this key has the potential to make me virtually unstoppable. In a sense, it enhances my brain, easing up the learning process, blah blah blah. It is good, but there are risks. Well, now that all the others were conquered, I returned to the realm where it all began, Maroon's Dagon's Deadlands. Hellflame Essence Key this key grants me the ability to manipulate and enhance the destructive power of my fire jutsu, increasing their effectiveness and hotness in battle. True flames of hell that burn so hot, it can melt solid rock in a second. I am the devil that can summon fire from hell, burn the world for a chuckle. Muhaha. Seriously though, all keys have one or another drawback. Either cool down time or some sort of double edge. But all in all, they are awesome. Chapter 71, Kanoa Chronicles 1 Eno's Training Eno sighed as she wiped the sweat from her brow, taking a break from her intense training session. She leaned against a tree, her thoughts drifting back to Kaushin, her boyfriend who had been away for almost two years now. Eno missed him dearly, and the thought of his smile, the warmth of his touch, and the sound of his laugh caused a pang of longing in her heart. Kaushin had always been there for her, not just as a lover, but as a mentor and a source of strength. He had been the one to see the potential in Eno's abilities and had devised a groundbreaking new technique for her to master, something that would place her on a whole new level of power. Eno felt grateful to him for believing in her, and she was determined to make him proud. As she stared into the distance, reminiscing about the countless hours they had spent together discussing strategies and techniques, Eno felt a renewed sense of determination surge within her. She knew she couldn't afford to waste any more time, Kaushin had entrusted her with this incredible gift, and she owed it to him to master it. With her resolve strengthened, Eno pushed herself back onto her feet and resumed her training. She focused on the technique Kaushin had developed for her, recalling the intricate details he had shared with her before he left. There was a certain complexity to it, something that required immense concentration and precise chakra control. Eno found herself muttering about the technique, remembering each and every detail. As the sun began to set, Eno continued her relentless training, pushing her body and mind to their limits. She could feel the progress she was making, but she knew there was still much to learn. The technique was unlike anything she had ever encountered, and it demanded a level of dedication and focus that she had never before needed to muster. As the last light of day faded, Eno finally allowed herself a moment of rest. She was exhausted, her muscles aching and her chakra reserves nearly depleted, but she couldn't help but smile. She had made progress, even if it was just a small step towards mastering the technique. At that moment, she felt closer to Kaushin than she had in a long time. Eno knew that the journey ahead would be difficult, and she understood that this new power came with its own set of risks and limitations. But she was determined to face those challenges head-on, to become the shinobi that Kaushin believed she could be. And when the day came for Kaushin to return, Eno would be ready, not just to show him how much she had grown, but to stand by his side as an equal, and to face whatever the world had in store for them together. In the days that followed, Eno's training intensified. Every day, she pushed herself harder, mastering the finer aspects of the technique, always careful to keep its details in her mind. Word began to spread among her fellow shinobi about her progress, and whispers of her newfound power circulated through the village. Still, no one knew exactly what Eno had been working on, and she intended to keep it that way. Each night, after the grueling training sessions, Eno would find solace in the memories of Kaushin, replaying their time together in her mind. She would think about the way he encouraged her, the passion with which he spoke about the technique, and the trust he placed in her to carry on in his absence. As the weeks turned into months, Eno found herself growing more and more adept with the mysterious technique. 
She could sense the change within herself, a newfound confidence and power that she had never experienced before. And yet, she knew she had only scratched the surface of what the technique could truly offer her. One evening, as she sat alone in her room, Eno reflected on her journey thus far. She had come a long way since Kaushan had first shared the secret of the technique with her, but she knew that there was still so much left to learn. The potential for greatness was there, just out of reach, and Eno was determined to grasp it, no matter what it took. With a renewed sense of purpose, Eno vowed to continue her training and unlock the full power of the technique that Kaushan had entrusted her with. She knew that it wouldn't be easy, and she understood that there would be challenges along the way, but she was ready to face them head on. As Eno drifted off to sleep that night, she couldn't help but think of Kaushan, of the love they shared, and the incredible gift he had given her. And as she dreamt of the day when they would be reunited, she knew that she would stop at nothing to make him proud and to stand beside him as an equal, ready to face whatever challenges the world had in store for them. And so, Eno's journey continued, her path forward illuminated by the light of her unwavering determination and the love that she carried in her heart. The secret of the technique remained locked away, a tantalizing mystery that would soon be revealed. But for now, Eno focused on the task at hand, pushing herself to new heights as she prepared for the day when she would finally be able to show the world and Kaushan just how far she had come. As Eno woke up the next morning, she felt a sense of longing in her heart. The memory of Kaushan and the times they shared together flooded her mind. It had been almost three years since he had left for his training, and Eno couldn't help but wonder how much he had changed. But even as she missed him, Eno couldn't help but feel a sense of pride in her heart. Kaushan had entrusted her with his secret technique, and she was determined to make him proud. She knew that he had faith in her abilities, and that thought alone gave her the strength to continue her training, no matter how difficult it may be. As Eno made her way to the training grounds, she felt a sense of determination in her heart. The sun was rising, casting a warm glow over the lush green landscape. Eno took a deep breath, taking in the fresh air and letting her thoughts drift towards Kaushan. She thought about his blonde hair, his violet eyes, and the way he would smile at her whenever they were together. It was a bittersweet feeling, and she couldn't help but wish that he was there with her, watching her progress. But Eno knew that she had to focus on her training. She had come too far to give up now. As she began to practice the technique, she felt a sense of power coursing through her veins. She could feel herself getting stronger with each passing day, and she knew that she was getting closer to unlocking the full potential of the technique. As the days turned into weeks and the weeks turned into months, Eno's determination only grew stronger. She knew that Kaushan was out there, somewhere, and she couldn't wait for the day when they would be reunited. The thought of seeing him again gave her hope, and she knew that no matter what challenges lay ahead, she would face them with unwavering strength and determination. And so, Eno continued on her journey, pushing herself to new heights and unlocking the full potential of the technique that Kaushan had entrusted her with. She knew that there would be more challenges ahead, but with each passing day, she grew stronger and more determined to face them head on. As she gazed up at the stars that night, Eno couldn't help but feel a sense of hope in her heart. She knew that Kaushan was out there, somewhere, and she was determined to find him. And when they were finally reunited, she would be ready ready to stand beside him as an equal, ready to face whatever challenges the world had in store for them. Chapter 72, Kanoa Chronicles 2 Shino Soaring Shino leaned against a tree, sweat dripping down his forehead as he took a much-needed break from his relentless training. The sun beat down on him, warming his muscles and providing a sense of comfort as he contemplated the details of the new technique Kaushin had shared with him. It had been nearly two years since his friend had left on his own journey, but their bond remained strong, allowing Shino to maintain a deep connection with Kaushin despite his stoic nature. Kaushin's easygoing and joking demeanor had a unique way of bringing out different sides of Shino that few others could. As Shino thought back on their times together, a rare smile graced his lips. They had shared a strong brotherhood, one of mutual respect and gratitude that transcended any distance between them. In the quiet moments of his training, Shino would often hear Kaushin's voice in his mind, encouraging him and guiding him through the steps of the mysterious new technique. 
while Shino felt he had made significant progress, he knew there was still much to learn, and the thought both excited and frustrated him. Taking a deep breath, Shino shook off the fatigue and stood up, determination shining in his eyes. He refused to let Kaoshin down or allow himself to fall behind his friends. With renewed vigor, he resumed his training, focusing on the intricate chakra control and the symbiotic relationship required for the technique to work. As Shino trained, he briefly thought about the potential applications of this new power. He could sense how it would enhance his abilities and bring him to new heights as a shinobi, but he also knew that there were risks involved. He thought about the possibility of losing control over the insects or the draining effect on his chakra reserves, and this only motivated him further to master the technique. The sun began to set, casting a warm golden glow over the training grounds as Shino continued his relentless practice. With each repetition, he felt himself growing closer to understanding the mysterious new power, yet he knew he was still far from mastering it. He could feel the insects' response to his chakra, their bond strengthening, but the true extent of their combined power remained elusive. As the day turned to night, Shino paused, his chest heaving with exhaustion. The world around him was bathed in darkness, illuminated only by the light of the moon and the stars above. He knew that he still had much to learn, but the progress he had made gave him hope. In the quiet stillness of the night, Shino sent a silent prayer of gratitude to Kaoshin, his friend and mentor. Their bond, forged through years of camaraderie and brotherhood, had given Shino the strength and determination to reach for new heights as a shinobi. He would continue to train, pushing himself to the limits of his endurance, until he finally mastered the mysterious technique and unlocked its true potential. And when that day came, he would stand proudly among his friends, a powerful and versatile warrior, ready to face any challenge that lay ahead. As Shino walked away from the training grounds, the secret of his new power remained carefully hidden, a mystery that would only be revealed when the time was right. And when that moment arrived, the world would witness the full extent of Shino's strength, the product of his unwavering determination and the deep brotherhood he shared with Kaoshin. The next morning, Shino made his way through the village, his thoughts still focused on his training and the powerful new technique he was determined to master. As he walked, he spotted a familiar figure sitting on a rooftop, gazing at the clouds above. It was Shikamaru, his classmate and close friend. Shino couldn't help but feel a sense of camaraderie, knowing that they were both working hard to improve their skills and become more formidable shinobi. As Shino approached, Shikamaru glanced over, offering a nod of acknowledgement before returning his attention to the sky. Hey, Shino, he said, his voice casual and relaxed. You've been training hard lately, haven't you? Shino took a seat beside him, maintaining his stoic demeanor. Yes, I've been working on something new, he replied, careful not to reveal any details about the technique. Kaushin-san shared it with me before he left. I believe it will greatly increase my abilities once I've mastered it. Shikamaru raised an eyebrow, intrigued. Kaoshin, huh? He's always had a knack for coming up with innovative ideas. I've been working on something too, actually. It's a new application of my shadow control jutsu that should make me a more versatile fighter. Shino nodded, sensing Shikamaru's determination and excitement beneath his outwardly laid-back demeanor. They sat in comfortable silence for a moment, each lost in their thoughts about their respective techniques and the challenges they faced in mastering them. Eventually, Shikamaru broke the silence, his voice thoughtful. It's important that we continue to grow and adapt as shinobi, isn't it? Even with everything we've been through, there's always more to learn and new challenges to overcome. Shino agreed, his eyes focused on the horizon. Indeed. We cannot afford to stagnate or become complacent. Our strength lies in our ability to evolve and meet the ever-changing demands of our world. Shino nodded in agreement with Shikamaru's words, taking a moment to reflect on the challenges they had faced over the years as young shinobi. It was a testament to their resilience and determination that they had made it this far, despite the many obstacles that had been placed in their path. As they sat in comfortable silence, Shikamaru turned to Shino with a curious look on his face. By the way, how are Kiba and Sakura doing? he asked, referring to their other two classmates from Team 8. Shino thought for a moment before responding. 
Kiba is doing well. He's been working hard on his clan jutsu and making progress. Sakura, on the other hand, has been training with Tsunade to master medical jutsu and with Kurinai to improve her jinjutsu skills. She's been making good progress too. Shikamaru nodded, pleased to hear that their friends were also making progress in their own training. Good to hear, he said with a smile. It's always encouraging to know that we're not alone in our pursuit of becoming stronger. As they sat together on the rooftop, Shino and Shikamaru shared a quiet moment of understanding and determination. Though their paths were unique, and the techniques they sought to master remained shrouded in mystery, their bond as friends and teammates remained unbreakable. And as they continued to push themselves to greater heights, they knew that they could rely on each other for support and encouragement, their friendship a constant source of strength in a world that was always changing. Chapter 73, Kanoha Chronicles 3 Shika Cho New Techniques The sun was setting as Shikamaru and Choji took a break from their rigorous training session, both exhausted and covered in sweat. They sat down under a tree, taking a moment to catch their breath and reminisce about the instructions Kaoshin had given them nearly two years ago. Kaoshin's insight had fueled their desire to become stronger, but they felt as though they still hadn't fully grasped the true potential of the techniques he had shared. Man, I can't believe it's been almost two years since Kaoshin left, Choji sighed, wiping the sweat from his brow. I feel like I've made progress, but it's just not enough. Shikamaru nodded in agreement. Yeah, I know what you mean. But we can't give up now. We owe it to Kaoshin, and to ourselves, to master these techniques. With renewed determination, the two friends got back on their feet and resumed their training. They exchanged meaningful glances, silently acknowledging the bond they shared and the mutual respect they had for Kaoshin's teachings. As Shikamaru focused on harnessing the power of shadows, Choji concentrated on his own technique. They practiced diligently, pushing each other to their limits while trying to keep the specifics of their new powers in their minds. Every now and then, one of them would mention a brief detail of their progress, but not quite proficient at them yet. Suddenly, a large bear appeared, charging towards Choji with incredible speed. Choji braced himself for the impact, his muscles tensing as he prepared to use his new technique. Choji's reaction and adaptability allowed him to dance with the giant bear who seemingly easily threw punches, while moving at a speed that would be impossible for its size. From outside, it looked like a puppet master was controlling the bear. Choji managed to dodge the bear's attack, and the two friends continued their intense training, pushing themselves harder than ever before. Hours went by, and as the sun disappeared below the horizon, they finally decided to call it a day. Exhausted, they slumped down on the ground once more, both of them realizing that they still had much to learn. But the small progress they had made that day was enough to keep their determination alive. You know, Choji, Shikamaru said, breathing heavily. I think we're getting closer to unlocking the true potential of these techniques. Choji nodded, a smile spreading across his face. Yeah, we're definitely making progress. It's going to take some time, but I know we can do it. We just have to keep pushing ourselves. The two friends shared a look of understanding, their unwavering determination to grow stronger evident in their eyes. As they lay there under the stars, it was clear that the bond between them had only grown stronger since Kaoshin's departure. They were grateful for the guidance he had provided, and they were committed to making him proud by fully mastering the techniques he had shared. As the first light of dawn broke over the horizon, Shikamaru and Choji were already back on their feet, eager to continue their training. The two friends decided to spar against each other, testing their newfound abilities in a friendly yet intense battle. Choji charged at Shikamaru, his body moving with a newfound strength and speed. Shikamaru, in turn, focused on the shadows, maneuvering them with precision to counter Choji's relentless attacks. The exchange between them was fierce, each pushing the other to their limits as they honed their skills. Their friendly sparring continued for hours, the sound of their heavy breathing and the impact of their blows filling the air. Both were determined not to give in, driven by their desire to master the techniques Kaoshin had shared with them. Just as the sun reached its peak in the sky, Eno appeared on the scene, 
her eyes wide with surprise as she took in the sight of her two friends sparring with such intensity. She approached them cautiously, not wanting to interrupt their focus. Shikamaru, Choji! Ino called out, causing them to pause in their battle. I hate to interrupt, but we just received a mission. We need to head out immediately. The two friends exchanged glances, their expressions a mix of disappointment and determination. They knew their training would have to be put on hold, but the mission came first. With a nod, they quickly gathered their gear and prepared to depart. As the trio set off on their mission, Shikamaru and Choji couldn't help but feel a sense of excitement. They knew they hadn't fully mastered their new techniques, but the progress they had made so far had given them confidence in their abilities. Ino noticed the change in her friends, a proud smile spreading across her face. You two have been training really hard, haven't you? She asked, her curiosity piqued. Yeah, Kaoshin gave us some ideas for new techniques a while back, Choji replied, a determined look in his eyes. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting closer. Ino nodded in understanding, her own determination to grow stronger reignited by the progress she had seen in her friends. Hearing the name of her Prince Muffin made her heart pang with sadness, but a smile crept onto her face soon enough. Soon, soon she was going to meet him again. All she had to do was work hard and show him how much she progressed when he came back. As the team of Inoshikacho embarked on their new mission, they knew that their relentless training had made them more formidable than ever before. The challenges they would face on their mission remained unknown, but one thing was certain, Shikamaru, Choji, and Ino were ready to face whatever lay ahead, their unwavering determination and the strength of their friendship serving as their most potent weapons. As the team of Ino Shikacho continued on their mission, they couldn't help but reflect on the progress they had made since Kaoshin had first introduced them to his innovative techniques. It had been nearly two years since Kaoshin had left, but his teachings continued to inspire them to push themselves harder than ever before. Shikamaru, Choji, and Ino had each grown stronger in their own way, honing their skills and developing new techniques that allowed them to better serve their village as shinobi. They were each driven by a deep desire to prove themselves, both to their teammates and to themselves. Ino had spent countless hours mastering the art of mind transfer jutsu, perfecting her ability to infiltrate the minds of her opponents and use their own techniques against them. Shikamaru had honed his ability to manipulate shadows, using them to control and confound his enemies in battle. Choji had developed a new technique that allowed him to increase his strength and speed, making him an even more formidable opponent on the battlefield. Despite the progress they had made, however, they knew that they still had much to learn. As they completed their current mission, they resolved to continue their training, determined to unlock the full potential of the techniques Kaoshin had shared with them. Chapter 74 Kanoha Chronicles 4 Socially Awkward Pupil and Pervert Teacher Before Naruto left for his training, Jiraiya was determined to take him away, so Akatsuki couldn't reach him. After all, he was the Sanin Jiraiya, the spymaster, author of most best-selling books in the world, a great warrior, and a person respected by many. If Naruto wasn't safe with him, there was no land in the world that could protect him. Sadly, Kaoshin, who had a different plan for Naruto's training, insisted that Naruto go to the Tengu realm to continue his training. Reluctantly, Jiraiya agreed, and Kaoshin proposed that he take Sai with him and teach him Fuinjutsu. Jiraiya was not thrilled about this idea, but he recognized the potential in Sai and decided to give it a shot. He took Sai under his wing, intending to mold him into a skilled shinobi and spy master. Little did Jiraiya know that Sai's socially awkward nature would make their training an unforgettable adventure. Throughout their journey, Jiraiya introduced Sai to his network of contacts, teaching him the ins and outs of gathering intelligence. He, from time to time, encouraged Sai to go and talk with the informants, but almost always, Sai failed. At one time, it almost choked Jiraiya with laughters. Jiraiya was known to be quite the ladies' man, often using his charm to persuade women to help him with his missions. Sai, wanting to emulate his sensei, tried to employ the same tactics on a female informant. He approached her with a straight face and said, Your eyes are like the deepest pools of water, reflecting the moonlight on a warm summer's eve. 
Would you be so kind as to share information about our enemies? The woman, amused by Sai's unusual approach, couldn't help but laugh as Jiraiya watched from a distance, shaking his head in disbelief. Jiraiya also shared Kaoshin's idea for Sai to develop a new technique that combined drawing jutsu with sealing jutsu and chakra manipulation. Sai was eager to learn, but his determination to fit in and gain Jiraiya's approval led him to mimic the legendary Sanin's behavior in the most awkward ways. Jiraiya was both amused and perplexed by Sai's attempts to act like him. In one instance, Sai tried to act perverted, mimicking Jiraiya's penchant for spying on women. With a straight face, Sai approached a group of women at a hot spring and said, Excuse me, ladies. I am here to, uh, research material for a book I am writing. May I observe your assets? The women, understandably outraged, chased Sai away, leading Jiraiya laughing hysterically from a nearby hiding spot. Despite these awkward moments, Jiraiya was impressed by Sai's progress. Sai diligently practiced his drawing and sealing jutsu, eventually mastering the powerful artistic realm, Reality Canvas. Jiraiya watched as Sai drew intricate symbols in ways he could never imagine and practiced his techniques. The more he saw Sai working on this technique, the more his respect for Kaoshin increased. Jiraiya knew that Sai's new technique would require intense concentration and chakra control, so he devised training exercises to help Sai refine these skills. During their sparring sessions, Jiraiya pushed Sai to his limits, forcing him to maintain the drawing while dodging attacks and managing his chakra reserves. As Sai's training progressed, Jiraiya noticed that the young shinobi was starting to come out of his shell. He began to engage with others more naturally and even developed a sense of humor. It seemed that Sai's attempts to emulate Jiraiya had helped him overcome some of his social awkwardness. By the end of the first two years, Sai had grown into a formidable shinobi, ready to take on the challenges that awaited him back in Kanoha. Jiraiya, proud of his students' progress, bid Sai farewell, confident that he had helped create a powerful ally for the Leaf Village. As Sai returned to Kanoha, he knew that his time with Jiraiya had not only made him a stronger shinobi, but it had also taught him valuable lessons about friendship, loyalty, and the importance of being true to oneself. Though he would always be grateful for the skills he had learned, Sai realized that the greatest gift Jiraiya had given him was the confidence to embrace his unique personality and forge his own path as a shinobi. Back in Kanoha, Sai reunited with his friends, eager to show them the results of his training. They were astonished by the power and versatility of his new artistic realm, reality canvas technique, and they knew that he would be a valuable asset to their team. As they prepared for the challenges that lay ahead, Sai felt a newfound sense of camaraderie and purpose, grateful for the bonds he had formed and the lessons he had learned during his time with Jiraiya. I should work on my social skills, although I am not a master anymore. What would Jiraiya do? WWJD? I know. Sai punched his palm as he walked the empty streets. Jiraiya often enjoyed visiting bars and flirting with the waitresses, so Sai decided to give it a try. He approached a beautiful waitress with a stoic expression and said, Excuse me, miss. You have quite an exquisite posterior. Would you mind if I sketched it for my artistic inspiration? The waitress, taken aback, dumped a glass of water on Sai's head. Did I do something wrong? He tilted his head as he looked around. Luckily no one saw. As Sai continued to hone his skills and strengthen his bonds with his friends, he couldn't help but think back to the time he spent with Jiraiya. He knew that his experiences with the legendary Sanin had changed him for the better, and he was determined to carry on Jiraiya's legacy by using his newfound abilities to protect the ones he cared about and serve the Leaf Village to the best of his abilities. Of course he knew it was Kaoshin who gave him this opportunity and the technique and he was truly grateful, despite not knowing how to show it. Well. I will thank him in Jiraiya style when he comes back. For now, I will go and work on my new book. Research time. Taking a deep breath, Sai strode confidently toward the woman, attempting to imitate Jiraiya's swagger. He stood beside her, trying to come up with a smooth opening line. However, instead of a charming remark, Sai blurted out, Excuse me, miss. I couldn't help but notice your, uh, ample bosom. 
Would you mind if I sketched it for scientific purposes? The woman's eyes widened in shock, and she slapped Sai across the face before storming off in a huff. I have much to learn. Sai balled his fists as his respect for his master increased. Chapter 75, Kanoha Chronicles 5 Kakashi's Copy Ninja The sun was setting, casting a warm orange glow on the training grounds where Kakashi and Shin were engaged in an intense swordplay session. Since Naruto, Hinata, and Kaushin had left to train in their own summon realms, Kakashi had decided to take up Kaushin's suggestion and recultivate his kinjutsu skills with Shin, who had a natural talent for sword arts. Remember, Shin, focus on your footwork and control your breathing, Kakashi advised, his voice muffled by his iconic mask. Shin nodded, his eyes locked on Kakashi's every move, analyzing and trying to emulate his teacher's fluid movements. Much like Sai, Shin was socially awkward, a result of his childhood spent in root. To cope with this, he had begun to imitate Kakashi. Kaushin must have selected Kakashi, since we look a little bit alike. Like how Guy and Lee look so similar. This must be one of the requirements for selecting a pupil. I have gray hair too. Kaushin is so wise. I still have much to learn. Shin thought, as he balled his fist in determination. Over the following weeks, Shin's transformation into a mini Kakashi occurred gradually. It began with subtle changes that went almost unnoticed. One day, Kakashi spotted Shin wearing a mask, which he found peculiar since it wasn't a necessity for him. Shin, what's with the mask? Kakashi asked, raising an eyebrow. Oh, um, I thought it might help me focus better during training, Shin replied hesitantly, trying to come up with a plausible explanation. Since Kakashi didn't give me the mask, he must have wanted me to come up with this idea. Probably Guy did the same for Lee. I must try my best to imitate Kakashi-sensei. This way, I can learn this new art. Kakashi chuckled. Well, if it helps, I suppose there's no harm in it. A few days later, Kakashi noticed that Shin's forehead protector had been adjusted to hang at an angle, covering just one eye. He couldn't help but smile at Shin's commitment to mimicking him. As the days went by, Shin's emulation of Kakashi became more pronounced. One afternoon, while they were taking a break from their intense training, Kakashi spotted Shin flipping through a book, seemingly engrossed in its contents. Curiosity peaked, Kakashi approached Shin and asked, What are you reading there, Shin? Shin looked up, startled, and quickly closed the book. Oh, uh, nothing much. Just something I found. Kakashi's heart skipped a beat as he caught a glimpse of the book's cover, which looked strikingly similar to his infamous Ika Ika series. Horrified, he thought, has Shin somehow gotten his hands on one of those? Determined to get to the bottom of it, Kakashi casually inquired, Mind if I take a look? Shin hesitated for a moment before reluctantly handing over the book. To Kakashi's immense relief, he discovered that the book was entirely blank. Shin, why are you carrying around a blank book? Kakashi asked, trying to suppress his amusement. Well, I noticed you always have a book with you, so I thought it might be a good idea to do the same, Shin explained sheepishly. But I didn't want to get distracted during training, so I figured a blank book would be best. Kakashi burst into laughter. You really are dedicated to copying me, aren't you? Well, at least you're keeping your focus on training. Shin blushed, feeling both embarrassed and proud of his efforts to emulate his sensei. Their bond grew stronger as their training continued, and with each passing day, Shin's transformation into a mini Kakashi became even more apparent. As they continued to spar, Kakashi decided to introduce Shin to the new technique that Kaushin had devised for them. He explained, the technique is called Raijin's calligraphy. It's a unique blend of swordsmanship, fuinjutsu, and lightning release. Shin's eyes widened with interest, eager to learn more. Kakashi continued, We'll channel our lightning release chakra into our swords, enhancing their cutting power. Then, using swift, precise strikes, we'll carve directly onto our opponent's bodies. Shin's mind raced, trying to imagine how the technique would look and work in practice. 
The technique required swift and precise strikes that left no room for mistakes. Although the technique itself was deadly, what made it most powerful was the second part, and without being precise, the second part was useless. But remember, Kakashi warned, this is just an introduction. The technique's true power and mechanics will work only if you manage to finish the strikes. Shin nodded, his determination burning brighter than ever. He couldn't let Kakashi down. Since his sensei was working hard to teach him, he had to learn to the best of his abilities. Over the next few weeks, their training sessions were filled with laughter and light-hearted banter as Shin continued to mimic Kakashi's mannerisms. At one point, Kakashi even found Shin attempting to walk his ninkin, only to realize that Shin didn't have any dogs of his own. Shin, what are you doing? Kakashi asked, holding back a chuckle. I'm, uh, walking my ninkin, Shin replied sheepishly, holding a leash that was attached to a dog from the Inazuka clan. Kakashi couldn't help but laugh. Well, at least you're committed to the act. But I hope you didn't kidnap the Ninkin. No sensei, they even offered to pay me, but I didn't want it. Shin shook his head. Fine, fine. After a while, you can try to sign a summoning contract with my Ninkin. But you need to get their approval, all right? Really? Shin asked with his eyes shining. Yeah, yeah, really. Kakashi shook his head in amusement. As the days turned into weeks, the bond between Kakashi and Shin grew stronger, and Shin's skills improved tremendously. Their training sessions were a blur of electrified swords, glowing ceiling formulas, and the occasional burst of laughter as Shin continued to mimic Kakashi's every move. And while the full potential of Raijin's calligraphy remained a mystery, one thing was certain, Kakashi and Shin had developed a unique and powerful technique that would leave their opponents quaking in fear. Their dedication to mastering it, coupled with their shared sense of humor, made them an unstoppable duo and quite the entertaining pair to watch. Chapter 76, Kanoha Chronicles 6 Final Hinata's Path Hinata stood in the center of an opening, her heart pounding in anticipation. With a determined gaze, she performed the summoning jutsu, feeling the pull of chakra as she was transported to a new realm. As the smoke of Hinata's summoning jutsu dissipated, she found herself in a breathtakingly beautiful landscape unlike anything she had ever seen before. She blinked, taking in the crystalline waters, lush forests, and towering snow-capped mountains around her. The landscape was a breathtaking fusion of ethereal beauty and tranquility, with crystalline waters, lush forests, and snow-capped mountains that stretched into the sky. Where am I? She wondered aloud, her voice tinged with excitement and nervousness. Just then, a young fox with shimmering white fur bounded towards her, its eyes full of curiosity. Hinata's eyes widened as she took in the creature's ethereal appearance. Hello there, human, the fox greeted cheerfully. My name is Yuki, and I welcome you to the white fox realm. It's been ages since a human has come to visit us. Hinata blinked in surprise, her nervousness momentarily forgotten. The white fox realm? I came to a fox realm, she tilted her head cutely as a small smile crept up to her face, a slight blush coloring her cheeks. My name is Hinata Huga, by the way. It's nice to meet you, Yuki. Hinata smiled, knowing that fate had brought her to the perfect place to grow stronger. Foxes had always held a special place in Naruto's life, and now she would be connected to that same animal spirit. It seemed like destiny was weaving its magic, binding her and Naruto together even in their separate training journeys. Yuki's eyes sparkled with delight. Well, Hinata, it's a pleasure to meet you too. Follow me, and I'll take you to the White Fox Elder. They will want to meet you and determine if you have a connection with our realm. Hinata nodded, her curiosity peaked as she followed Yuki through the enchanting landscape. Eventually, they arrived at a serene clearing where an ancient, majestic fox with pure white fur awaited them. This was the white fox elder, and her eyes held the wisdom of countless lifetimes. White fox elder, Yuki announced, this is Hinata Huga, a human visitor seeking to learn from our realm. The elder studied Hinata for a moment before speaking. Greetings, Hinata Huga. 
I must first determine if you have a fate with our realm before we can proceed. Are you prepared for this test? Hinata nodded, determination filling her eyes. Yes, White Fox Elder, I am ready. Very well, the Elder said, her voice deep and resonant. The test is simple. You must reach out and touch the surface of the sacred pool in the center of the clearing. If the water remains clear, you have no connection with our realm. If it changes color, you have a fate with us. Taking a deep breath, Hinata stepped forward and gently touched the surface of the pool. To her amazement, the clear water transformed into a brilliant shade of blue, swirling with a myriad of other colors. The white fox elder smiled, their eyes twinkling with approval. Welcome, Hinata Huga. You have a destiny with our realm, and we shall help you grow stronger in your journey. Hinata's heart swelled with gratitude and excitement, knowing that she had taken the first step towards a new and powerful path. The training began in earnest, with the White Fox Elder teaching Hinata the secrets of their realm's unique chakra control and water transformation techniques. With each passing day, her determination and focus only grew stronger. She knew that Naruto was in danger from the Akatsuki, and she had to become powerful enough to stand by his side and protect him. As the sun set each evening, Hinata would think of Naruto, imagining him training with the Tengu tribe far away. She missed him dearly, but she knew that they were both working towards a shared goal, becoming strong enough to face the challenges ahead and protect the people they loved. Under the watchful eye of the White Fox Elder, Hinata honed her skills in a fox-style taijutsu and learned to control the elusive water element. The Elder would often tell her that as she became more proficient in their realm's abilities, her mastery over the water element would grow in turn. With unyielding determination, Hinata pushed herself to her limits, her love for Naruto and her desire to protect him fueling her every action. She knew that the day would come when they would reunite, and she wanted nothing more than to stand proudly by his side as his equal, their hearts bound together by fate and their shared strength. And so, beneath the watchful gaze of the white fox elder, Hinata continued her training, her spirit unwavering as she forged a new path for herself in the enchanted white fox realm. Two years had passed since Hinata first arrived in the white fox realm, and she had made incredible progress in her training. She had not only honed her abilities but had also forged a deep bond with Yuki, the young fox who had welcomed her. One beautiful afternoon, Hinata sat under a large, ancient tree, Yuki nestled comfortably in her embrace. As the sun's golden rays filtered through the leaves above, Hinata smiled and began telling Yuki stories about Naruto, her voice filled with affection. You know, Yuki, Naruto is an amazing person. He's always been so determined and strong, never giving up on his dreams, no matter how hard things got, she said, her eyes shining with admiration. I've always admired him, and now we're together, facing challenges side by side. Yuki listened intently, her eyes wide with curiosity. Naruto sounds like a wonderful person. I can see why you care for him so much. But, she added with a mischievous grin, I bet he's never met a fox as charming as me. Hinata laughed, her eyes twinkling with amusement. Oh, I don't know, Yuki. Naruto has met quite a few interesting creatures in his time, including the Nine Tails itself. But you're definitely one of the most charming foxes I've ever met. Yuki puffed up her chest proudly, her tail wagging with delight. Well, I should hope so. I've been your faithful companion and training partner for two years, after all. Hinata smiled warmly, hugging Yuki a little tighter. Yes, you have. And I'm so grateful for everything you've taught me, Yuki. You've helped me become stronger than I ever thought possible. Yuki nuzzled into Hinata's embrace, her eyes softening with affection. I'm just glad I could help, Hinata. You're like a sister to me, and I know that when you and Naruto are reunited, you'll be able to stand by his side with confidence. As they sat together under the tree, Hinata and Yuki continued to reminisce about their time in the White Fox realm, their bond stronger than ever. And with each passing day, Hinata's determination to protect Naruto and her friends grew, fueled by the power and wisdom she had gained from her time with the White Foxes. Chapter 77, Kaushin's Back as the sun dipped below the horizon, 
bathing the village of Kanoha in the soft hues of twilight, a sudden gust of wind swept over the Hokage building. The air crackled with energy, and in the blink of an eye, a figure materialized atop the roof. Kaushin had returned. He stood tall and strong, his body more muscular than before, his golden hair longer, falling to his neck in a wild cascade. His purple eyes, once filled with youthful exuberance, now held a depth of wisdom and maturity that could only come from years of training and experience. Down below, the change in chakra was not lost on the village's most perceptive residents. Tsunade, the fifth Hokage, felt it immediately, as did her loyal assistant, Shizun, and the enigmatic Kakashi Hitaki. With a knowing glance, they nodded to each other and began to make their way to the rooftop. Upon reaching the summit, they found Kaushin gazing out at the village below, taking in the changes that had occurred in his absence. At the sound of their footsteps, he turned, and his eyes widened with surprise and joy. Kaushin! Shizen cried out, her face lighting up as she rushed to him. She threw her arms around him in a tight embrace, tears of relief and happiness streaming down her face. We've missed you so much. Tsunade and Kakashi approached more slowly, their eyes taking in the changes that had transformed the young man before them. They exchanged glances, their faces a mixture of surprise and approval. Welcome back, Kaushin, Tsunade said, her voice warm and full of affection. You've grown so much. Kaushin smiled at her, his eyes shining with gratitude. Thank you, Lady Tsunade. It's good to be home. Kakashi, his visible eye crinkling in a smile, nodded his agreement. It's been a long time. We're glad to have you back. Tsunade crossed her arms and raised an eyebrow, her curiosity piqued. So, how did it go? We've all been wondering what happened to you during your training. Kaushin smirked, a confident glint in his eyes. It went well, Lady Tsunade. The strife within my summoning land has been resolved. They are united now, and I, as their sole contractor, have access to all of their resources and members. Tsunade's eyes widened, impressed by the young man's accomplishment. That's no small feat, Kaushin. You should be proud of yourself. Kakashi nodded in agreement, his eye curling with approval. Indeed. To bring unity to a divided land is a great achievement. Your hard work and dedication have clearly paid off. Kaushin rubbed the back of his head, a sheepish smile playing on his lips. Thank you. It wasn't easy, but I couldn't have done it without the support of my summoning creatures and the guidance of my mentors. Shizen wiped away her tears, her face beaming with pride. That's the Kaushin we know and love. Always humble and grateful. What about Naruto? Has he returned? Kaushin asked, well aware that his friend was training with the Tengu, his summoning contracts. Tsunade, Kakashi, and Shizen all shook their heads. Not yet, Tsunade replied. But we're expecting him back any day now. Kaushin nodded, his concern for his friend evident in his eyes. The Tengu were the most mysterious creatures in the world, and no one knew where their lands were. He had faith that Naruto was safe and growing stronger, just as he had been. The four of them continued to talk and catch up, sharing stories of their experiences and growth. However, after a while, Kaushin couldn't help but fidget, his thoughts drifting to a certain someone he had missed dearly. Finally, unable to contain himself any longer, he blurted out, I need to go and see my pumpkin. Excuse me. Before anyone could react, he vanished into thin air, leaving the three seasoned shinobi surprised by his sudden departure and his speed. Dashing at top speed towards the Yamanaka flower shop, Kaushin's heart raced with anticipation. As he burst through the door, he was greeted by the smiling faces of Aima and Inoichi Yamanaka. Aima, unable to contain her joy, rushed forward to hug him, tears streaming down her face. Kaushin! Oh, how we've missed you, she exclaimed, her voice filled with emotion. Inoichi, on the other hand, tried to maintain a stern demeanor. He grumbled, you look a little stronger, not bad. Kaushin chuckled, extricating himself from Ima's embrace. It is good to see you, mother-in-law, father-in-law, but I can't wait to see my pumpkin. I can't wait any longer. 
It's been so long since I've seen her. As they bantered, a soft, melodic voice rang out from the top of the stairs. Who are you talking to, Mom? Eno asked, a hint of curiosity in her tone. Kaoshin glanced up, his breath catching in his throat as his eyes met Eno's. She was halfway down the stairs, her slender fingers clutching a vase filled with flowers. She had grown taller, her figure more graceful and elegant. Her long, blonde hair flowed down her back like a waterfall of gold, and her eyes, as blue as the deepest ocean, sparkled with a newfound maturity. Eno's eyes widened with shock as she took in Kaushin's presence, her grip on the vase slipping. It fell to the floor with a crash, shattering into a thousand pieces and scattering flowers and water across the wooden floor. Time seemed to slow to a crawl as Kaushin and Eno stared at each other, both unable to tear their gaze away from the other. Kaushin's heart swelled with emotion, his eyes tracing over every new detail of Eno's appearance. She was even more beautiful than he remembered, her newfound maturity only adding to her allure. For her part, Eno was equally captivated by Kaushin's transformation. He had grown into a strong, handsome young man, his slender muscles evident beneath his clothes. His purple eyes, once filled with playful mischief, now held a sense of power and determination that took her breath away. His hair, once short and spiky, now fell in soft waves down to his neck, framing his face like a golden halo. As the two continued to stare at each other, the rest of the world faded away, leaving only the connection that sparked between them. The shattered vase and spilled water seemed inconsequential, a small price to pay for the rekindling of a long-lost bond. Finally, Kaushin broke the silence, his voice barely above a whisper. Wow, my pumpkin turned into a hottie. Aima giggled at Kaushin's comment, her eyes sparkling with amusement. Inoichi, however, was less amused. With a grunt, he reached out and slapped the back of Kaushin's head, causing the young man to wince. Watch your mouth, kid, Inoichi grumbled, though there was a hint of a smile on his face. Ino, her cheeks flushed with embarrassment and excitement, dashed down the remaining stairs and launched herself into Kaushin's arms. He caught her effortlessly, his arms encircling her waist as her legs wrapped around his torso. Their faces were mere inches apart, their breath mingling as they gazed into each other's eyes. I can't believe you're really here, Ina whispered, her voice trembling with emotion. I've missed you so much, Ko. Kaushin's smile was tender and sincere. I've missed you too, Pumpkin, he murmured, his eyes never leaving hers. More than you could ever know. They remained like that for a moment, the intensity of their connection leaving them breathless. The world around them seemed to fade away, leaving only the two of them and the love that bound them together. Finally, Ima cleared her throat, her voice gentle but insistent. I am. As much as I hate to interrupt this lovely reunion, perhaps we should clean up this mess before someone gets hurt? Eno blinked, her eyes darting to the shattered vase and the scattered flowers. She flushed with embarrassment, realizing that she had completely forgotten about the destruction she had caused. Reluctantly, she untangled herself from Kaushin's embrace and slid to the floor, her feet landing gracefully on the damp wood. Right, she murmured, her cheeks still flushed. I'm sorry about that. Inoichi looked away in displeasure, trying to hide a smile. Why don't you show that brat the new training ground, he suggested, gesturing to Ino. I can clean the stairs. Hokage-sama would want him to know the new training ground. Aima giggled at her husband's thinly veiled attempt to give Kaushin and Ino some time alone together. She exchanged a knowing glance with Inoichi, a warm smile on her face as she looked at the reunited pair. Grinning, Kaushin took Ino's hand and, without a moment's hesitation, pulled her towards the door. Come on, pumpkin. Let's go see what's new in Kanoha. Ino's laughter echoed through the shop as they dashed out the door, their hands still entwined. The sun had set, casting the village in a soft, romantic glow that only served to heighten the emotion between them. Eno led Kaushin through the familiar streets of Kanoha, her hand tightly gripping his as they ran. The wind whipped through their hair, and Kaushin couldn't help but marvel at how Eno's golden locks seemed to catch the soft moonlight, making her look like an ethereal vision. They eventually arrived at their usual spot by the river, 
a secluded area surrounded by trees that provided a serene atmosphere. The gurgling water added a soothing soundtrack as they slowed down, taking in the beauty of their surroundings. Eno glanced at Kaushin, her blue eyes shining with a mix of excitement and nervousness. I thought we could start here, she murmured, her cheeks flushing slightly as she led him to a large rock by the water's edge. Kaushin grinned, a mischievous glint in his eyes. You always did have a great taste in secret spots, Pumpkin. Eno rolled her eyes playfully but couldn't suppress a smile. Well, we did spend a lot of time here before you left, didn't we? Kaushin's grin softened as he took in the familiar sight of their spot. We did, he agreed, his voice filled with fondness. I can't count how many hours we spent here, just talking and laughing. He turned to look at Eno, his purple eyes locking onto her blue ones. I miss this place, he admitted, his voice barely above a whisper. But I missed you more. Eno's breath hitched in her throat, her heart swelling with a mixture of happiness and relief. I missed you too, Kaushin, she murmured, her eyes shining with unshed tears. It's been so lonely without you here. Kaushin reached out and gently wiped away a tear that had slipped down Eno's cheek. I'm sorry I left you alone for so long, Pumpkin. But I'm back now, and I'm not going anywhere. Eno leaned into Kaushin's touch, her eyes fluttering closed as she savored the warmth of his hand on her cheek. I know, she whispered. And I'm so glad you're back. The two of them settled down on the rock, their bodies pressed close together as they watched the moonlit water flow gently by. The silence that enveloped them was comfortable and filled with the unspoken emotions that they had been unable to share during their time apart. Kaushin gently draped his arm over Eno's shoulders, drawing her even closer to him. So, he began, a hint of mischief returning to his voice. How have you been keeping yourself busy while I was away? Eno raised an eyebrow, a playful smile tugging at her lips. Oh, you know, the usual. Saving the village, taking missions, and running the family business. Kaushin chuckled, his chest rumbling with amusement. Sounds like you've been quite a hero? Perfect daughter? Kunoichi? Ino asked with a grin. Well, I was going to say, a me, but sure, those as well. Kaushin copied her grin. Ino nudged him playfully with her elbow. Well, someone had to pick up the slack while you were off playing with your summoning creatures. Kaushin feigned a wounded expression, his hand flying to his chest as it struck. Ouch, pumpkin, that hurts. I wasn't playing, I was training. Eno giggled, her laughter ringing through the air like the sweetest melody. I know, I know, she conceded, her eyes sparkling with amusement. But I couldn't resist teasing you. Kaushin's expression softened, his eyes filled with warmth as he gazed at Eno. I'd miss that too, you know. Your laughter, your teasing. Everything. Eno blushed at his words, her heart fluttering in her chest. Well, you better get used to it again, she warned playfully. Because now that you're back, I won't be holding back. Kaushin grinned, his eyes twinkling with excitement. I wouldn't have it any other way, Pumpkin. Eno's eyes glowed with pride as she began to recount the accomplishments of their fellow comrades. Shikamaru and Choji have been training almost every day to develop the technique you gave them. They've grown so much, Kaushin. You'd be amazed at what they can do now. Kaushin's eyes widened in surprise, and he couldn't help but feel a surge of pride for his friends. That's incredible, Pumpkin. I knew they had it in them. Eno nodded, her smile never fading. And Sai, he's been away with Jiraiya quite often. They've been working on some top-secret mission, apparently. You know how Jiraiya is, always finding new challenges and mysteries to unravel. Kaushin chuckled, imagining how their interactions would be. I need to get details from Sai later. What about Shin and Kakashi? They're always busy, either on missions or at the training grounds, Ino replied, her voice tinged with admiration. Their dedication to the village and their students is unwavering. I know you'll be impressed with the progress they've made. Kaushin's eyes shone with the prospect of seeing one of his techniques in action. 
I can't wait to see them in action again. Eno's eyes sparkled with excitement as she continued. Shino has been working tirelessly on developing the technique you gave him. He's always been a hard worker, but you've given him a newfound sense of purpose. Kaoshin grinned, feeling a sense of accomplishment at having helped his friend find a new path. That's great to hear. I always knew Shino had a lot of untapped potential. And Hinata, Ino said, her voice filled with awe, she's found her own summoning realm and has been training there as well as in Kanoha. She's become even stronger, Ko. Her mastery of the gentle fist has grown tremendously. Kaoshin's eyes lit up with happiness for his shy friend. I'm so proud of her. Hinata's always been incredibly talented, she just needed a little push to believe in herself. Ino squeezed Kaoshin's hand, her blue eyes shining with love and pride. You've always been good at bringing out the best in people, Kaoshin. That's one of the many things I love about you. Kaoshin felt his cheeks heat up, but he couldn't suppress the grin that spread across his face. Thanks, Pumpkin. That means a lot coming from you. The two of them sat in comfortable silence for a moment, the soft sounds of the river and the rustling leaves providing a soothing backdrop for their conversation. Kaoshin couldn't help but feel a sense of contentment and belonging, surrounded by the familiar sights and sounds of Kanoha. Kaoshin tilted his head, a mischievous grin playing on his lips. So, Pumpkin, tell me more about how much you've missed me. Eno playfully rolled her eyes, feigning annoyance. Oh, don't get too full of yourself, Kaoshin. It's not like I've been sitting around, pining for you every day. Kaoshin chuckled, enjoying the easy banter between them. Really? So, you didn't think about me at all while I was gone? Eno blushed, her cheeks turning a delicate shade of pink. Well, maybe a little. Kaoshin leaned in closer, his purple eyes sparkling with mischief. A little? Come on, pumpkin. You can do better than that. Eno huffed, crossing her arms over her chest. Fine. Maybe I thought about you a lot. Happy now? Kaoshin's grin widened, and he nodded. Much better. Eno smirked and nudged him playfully. What about you? Did you ever think about me while you were off gallivanting in your summoning realm? Kaoshin's expression softened, his eyes filled with sincerity. Every day, Eno. There wasn't a moment when you weren't on my mind. Eno's heart fluttered at his confession, and she smiled, her blue eyes shining with affection. I'm glad to hear that, Prince Muffin. As they sat side by side on the rock, Kaoshin couldn't help but feel an overwhelming sense of happiness. It had been too long since he had spent time with Eno like this, sharing jokes and stories beneath the moonlit sky. You know, Kaoshin mused, his voice low and thoughtful, I've always loved this spot by the river. It's like our own little piece of paradise, hidden away from the rest of the world. Eno nodded, her eyes sweeping over the serene landscape. I know what you mean. No matter how crazy things got, this place always felt like a safe haven, a place where we could escape from our worries and just be ourselves. Kaoshin smiled, his heart swelling with affection for the girl beside him. I'm glad I have you to share it with, Eno. It wouldn't be the same without you. Eno smirked, giving Kaoshin a playful nudge. You're still a dork, you know that? Kaoshin feigned offense, gasping dramatically. A dork? Me? I'll have you know I'm the coolest guy in Kanoha. Eno laughed, shaking her head in amusement. Sure, Ko. Whatever helps you sleep at night. Kaoshin grinned, enjoying the playful banter between them. All right, Pumpkin, since you seem to be in such a good mood, how about I tell you a story? Like the last one I told you about Sokka and you. Eno's eyes lit up at the suggestion. Yes. I love that story. I've been waiting for another one of your tales. Don't hold back, okay? Kaoshin chuckled, scratching his chin in thought. Hmm, let me think. Ah, I've got the perfect one. He cleared his throat and began weaving a story filled with emotion and unexpected twists. Once upon a time, in a distant land, there lived a young king named Miriam. He was the ruler of a vast and powerful kingdom, 
feared and respected by all who knew him. Despite his youth, Miriam was incredibly intelligent and strategic, able to outweat any opponent who dared to challenge him. Eno leaned in closer, her eyes wide with interest. Wow, he sounds amazing. But what kind of person was he? Kaushin's expression grew somber. Miriam was ruthless and cold, with little regard for the lives of others. He believed that the strong should rule over the weak, and that his kingdom would thrive under his iron-fisted rule. Eno frowned, her brow furrowing in concern. That doesn't sound very nice. Kaushin nodded in agreement. No, it wasn't. But Miriam's life took an unexpected turn when he met a girl named Kamugi. Eno's eyes sparkled with curiosity. Who was she? A princess? Kaushin shook his head, a smile tugging at the corners of his mouth. No, she was just a simple blind girl who happened to be a master of a board game called Gungi. Despite her humble background, she had a unique talent that made her nearly unbeatable at the game. Eno's expression grew thoughtful. So, how did they meet? Kaushin's eyes grew distant as he continued the tale. One day, Miriam decided to challenge Kamugi to a game of Gungi. He was intrigued by her reputation and wanted to test her skills for himself. He thought it would be an easy victory, but he quickly discovered that he had met his match. Eno gasped, her eyes wide with astonishment. So she was that good? Kaushin nodded, his voice filled with admiration. Yes, she was. In fact, Kamugi was the first person to ever defeat Miriam in a game. And it wasn't just a fluke, she continued to beat him every time they played. Eno couldn't help but smile at the thought. I bet that was a humbling experience for him. It was, Kaushin agreed. But something else happened during their games, something that no one could have predicted. As they spent more time together, Miriam began to feel a connection with Kamugi that he had never experienced before. Eno leaned in closer, her interest piqued. What kind of connection? Kaushin hesitated, as if searching for the right words. It's hard to describe. It wasn't romantic, exactly, but there was a deep bond between them. Miriam found himself drawn to Kamugi's kindness, her humility, and her unwavering spirit. For the first time in his life, he began to question his own beliefs and actions. Eno's eyes shimmered with empathy. He was changing because of her, wasn't he? Kaushin nodded solemnly. Yes, he was. Kamugi's presence in his life forced Miriam to confront the darkness within himself. He started to see the value in compassion and understanding, and he began to treat his subjects with more kindness. Eno smiled softly, touched by the story. That's beautiful, Kaushin. I love how she was able to change him for the better. Kaushin's expression grew pensive. Yes, it was a powerful transformation. But the story doesn't end there. As Miriam began to change, so too did the world around him. Eno furrowed her brow in confusion. What do you mean? Kaushin sighed, his voice tinged with sadness. Although Miriam started to change, his past actions had consequences that caught up with him. There were those who saw him as a threat, a dangerous tyrant who needed to be stopped. Eno's expression grew concerned. What happened? Kaushin continued, his words heavy with emotion. A powerful man named Netero, who had been sent to kill Miriam, confronted him. Even though Miriam had begun to change, the sins of his past were not so easily forgotten. Netero fought Miriam, knowing he was weaker but determined to protect the world from Miriam's power. Eno gripped Kaushin's arm, her eyes wide with fear. Did he? Did he kill Miriam? Kaushin shook his head slowly. Not directly. During their battle, Netero managed to poison Miriam even though he ultimately lost his own life. Miriam, not knowing he had been poisoned, returned to Kamugi, desperate to spend his remaining moments with her. Eno's eyes filled with tears. Oh no! Please don't tell me! Kaushin's voice cracked as he continued the tragic tale. Miriam unknowingly carried the poison with him, and as they spent time together, playing their beloved game of Gungi, Kamugi was exposed to the deadly substance as well. 
Eno's heart ached for the star-crossed pair, her tears spilling over as she listened to the story's conclusion. In their final moments, Miriam and Kamugi embraced each other, knowing that their time together was coming to an end. They whispered their gratitude to one another, their love transcending the boundaries of life and death. Eno sobbed quietly, her chest heaving with emotion. That's so, so beautiful, Kaushin. And so heartbreaking. Kaushin nodded, his own eyes glistening with unshed tears. It is. But it's also a powerful reminder of the impact one person can have on another's life. Miriam might have never changed if not for Kamugi's presence, and her love for him allowed him to experience true happiness before the end. Eno sniffled, wiping her tears away with the back of her hand. Thank you for sharing that story, Kaushin. It really touched my heart. Kaushin smiled softly, his purple eyes filled with warmth. I'm glad you liked it, Eno. I think it's important for us to remember that even the most unlikely of people can change the world for the better. As they sat by the river, their hearts heavy with the bittersweet tale of Miriam and Kamugi, Eno and Kaushin found solace in one another's company. The moonlit sky above them seemed to whisper a reminder that love could truly change the world, and that the bonds they shared with one another were a precious gift not to be taken for granted. Chapter 78 Meeting with Others As the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of pink and orange, Eno and Kaushin reluctantly decided it was time to leave their secret spot by the river. They slowly made their way back towards the village, hand in hand, their hearts still filled with the emotions of the story Kaushin had shared. As they walked, the cool evening breeze rustling the leaves in the trees around them, Kaushin couldn't help but voice the question that had been on his mind. Hey, Eno. I was just wondering, why has your dad been so accommodating of me lately? I mean, he even suggested you show me the new training ground so we could be alone. He gave her a quizzical look, genuinely curious about the change in her father's attitude towards him. Eno giggled, her blue eyes dancing with amusement. Well, there are a few reasons, actually. First of all, my mom has been constantly nagging him about how he needs to be more supportive of our relationship. She really likes you, you know. Kaushin couldn't help but smile at the thought of Eno's mother advocating for him. I'm glad to hear that. I've always thought highly of your mom, too. Eno's grin widened as she continued. Secondly, my dad has been really impressed with the new technique you developed for me. He's always been a stickler for innovative jutsu, and he knows how hard you've worked to help me grow as a ninja. Kaushin blushed at the praise, rubbing the back of his neck sheepishly. Well, I just wanted to make sure you had every opportunity to reach your full potential, Pumpkin. You're incredibly talented, and I believe in you. Eno squeezed his hand, her eyes shining with love and gratitude. Thank you, Kaushin. That means the world to me. As they continued to stroll through the quiet streets of the village, Eno revealed the final reason for her father's change of heart. And lastly, I think my dad has come to realize just how much you care for me, especially after you came to my rescue a year and a half ago. Kaushin's eyes clouded with concern as he remembered that harrowing day. I would do anything to protect you, Eno. I hope you know that. Eno's expression softened as she gazed at him, her voice filled with tenderness. I do, Kaushin. And my dad knows it, too. He's seen the lengths you're willing to go to keep me safe, and I think that's finally convinced him that your intentions are genuine. Kaushin felt a wave of relief wash over him, knowing that he had finally earned the trust and approval of Eno's father. I'm glad he can see that now. I just want to make you happy, Eno. As they reached the outskirts of the village, the warm glow of lanterns illuminating their path, Eno turned to face Kaushin. Her eyes sparkled with affection as she leaned in, pressing a gentle kiss to his lips. When they pulled apart, Eno's cheeks were flushed with happiness. You make me happier than I ever thought possible, Kaushin. Kaushin's heart swelled with love and pride, his purple eyes filled with joy. I promise I'll never stop trying to make you happy, Pumpkin. Arm in arm, they walked towards the bustling center of the village, their love for each other shining like a beacon in the fading twilight. As they walked hand in hand, Kaushin and Eno noticed their friends up ahead, gathered together in small groups. 
Eno squeezed Kaushin's hand, excitement building in her voice. Look, Kaushin. Everyone's here. They've been waiting for you to return. Kaushin grinned, ready to reunite with his friends after almost three years. They approached the first group, consisting of Shikamaru and Choji. Hey, lazy ass. Kaushin called out to Shikamaru playfully, a wide grin on his face. Shikamaru smirked, a hint of amusement in his eyes. Kaushin! Long time no see, smart ass. Welcome back. Choji chuckled as Kaushin turned to him. And how's it going, fat ass? Not too bad, Choji replied, grinning. Glad to have you back, Kaushin. Kaushin laughed, slapping them both on the back. It's great to see you guys again. I've missed you. As they continued on, they came across Asuma and Kurinai, who greeted Kaushin warmly. Asuma, Kurinai. How are you two doing? Kaushin asked, smiling. Kaushin, we're doing well, Asuma replied, returning the smile. It's good to have you back. Kurinai nodded, her eyes softening. We've missed you around here. Thank you, Kaushin said, touched by their words. It's great to be home. Next, they encountered Sai, Shin, and Yu Yu. Kaushin grinned, his eyes twinkling with mischief. Hey there, pale ass and twin pale ass. Sai smirked, a rare display of emotion on his face. Nice to see you, Kaushin. I assume you've been up to no good, as usual? Kaushin laughed, nodding at Sai. You know me too well. Shin, ever the quieter one, offered Kaushin a small smile. Welcome back, Kaushin. Kaushin turned to Yu Yu, his smile warm and friendly. And how have you been, Yu Yu? Keeping these two in line? Yu Yu giggled, nodding in agreement. Someone has to do it. We're all really happy you're back, Kaushin. As they moved on, they came across Shino, who, despite his stoic manner, offered Kaushin a fist bump. Shino! It's been too long, my friend, Kaushin said, his eyes alight with happiness. Shino's voice was calm but carried a hint of warmth. Indeed, it has. Welcome back, Kaushin. Kaushin was momentarily dumbfounded when they encountered Irika and Anko together. Irika sensei Anko! I never would have guessed. Irika chuckled, his arm around Anko's waist. Well, life can be full of surprises, Kaushin. It's good to see you again. Anko grinned, her eyes teasing. Don't act so shocked, Kaushin. Love works in mysterious ways. Kaushin laughed, shaking his head. I suppose you're right. It's great to see you both so happy. Finally, they came upon Hinata, who rushed towards Kaushin, her eyes shining with joy. Kaushin, she exclaimed, her arms wrapping around him in a warm embrace. Kaushin hugged her back, his voice filled with affection. Hinata! How have you been? It's been far too long. Hinata pulled back, her cheeks flushed with happiness. I've been well, Kaushin. I've missed you so much. Kaushin smiled, his purple eyes shining with warmth. I've missed you too, Hinata. It's so good to see you again. As they continued to catch up with their friends, laughter and joy filled the air. Kaushin felt a sense of belonging and contentment, surrounded by the people he cared for deeply. The playful banter and genuine camaraderie were a testament to the bond they all shared. Ino watched Kaushin with a smile, her heart swelling with pride and love. She knew how much he cherished these friendships, and seeing him so happy warmed her heart. Shikamaru, leaning against a nearby wall, raised an eyebrow as he observed the scene. You know, Kaushin, it's nice to see you like this. I think we can all agree that the village hasn't been the same without you. Kaushin grinned, his eyes glinting with gratitude. I appreciate that, Shikamaru. I'm glad to be back. Choji chimed in, a wide smile on his face. Now we can finally get back to our usual shenanigans. And maybe even grab a bite to eat at our favorite barbecue place? Kaushin laughed, nodding in agreement. I wouldn't have it any other way, 
Choji. As the evening wore on, the group continued to reminisce and share stories, their laughter echoing through the village. Kaoshan, surrounded by his friends and the love of his life, felt a deep sense of happiness and contentment. He knew that, no matter what challenges they faced, they would face them together, as a family. Chapter 79 Naruto is Back Kaoshin stood on the roof of the Hokage building, his arms wrapped around Ino from behind, as they both joined Hinata, Shizun, Tsunade, and Kakashi in waiting for Naruto's arrival. Kaoshin had somehow known that Naruto would arrive at that moment, and although no one questioned how he knew, they all gathered in anticipation. As they waited, the group chatted animatedly, with Kaoshin playfully teasing and flirting with Ino, much to the amusement and occasional annoyance of the others. Kaoshin grinned at Ino, raising an eyebrow. So, Pumpkin, you think Naruto will be taller than me when he gets back? Ino rolled her eyes, smiling despite herself. I don't know, Kaoshin, maybe he'll just be more mature than you. Tsunade, smirking at their banter, chimed in. Oh, I think we can all agree that's a given. Kakashi, with his usual nonchalance, added, but knowing Naruto, he'll probably still be as unpredictable and mischievous as ever. Just as the words left Kakashi's mouth, a puff of smoke appeared on the rooftop, signaling Naruto's arrival. As the smoke cleared, the group was momentarily taken aback by his appearance. Naruto had grown significantly taller and more muscular, his sixteen-year-old frame now carrying a distinct air of confidence and strength. His once spiky blonde hair was now pulled back into a man bun, revealing the striking blue eyes that sparkled with mischief and determination. The whisker-like markings on his cheeks seemed to have deepened, lending him a more mature and fierce appearance. His Tengu-style crimson and black kimono draped over his broad shoulders, the rich colors accentuating his tan skin and powerful aura. The Sorrow Cutter, a katana with a red scabbard adorned with intricate designs, hung at his waist, a testament to his growth as a shinobi. But what caught everyone's attention the most was the diamond-shaped violet seal on his forehead. It seemed to radiate a mysterious energy, and the group couldn't help but wonder about its significance and the power it might hold. As they took in the sight of the transformed Naruto, their shock quickly turned to joy and excitement. With a wide grin, Naruto skinned the group and his eyes locked on Hinata. He rushed towards her, enveloping her in a tight embrace, much to her embarrassment, but she happily hugged back. I missed you so much, princess, he exclaimed, his voice filled with genuine affection. Hinata's cheeks flushed a deep crimson as she stuttered, I I missed you too, Naruto. Kaoshin grumbled unhappily, although he smiled, saying, You raised them for years, and they just forget you and hug their girlfriends. His mock complaint drew laughter from the group, and Naruto turned to face him, his eyes widening in surprise as he realized Kaoshin was there. Ko, he exclaimed, a wide grin spreading across his face as he disentangled himself from Hinata and darted towards his surrogate brother. Kaoshin opened his arms, and Naruto practically tackled him into a tight hug, his enthusiasm nearly knocking them both off their feet. It's so good to see you, Ko. Naruto said, his voice filled with genuine happiness. I can't believe you're finally back. Kaoshin chuckled, returning the embrace with equal warmth. It's good to see you too, little brother. I've missed you. As they pulled apart, Kaoshin looked Naruto up and down, taking in the changes that had occurred during their time apart. You've grown so much, Naruto. I can hardly believe it. Naruto rubbed the back of his head sheepishly, a familiar gesture that Kaoshin found endearing. Yeah, well, I had a great teacher, didn't I? Kaoshin smiled, his heart swelling with pride at the young man his brother had become. You look so cool in those robes, I am going to burn them. Tsunade, unable to contain her curiosity any longer, studied the violet seal on Naruto's forehead with a mixture of surprise and admiration. Naruto, how on earth did you learn to cultivate my secret technique? The strength of a hundred seal was a creation of my grandmother Mido, and I was the only other person who knew it. Naruto grinned, his blue eyes dancing with excitement as he prepared to share his discovery. Well, you know how I've been training with the Tengu clan, right? 
their first contractor was actually an Uzumaki Uzumaki Hana. It turns out she left some special seals behind in their realm, and one of them was the Violet Seal. When I first saw it, I was shocked, because I thought only you knew this technique, Grandma Tsunade. So, I asked the Tengu leader, Kanoha Tengu, about it, and he told me Mito probably learned it from Hannah's records or one of her students. Tsunade listened intently, her brow furrowed as she processed the new information. That's fascinating, Naruto. It seems our family's connection to the Tengu clan runs even deeper than we thought. Kakashi, leaning against the railing of the rooftop, looked intrigued. So, Naruto, is this seal you've cultivated any different from Tsunade's version? Naruto nodded enthusiastically, clearly eager to share the details. Actually, it is. It has all the perks of the strength of a hundred seal, but it also has the added ability to store a vast amount of elemental chakra. In my case, that's wind chakra. Hinata's eyes widened with wonder. That's incredible, Naruto. It must be an incredibly powerful technique. Naruto rubbed the back of his head, a touch of pride evident in his expression. It's definitely been a huge help during my training. I think it's going to make a big difference in our future battles. Shizun, who had been silently listening to the conversation, finally spoke up. Naruto, I'm impressed with how far you've come. Your dedication to becoming stronger and protecting those you care about is truly inspiring. Naruto's cheeks reddened slightly at the praise, but he smiled gratefully. Thanks, Shizun. I couldn't have done it without all the support and encouragement from all of you. Kaushin playfully punched Naruto's shoulder, his eyes twinkling with amusement. Well, don't get too cocky, little brother. There's still a lot for you to learn. Naruto laughed, looking at Kaushin with an evil grin on his face. Your days of tyranny have come to an end, Ko. I shall prove once and for all that I am the older brother by kicking your ass. Kaushin smirked, his eyes shining with amusement. Heh, you're still a hundred years too young to beat me, Naruto. Tsunade, her excitement mounting, chimed in. We still haven't tested Kaushin's power. Let's go to training ground seven to test both of your powers. The others eagerly voiced their agreement, ready to see the two surrogate brothers face off, when suddenly, a red beam landed on Naruto's chest. Karen, her face flushed with happiness, wrapped her arms around him, exclaiming how much she had missed him. Naruto, caught off guard by her sudden embrace, looked down at Karen in surprise. K. Karen, it's good to see you too. Hinata, observing the scene with a mixture of amusement and mild annoyance, gently cleared her throat. Ahem, Karen, I think Naruto needs to breathe. Karen, realizing her overenthusiastic hug, sheepishly released Naruto and stepped back. Eh, sorry, I just got so excited to see him again. Naruto smiled warmly at Karen, appreciative of her concern for him. No worries, Karen. It's really great to see you again too. Kaushin, ever the playful instigator, winked at Naruto. Careful, little brother. You might have more than one challenger today. Naruto rolled his eyes at Kaushin's teasing but couldn't suppress a chuckle. The group, now joined by Karen, made their way to training ground seven, their anticipation growing with each step. As they arrived, they couldn't help but marvel at the vast expanse of the training ground, filled with an assortment of targets, obstacles, and sparring rings. The perfect setting for a friendly competition between the two powerhouse shinobi. Tsunade, clearly in her element, clapped her hands to gather everyone's attention. All right, Kaushin and Naruto, let's see what you've got. We'll start with a simple sparring match, no jutsu or chakra usage. Just hand-to-hand -hand combat. Are you both ready? Naruto and Kaushin nodded, their eyes locked on one another, determination and excitement written across their faces. As Naruto and Kaushin stepped into the sparring ring, they took a moment to size each other up. Their eyes met, a spark of competitiveness igniting between them. They exchanged grins, knowing that this friendly match would give them an opportunity to test their skills against one another and provide a chance to strengthen their bond. Tsunade raised her hand, preparing to signal the start of the match. 
On my mark, begin. The moment her hand dropped, Naruto and Kaushin sprang into action. Naruto launched himself at Kaushin with surprising speed, aiming a punch at his face. Kaushin, however, easily sidestepped the attack, countering with a swift kick to Naruto's side. Naruto grunted as he took the hit, but his grin never wavered. You still got it, Ko. But you're not the only one who's been training. Kaushin chuckled, his eyes sparkling with amusement. Is that so, little brother? Let's see what you've got. Chapter 80, Kaushin vs. Naruto Naruto responded with a rapid series of punches and kicks, forcing Kaushin to stay on the defensive. Kaushin, however, remained calm and composed, parrying and dodging each attack with practiced ease. As they continued to trade blows, their friends watched in awe, impressed by the speed and power both fighters displayed. Ino, standing beside Hinata, couldn't help but cheer them on. Come on, Kaushin! Show Naruto what you're made of. Hinata, however, couldn't help but worry for Naruto's safety. Please be careful, Naruto. During a brief pause in their battle, Kaushin glanced over at Ino, a teasing glint in his eye. Pumpkin, with your cheerings carrying me, I shall blast his arrogant ass off. Ino rolled her eyes, laughing despite herself. Oh, please, like you need cheering to show off. Just don't hurt each other too much, okay? Kaushin grinned before turning his attention back to Naruto. You hear that, little brother? We've got an audience. Naruto smirked, not missing a beat. Well, in that case, I guess I'll have to show off a little. With that, Naruto rushed forward, his movements a blur as he attempted to land a hit on Kaushin. Kaushin, however, anticipated the move and caught Naruto's fist in his hand, using his momentum to throw him over his shoulder. Naruto, however, quickly flipped midair, landing gracefully on his feet. Not bad, Ko. But I've got a few tricks up my sleeve too. Kaushin raised an eyebrow, curious to see what Naruto had in store. Oh really? Let's see it then. Naruto didn't disappoint. He charged at Kaushin again, this time feinting a high kick before quickly changing direction and sweeping Kaushin's legs out from under him. Kaushin landed on his back with a grunt, momentarily stunned by Naruto's agility. He quickly recovered, springing back to his feet with a grin. Impressive, Naruto. I didn't see that one coming. Naruto beamed, proud of himself for catching Kaushin off guard. Just a little something I picked up during my training. But I'm not done yet. Their sparring match continued, both fighters evenly matched as they showcased their skills. Each blow was met with a counter, and neither could gain the upper hand. The onlookers, enthralled by the display, cheered and shouted encouragement, their excitement growing with each passing moment. As Naruto and Kaushin continued their intense hand-to-hand -hand combat, their movements became a blur, a testament to their incredible speed and power. The two surrogate brothers exchanged blow after blow, each one met with a parry or dodge, their faces a mix of determination and exhilaration. Naruto, panting slightly, wiped sweat from his brow before grinning at Kaushin. You know, Ko, I never thought I'd enjoy getting my ass kicked so much. Kaushin laughed, equally winded but still full of energy. You're not doing so bad yourself, little brother. But don't think I'm going to go easy on you. The banter between the two only served to fuel their competitive spirits, and their friends couldn't help but be drawn in by their enthusiasm. As Kaushin narrowly dodged a spinning kick from Naruto, Shikamaru, who arrived with Choji upon hearing the battle, commented from the sidelines, I never thought I'd see the day when Naruto would give Kaushin a run for his money. Ino, her eyes never leaving the intense battle, nodded in agreement. It's amazing how much they've both grown. It's hard to believe they're the same people we knew all those years ago. Hinata, her hands clasped together in worry, whispered, I just hope they don't hurt each other too much. Back in the ring, Naruto and Kaushin continued their fast-paced exchange, their movements almost too quick for the human eye to follow. Kaushin, taking advantage of a brief lapse in Naruto's defenses, managed to land a solid punch to his shoulder. Naruto winced but grinned, 
his eyes sparkling with determination. Nice hit, Ko. But you're going to have to do better than that to take me down. Kaoshin smirked, not missing a beat. Is that a challenge, little brother? Naruto's response was to charge forward, his fist aimed directly at Kaoshin's face. Kaoshin, however, easily sidestepped the attack, countering with a swift elbow to Naruto's side. As Naruto reeled from the blow, Kaoshin seized the opportunity to launch a flurry of attacks. Naruto, however, quickly regained his composure and managed to parry each strike with impressive skill. Their friends, watching in awe, couldn't help but be impressed by the sheer speed and power of their sparring match. Choji shouted, Come on, Naruto! Show smartass what you've learned. Hinata, her worry momentarily forgotten, cheered, You can do it, Naruto. I believe in you. Feeling a sudden surge of confidence, Naruto decided to up the ante. As Kaoshin charged forward, Naruto swiftly drew Saro Cutter, the katana gleaming dangerously in the sunlight. Kaoshin, caught off guard by the sudden appearance of the weapon, instinctively reached for a kunai, his grip firm and steady. The atmosphere shifted as the two brothers faced each other, weapons in hand, their eyes locked in a fierce, unwavering stare. The onlookers gasped as they watched the sparring match escalate, the tension in the air palpable. Ino glanced nervously at Hinata, who was biting her lip in concern. This is getting serious, Ino muttered, her eyes never leaving the two combatants. Hinata nodded, her hands clenched into fists at her sides. Please be careful, both of you, she whispered, her voice barely audible. As Naruto and Kaushin circled each other, weapons at the ready, their gazes never wavered. Naruto's eyes were filled with determination, while Kaushin's held a hint of excitement. With a sudden burst of speed, Naruto lunged at Kaushin, sorrow cutter slicing through the air with a deadly grace. Kaushin, however, was quick to react, deflecting the blow with his kunai. The sharp clang of metal against metal rang out, echoing through the training grounds as the two warriors exchanged a series of rapid, powerful strikes. Each attack was met with a counter, neither willing to give the other an opening. Naruto, fueled by his desire to prove himself, continued to press the attack, forcing Kaushin to remain on the defensive. Kaushin, however, maintained his composure, his movements fluid and precise as he parried each of Naruto's strikes. The onlookers held their breath, their eyes locked on the intense battle unfolding before them. Shikamaru couldn't help but marvel at their skill, commenting, I never thought I'd see Naruto wielding a katana like that. His training with Tengu really paid off. Ino nodded, her heart pounding with a mixture of fear and excitement. I know. It's incredible. But Kaushin is holding his own too. He's always been resourceful. As the weapon battle continued, both Naruto and Kaushin began to show signs of fatigue, their breaths coming in ragged gasps as they struggled to maintain their speed and power. Sweat dripped from their brows, but neither was willing to back down. Chapter 81 Naruto vs. Kaushin Part 2 Seeing that he was losing ground, Naruto focused his chakra, and a cloak of wind enveloped his body. The wind chakra cloak made him faster, lighter, and allowed him to deflect incoming attacks with ease. His movements became a blur, and the sheer speed of his attacks increased dramatically. Kaushin's eyes widened in surprise, but a grin soon spread across his face. He was always up for a challenge. Channeling his own chakra, Kaushin was enveloped by a lightning chakra cloak, making him as fast as lightning, with improved response time and reflexes. The two surrogate brothers, now both cloaked in elemental chakra, charged towards one another, their weapons clashing with a resounding clang. The force of their blows shook the air around them, creating gusts of wind and crackling sparks of electricity. Their friends watched in awe, unable to tear their eyes away from the epic, high-speed battle. Choji, his eyes wide with excitement, exclaimed, I've never seen anything like this before. They're both so fast. Shikamaru nodded, his analytical mind working overtime. This is something else entirely. Naruto's wind chakra cloak is impressive, but Kaushin's lightning chakra cloak is just as powerful. It's hard to predict the outcome of this match. 
Eno and Hinata, on the other hand, were growing increasingly worried. The intensity of the battle had reached new heights, and both fighters were pushing themselves to their limits. As the battle raged on, Naruto and Kaushin continued to clash, their elemental chakra cloaks flaring with each strike. The air was filled with a chaotic symphony of crackling lightning and howling wind as the two fighters showcased their newfound abilities. Naruto, his wind chakra cloak swirling around him, launched a series of rapid slashes with Sorrow Cutter, the wind-enhanced blades slicing through the air with devastating force. Kaushin, however, managed to dodge and deflect each attack, his lightning chakra cloak granting him the speed and reflexes to keep up with Naruto's onslaught. Not to be outdone, Kaushin went on the offensive, his kunai crackling with electricity as he thrust it towards Naruto. Naruto's wind chakra cloak came to his aid, deflecting the electrified weapon just in time. The onlookers could hardly believe their eyes, as the two warriors continued to trade blows at a breakneck pace. Even their elemental chakra cloak seemed to be locked in a fierce competition, the wind and lightning fighting for dominance with each attack. Naruto, fueled by his desire to prove himself, pushed his wind chakra cloak to its limits, the wind swirling around him growing more and more powerful. Kaushin, unwilling to be outmatched, did the same with his lightning chakra cloak, the electricity crackling around him becoming more intense. Naruto managed to disarm Kaushin, and smirking, he declared, Looks like I win, big brother. Shikamaru and Choji sighed, nodding in agreement. That was a good battle, Kaushin, but it looks like Naruto has you beat this time, Choji said. Kaushin stared at his empty hand, a momentary look of frustration crossing his face. But before he could respond, Ino, Hinata, and Kakashi shook their heads. Ino smiled, her eyes full of confidence in her partner. Don't count Kaushin out just yet. His strong suit was never weapons, but his fists. Hinata nodded, recalling the countless sparring matches she had witnessed between the two. Kaushin's hand-to-hand -hand combat skills are formidable. Kakashi, who had been silently observing the match, finally spoke up. That's right. Kaushin's true strength lies in his taijutsu. Naruto's smirk faltered, and he gulped as he remembered the painful beatings he had received from Kaushin's fists in the past. He knew better than anyone the sheer power behind those hands. Kaushin cracked his knuckles and grinned, electricity still crackling around his body. Well, little brother, it seems our audience wants a show. Are you ready for round two? Naruto steeled himself, his determination returning. Bring it on, Kaushin. I'm not backing down. The air on the battlefield grew heavy, charged with tension and anticipation as Kaushin stepped forward, his body wreathed in lightning. Naruto braced himself, his wind chakra cloak swirling around him like a protective shield. Kaushin launched himself at Naruto, his fists striking like bolts of lightning. Naruto barely had time to react as Kaushin's powerful blows connected with his body, sending him reeling. The crackling energy from the lightning chakra cloak only served to amplify the force behind each hit. Naruto gritted his teeth, trying to fight through the pain and regain his footing. He managed to dodge a few of Kaushin's strikes, but the sheer speed and power behind them made it nearly impossible to avoid them all. Ino, Hinata, and the others watched anxiously as Kaushin continued his relentless assault. They could see the pain etched on Naruto's face, but they also saw his determination not to give in. Kaushin, his eyes focused and intense, pressed on. You're doing better than I expected, Naruto. But you're still not quite there. Naruto, struggling to stay on his feet, glared back at Kaushin. Don't underestimate me, Kaushin. I've still got a few tricks up my sleeve. With that, Naruto summoned all his strength and launched a counterattack, using his wind chakra cloak to propel him forward. He managed to land a solid hit on Kaushin, sending him skidding backward. Kaushin quickly recovered and smirked, acknowledging Naruto's resilience. Not bad, little brother. But now it's my turn. He rushed forward, his fists moving with blinding speed. Naruto tried to deflect and dodge the attacks, but he was quickly growing exhausted. Hinata clenched her fists, her worry for Naruto mounting. Please be careful, Naruto. Ino, 
her eyes full of concern, added, Kaushin, don't push him too hard. Remember, this is just a friendly sparring match. Kakashi, observing the battle, remarked, Kaushin's taijutsu has always been exceptional. Naruto is doing well to keep up, but he's starting to reach his limit. Shikamaru nodded in agreement, concern etched on his face as well. We should probably stop this before it gets out of hand. The intensity of the battle continued to grow, with Kaushin and Naruto exchanging blow after blow, their elemental chakra cloaks flaring with each hit. Their friends watched, torn between admiration for their skills and worry for their well-being. Chapter 82 Catching Up Naruto, his body battered and bruised, struggled to maintain his wind chakra cloak. He knew that he couldn't keep this up much longer, but his stubborn pride refused to let him concede defeat. Kaushin, noticing Naruto's faltering chakra, hesitated for a moment. His eyes softened, and he slowed his attacks, his concern for his surrogate brother outweighing his competitive spirit. Naruto, Kaushin said, his voice surprisingly gentle. We can stop now if you want. There's no need to push yourself too far. Naruto, panting and covered in sweat, met Kaushin's gaze. Despite his exhaustion, his eyes still burned with determination. No. I can keep going. I won't back down. Kaushin sighed, knowing that arguing with Naruto would be futile. Instead, he decided to test Naruto's resolve. All right, then. But remember, Naruto, sometimes it's better to admit when you've reached your limit. With that, Kaushin resumed his assault, though he held back slightly, not wanting to cause any serious harm. Naruto, despite his exhaustion, continued to fight back with everything he had, his wind chakra cloak flickering like a dying flame. Their friends watched anxiously, their hearts pounding with each exchange of blows. Hinata, unable to bear the sight of Naruto's pain any longer, stepped forward. Please, stop! You're both hurting each other. Ino nodded in agreement. Yeah, this has gone on long enough. You've both proven your skills, there's no need to keep fighting. Kaushin, hearing the concern in their voices, finally relented. He pulled back his fists, allowing Naruto to catch his breath. All right, Naruto. I'll call it a draw. You fought well. Naruto, gasping for air, nodded gratefully. Thanks, Kaushin. You were amazing as always. The two surrogate brothers, battered and exhausted, shared a tired smile. They knew that they had both grown stronger through their intense battle, and their bond had only deepened as a result. As the onlookers rushed forward to check on Naruto and Kaushin, both fighters knew that this was just one of many challenges they would face together. Their journey to becoming the strongest shinobi in the world had only just begun, and they would continue to push each other to new heights. As Naruto leaned on Hinata for support, his body aching but his spirit unbroken, he vowed to himself that he would never stop fighting, no matter the odds. For his friends, for his village, and for the brother who stood beside him, he would continue to strive for greatness. And together, they would conquer any obstacle that stood in their way. Tsunade approached the duo, her eyes filled with pride and admiration. You two put on quite a show. I'm impressed by how much you've both grown. Kakashi stepped forward with a grin hidden beneath his mask. You might even give me a run for my money one of these days. His eyes twinkled with amusement. But I couldn't help but notice that neither of you used any ninjutsu during the fight. Did you two decide to focus solely on taijutsu? He chuckled, teasing them about their impressive display of hand-to-hand -hand combat and swordsmanship. Naruto's eyes shone with excitement, eager to share his progress. Actually, Kakashi-sensei, I've been working really hard on my ninjutsu too. Tsunade-sama asked us not to use it during the fight, but I've got some new tricks up my sleeve. His enthusiasm was contagious, and the others couldn't help but smile at his determination. Kaushin, on the other hand, simply smiled mysteriously, opting not to reveal his own ninjutsu progress just yet. Their friends and fellow shinobi joined in the conversation, discussing the incredible battle they had just witnessed. As they walked back towards the village, 
more and more villagers who had heard of Naruto's return came out to greet him. Each of them expressed their happiness at seeing him back home, and Naruto gratefully acknowledged each of them with a warm smile and a heartfelt thank you. Eventually, Sakura appeared, her eyes wide with excitement as she approached the group. Kiba trailed closely behind her, his tail wagging energetically. Naruto, she exclaimed, her voice filled with joy. It's so good to have you back. Naruto looked at her, his expression softening as he addressed her formally. Thank you, Sakura-san. He then continued on his way, leaving her behind without any further interaction. Sakura's smile faltered, and she let out a heavy sigh. The formality of his response had hurt, but she didn't say anything. Instead, she tried to focus on the positive, knowing that Naruto's return was something to celebrate. As they continued their walk through the village, the group engaged in light-hearted banter. Shikamaru and Ino teased Choji about his ever-growing appetite, while Hinata listened intently to Naruto's stories about his time away. After a while, Hinata and Ino pulled Naruto and Kaushin away from the group. The four of them climbed over the Hokage Mountain and found a quiet spot overlooking the village. As the stars twinkled above, the boys hugged their girls from behind, talking softly, each sharing stories of their own adventures. Ino began, excitement in her voice. You guys won't believe the Jutsu Kaushin gave me before you left. It took most of the three years to master, but I finally got the hang of it. Her eyes sparkled with pride. Kaushin smiled, his arms wrapped around Ino. I knew you could do it, Pumpkin. You've always had the determination and the talent. Ino's declaration piqued everyone's curiosity, but she didn't go into the specifics of the Jutsu. Instead, she left them wanting more, eager to see her newfound skill in action. You guys will just have to wait until I get a chance to show it off, she teased, her eyes twinkling with mischief. Naruto's eyes widened in anticipation, a grin spreading across his face. You've got me all fired up now, Ino. I can't wait to see what you've been working on. Hinata chimed in, you should see her go. It is amazing. Kaushin, leaning against a nearby rock, finally began sharing his own adventures from the past three years. Well, I spent a lot of time traveling between different parts of my summon realm. There was some internal strife among the factions, but I managed to help them come to an understanding and unite under a single banner. He continued, it wasn't too difficult, but it was time-consuming. I also had the chance to hone my own skills and learn from some of the best fighters in the realm. Naruto, his arms wrapped around Hinata, listened intently as Kaushin spoke. That sounds awesome, Ko. No wonder you've gotten so strong. It was then Naruto's turn to share his experiences. Well, you see, I train with the Tengu elder, Kanoha Tengu, on seals. He's really strict, but he knows his stuff. And my summon, Jutengu, taught me a lot about wind art and sword art. His eyes twinkled with mischief as he continued, but most of the time, I was either trying to escape from the Tengu's pranks or pulling pranks on them myself. I remember this one time when I swapped their favorite drink with something really spicy. You should have seen their faces. Ino and Hinata laughed, imagining the scene. Naruto, encouraged by their laughter, went on to describe more of his mischievous exploits. Another time, I covered the floor of their training hall with a thin layer of oil. When they started practicing, they all slipped and fell on their backs. It was hilarious. Kaushin shook his head, chuckling. You never change, do you, Naruto? Always the prankster. Finally, it was Hinata's turn to share her story. I decided to try reverse summoning, and I ended up in the White Fox realm. They're a reclusive, mystical race of foxes, and they have incredible powers. She paused, a hint of shyness returning to her voice. At first, they asked me to take on a trial, but I managed to prove myself in a trial they set for me. After that, they accepted me as one of their own and began teaching me their unique style of taijutsu, which incorporates water release techniques and ice release. Naruto, his interest piqued, asked excitedly, Wow, Hinata. That sounds amazing. So you can use ice release now too? Hinata blushed, 
pleased by Naruto's enthusiasm. Yes, I've been practicing a lot. I still have a lot to learn, but I've made progress. Chapter 83, Nakama Power They continued to sit in each other's embrace, enjoying the warmth and comfort of being together again. Naruto and Hinata spoke softly, reminiscing about their time apart. Naruto's eyes softened as he gazed at Hinata. I really missed you, Hinata. It was hard being away from everyone, but being away from you was the toughest. Hinata smiled, her cheeks flushing pink. I missed you too, Naruto. I thought about you every day and wondered how you were doing. Naruto leaned in, placing a gentle kiss on her forehead. I'm just so glad to be back with you. As they shared tender moments, Kaushin and Ino engaged in more playful and teasing banter. Ino elbowed Kaushin in the ribs, a wicked grin on her face. So, did you miss me as much as I missed you, or were you too busy playing hero in your summon realm? Kaushin smirked, feigning nonchalance. Oh, you know, a little bit of both. But, of course, I missed you, Ino. Ino raised an eyebrow, challenging him. Prove it. Kaushin leaned in, whispering something in her ear that made her burst into laughter. All right, all right, I believe you. As they sat together, Ino turned to Kaushin, her eyes twinkling with curiosity. Hey, Kaushin, why don't you tell us another story? I love the ones you told me about Saka and you, Maruam and Kamugi. They were so romantic. Kaushin nodded, a thoughtful expression on his face. All right, but this time, I'll tell you a story about friendship. It's about a young man named Luffy and his incredible journey with his Nakama. Naruto and Hinata looked at each other, intrigued. They both loved a good story, and Kaushin was an exceptional storyteller. Kaushin took a deep breath and began. Luffy was just a young boy when he set out on his journey to become the king. He was determined, but he knew he couldn't do it alone. He needed friends, and so he began searching for them. He paused for a moment, setting the stage for the story. One by one, Luffy met people who would become his Nakama. They were all different, each with their own unique talents and abilities, but they all shared one thing, a deep bond of friendship with Luffy. First, there was Zoro, a skilled swordsman with a dream of becoming the world's greatest, Kaushin continued. Luffy saved Zoro from certain death, and in return, Zoro pledged his loyalty and his sword to Luffy's cause. Ino listened intently, her eyes wide with wonder. Wow, that sounds like a strong bond. They must have really trusted each other. Kaushin nodded. They did, and their friendship only grew stronger as they continued on their journey. Next, they met Nami, a talented navigator with a troubled past. She was initially reluctant to join them, but Luffy's unwavering trust and support eventually won her over. He continued, as they sailed the seas, their crew grew with the addition of Usopp, a skilled marksman with a penchant for tall tales, and Sanji, a gifted cook with a heart of gold. Each of them had their own dreams and aspirations, but they shared a common goal to help Luffy become the king. As Kaushin spoke, Naruto and Hinata exchanged glances, seeing the similarities between Luffy's crew and their own group of friends. Kaushin went on to describe the numerous adventures Luffy and his Nakama experienced, facing powerful foes and overcoming seemingly insurmountable challenges. But then, Kaushin said, his voice growing somber, a great enemy appeared, powerful enough to scatter Luffy's Nakama to the winds, sending them far and wide across the world. Ino gasped, her hands clenching into fists. That's awful. What did Luffy do? Kaushin sighed, a solemn expression on his face. Luffy wanted more than anything to find his scattered Nakama, but fate had other plans. He learned that his brother, Ace, was in the hands of the Marines and was about to be executed. Torn between his friends and his brother, Luffy chose to aid Ace. He paused, allowing the weight of Luffy's choice to sink in. Luffy battled against the world to save his brother, and for a moment, it seemed that he had succeeded. But the enemy was relentless, and despite Luffy's best efforts, Ace died. Naruto's eyes widened, his heart aching for Luffy's loss. That's, 
That's terrible. Hinata nodded, her eyes glistening with unshed tears. How did Luffy cope with such a devastating loss? Kaushin looked at them, his eyes filled with sorrow. Luffy was devastated, of course. But more than that, he realized that he was too weak to protect those he cared about most. With no other choice, he made a difficult decision. He took a deep breath before continuing, Luffy sent a message to his crew, telling them that they needed to train for two years. After that time, they would meet again, stronger and more prepared to face the challenges that awaited them. Eno's eyes shimmered with determination. That's a powerful decision. To recognize your own weaknesses and strive to improve, it's something we can all learn from. Kaushin nodded in agreement. Indeed, it is. So, each member of Luffy's crew dedicated themselves to their training, determined to become stronger for their captain and their friends. Hinata leaned in closer, her curiosity piqued. Where did they go to train? Did they have mentors like we did? Kaushin nodded, acknowledging Hinata's question. Yes, they each sought out the best possible training they could find. Some of them had mentors, while others relied on their own determination and ingenuity. He glanced up at the sky, as if drawing inspiration from the stars. Zoro, for example, knelt down before the very man he had sworn to surpass one day. For a swordsman who values honor above all else, it was one of the most shameful things he could have done. But he did it for his captain, for his crew, and for his own growth. Naruto's eyes widened, admiration clear in his expression. Wow, that's some serious dedication. Kaushin continued, Nami, Usopp, Sanji, Chopper, Robin, Frankie, and Brooke, each of them worked tirelessly to improve themselves, to grow stronger, and to be better prepared for the challenges they would face together. They knew that only by pushing themselves to their limits could they hope to support their captain and achieve their dreams. Eno's eyes sparkled with wonder as she listened. That's amazing, Kaushin. They all sound like incredible individuals. Kaushin smiled. They are, I know. Each one of them possesses a unique spirit and unwavering determination that is truly inspiring. Hinata leaned in closer, eager to hear more. So, what happened after the two years? Did they meet up again? Kaushin nodded, his voice taking on a more hopeful tone. Yes, after two long years of intense training, they all returned to the agreed-upon meeting place, their hearts filled with anticipation and excitement. They had changed, grown stronger, more mature, and more skilled, but the bond they shared remained as strong as ever. Naruto grinned, feeling a sense of kinship with Luffy and his crew. I bet they were so excited to see each other again. Kaushin's eyes sparkled as he continued, they were, Naruto. There were tears of joy, laughter, and heartfelt embraces as they reunited. They marveled at each other's growth and shared their experiences from their time apart. Ino sighed, a wistful smile on her lips. That must have been such a beautiful moment. Kaushin smiled warmly at his friends. This story of Luffy and his Nakama is so beautiful because it's about friendship and how it can endure despite the trials and tribulations life throws our way. It reminded me of us, actually. We too spent almost three years apart, training and growing stronger. And now, here we are, together again. As he finished speaking, the others couldn't help but giggle and chuckle at the heartfelt sentiment. Eno looked at Kaushin with affectionate amusement. You're such a dork, Kaushin. Naruto, never one to miss an opportunity to join in the teasing, nodded emphatically. Yeah, the truest dork. Hinata, her cheeks flushed, simply giggled softly at the playful banter between her friends. Eno's eyes twinkled with mischief as she continued. You know, Kaushin, if you ever need some Nakama for your journey to become the king of the dorks, I think you'll find a lot of willing volunteers. Naruto immediately mock bowed, his face full of exaggerated seriousness. I am at your service, King Dork. Everyone laughed, their spirits high as they reveled in the camaraderie and the joy of being together once more. Kaushin, not one to be left out, joined in the laughter, shaking his head in mock exasperation. I see I have my work cut out for me if I want to maintain my title. 
Eno playfully nudged him, grinning from ear to ear. Oh, don't worry, Kaushin. I have complete faith in your ability to remain the king of dorks. Kaushin rolled his eyes, feigning annoyance, but the smile on his face betrayed his true feelings. Thank you, Eno. Your confidence in me is truly touching. Chapter 84, Queen of Dork Hinata, still giggling, decided to change the subject, her voice soft and earnest. Kaushin, thank you for sharing that story with us. It really is inspiring, and it reminds us of the power of friendship and determination. Kaushin's expression softened, and he nodded in appreciation. You're welcome, Hinata. I thought it was a story worth sharing, especially now that we're all together again. Naruto, his laughter subsiding, chimed in. Yeah, thanks, Kaushin. It was a great story. And you're right, it does remind us of how far we've come and how strong our bonds are. They all fell silent for a moment, the warm breeze rustling the leaves of the trees around them. The stars above shone brightly, and the soft glow of the moon bathed their faces in a gentle light. It was a peaceful moment, one that they all cherished as they thought about the love and support they had received from one another throughout their lives. Eno, her eyes gazing thoughtfully at the stars, broke the silence. You know, Kaushin, I think we're all really lucky to have each other. We've been through so much together, and we've always had each other's backs. Kaushin, with a playful glint in his eyes, looked at Eno and said, No wonder I fell for you, Pumpkin. You are my queen of dork. Then he leaned in and pressed his lips against hers, his arms wrapping around her waist. Eno laughed, the sound muffled by the kiss, before pulling back slightly to look at Kaushin with a teasing smile. Well, I suppose I'll take that as a compliment, King Dork. Hinata giggled at the exchange, her eyes filled with affection for her friends. You two are so adorable. Naruto, always eager to jump in on the fun, cleared his throat dramatically. Ahem, ahem. Hinata, my dear, you are the moon to my night sky, the ramen to my belly, the dash. He was cut off by Hinata's gentle laughter, her face flushing slightly. Naruto, you don't have to dash. But before she could finish, Naruto leaned in and planted a kiss on her lips, his arms wrapping around her waist. Hinata let out a soft gasp of surprise before melting into the kiss, her hands coming up to rest on Naruto's chest. Kaushin and Ino both chuckled at the display of affection, their own arms wrapped around each other as they watched their friends with fondness. After a few moments, Naruto and Hinata pulled back from their embrace, their faces flushed with a mixture of embarrassment and happiness. Kaushin grinned, his eyes filled with amusement. Well, it looks like our resident lovebirds are still going strong. Eno giggled, her eyes shining with affection for her friends. They are, aren't they? It's so sweet. Kaushin looked at Eno, the playful glint in each other's eyes reflecting their shared amusement. Well, they are team incredibly good-looking and talented, but they're not bad. Eno chimed in, her voice equally teasing, Well, yes, no one can compare to team incredibly good-looking and talented, but they're at least eager. Hinata and Naruto looked at Eno and Kaushin with feigned disgust, before Naruto smirked and decided to play along. Oh yeah? You think you're so much better, huh? Well, let me tell you something, you're looking at Team Unstoppable and Unbelievable over here. Hinata, though usually more reserved, decided to join in the fun. Yes, it seems that they have quite the high opinion of themselves. Kaushin grinned, clearly enjoying the banter. Well, it's not like we can help it. When you're as skilled and attractive as we are, it's hard not to be a little cocky. Naruto snorted, crossing his arms over his chest. Yeah, I guess it must be tough being you too. Ino tossed her hair over her shoulder, feigning offense. Excuse you, Naruto, but we've earned our titles. It takes hard work and dedication to be this good-looking and talented. Hinata bit back a smile, rolling her eyes playfully. Oh, of course. How could we forget? Hinata giggled, nodding in agreement. That's right. We may not be as good-looking as you two claim to be, but we've got our own strengths. 
Kaoshan raised an eyebrow, a playful smile tugging at his lips. Oh, really? I'd love to hear more about these supposed strengths of yours. Naruto grinned, puffing out his chest with pride. Well, for starters, I'm practically the best ninja in the village. I mean, have you seen my raisin gan? Ino snorted, her eyes rolling in mock exasperation. Oh, please, Naruto. That's old news. And don't forget, Kaoshin here can take you on any day. Kaoshin chuckled, nodding in agreement. It's true. I've got skills you haven't even dreamed of, Naruto. Hinata, her cheeks flushed with excitement, jumped in to defend Naruto. But Naruto has incredible determination and never gives up. That's something you can't beat with just skills alone. Kaoshin looked at Naruto with a smirk, adding, Sure, not getting enough ass kick is incredible determination and never giving up now. Naruto's eyes narrowed playfully, his competitive spirit kicking in. Oh, so you think you're so much better than me, huh? At least I don't go around calling myself the king of dorks. Kaoshin feigned shock, placing a hand on his chest dramatically. I'll have you know, Naruto, that title was bestowed upon me by the lovely Ino here. It's an honor to be recognized for my unique qualities. Ino chimed in, her eyes twinkling with mischief. That's right, Naruto. It's not every day that you come across someone who can balance dorkiness and awesomeness so perfectly. Hinata couldn't help but laugh, joining in on the playful teasing. Well, I must admit, Kaoshin, you do have a certain charm to you. Kaoshin grinned at her, winking in appreciation. Why, thank you, Hinata. I do try my best to maintain my image. Naruto scoffed, crossing his arms over his chest. Pfft, image. I bet you two spend hours in front of the mirror every day just trying to look good. Kaoshin and Ino looked at each other and started to laugh. Oh, Naruto, you've got it all wrong. We don't look in the mirror to try to look good. We just love to look at ourselves. Naruto raised an eyebrow, a smirk playing on his lips. Oh, is that so? Well, I guess it's true what they say. The more time you spend admiring yourself, the less time you have to notice how great everyone else is. Ino feigned indignation, her hands on her hips. Excuse you, Naruto, but we have plenty of time to notice other people's greatness. It's just that, well, it's hard not to be distracted by our own. Hinata's eyes sparkled with amusement as she joined in the banter. Ino, I think Naruto has a point. Maybe you and Kaoshin should spend less time admiring yourselves and more time appreciating the people around you. Kaoshin chuckled, his eyes crinkling with mirth. Oh, don't you worry, Hinata. We're well aware of the greatness that surrounds us. Right, Pumpkin? Right, Prince Muffin. Eno nodded earnestly. Kaoshin nodded, his eyes filled with playful determination. All right, then. If you insist, let's take a moment to truly appreciate the greatness of our fellow team members. He turned to Eno, his voice oozing with exaggerated sincerity. For example, I noticed that Eno has truly mastered the art of the perfect hair flip. It's truly a sight to behold. Eno grinned, batting her eyelashes dramatically. Why, thank you, Kaoshin. I do practice every day. Naruto rolled his eyes, while Hinata giggled at their antics. Eno, not to be outdone, turned to Kaoshin and said, Well, I noticed that Kaoshin is so incredibly talented at making up ridiculous nicknames. I mean, who else could come up with something as fantastic as Prince Muffin? Kaoshin bowed, his voice filled with mock pride. Thank you, Eno. It is indeed a rare talent, and one that I am quite proud of. Hinata and Naruto exchanged amused glances, their eyes twinkling with mirth. Kaoshin continued, his voice taking on an even more dramatic tone. I also noticed that Eno has an uncanny ability to pull off any outfit, no matter how outlandish or bizarre. It's as if she's a walking fashion show. Eno preened, her voice dripping with feigned modesty. Oh, Kaoshin, you're too kind. But it's true, I do have a certain flair for fashion. Naruto snorted, trying to suppress his laughter, 
while Hinata shook her head with an amused smile. Ino then turned her attention back to Kaushin. And I noticed that Kaushin has an almost supernatural talent for finding the most obscure and fascinating stories. It's as if he has a sixth sense for locating hidden gems. Kaushin beamed at the praise, his voice filled with mock seriousness. It's true, Ino. I am like a literary treasure hunter, unearthing the rarest and most valuable tales for the enjoyment of my friends. Hinata and Naruto couldn't help but laugh at the exchange, the playfulness of their friends infectious. Kaushin and Ino locked eyes, grinning widely as they prepared for another round of exaggerated compliments. However, Naruto and Hinata exchanged a knowing glance, deciding it was time to put an end to the over-the-top praise. They slowly stood up, stretching their limbs and feigning exhaustion. Naruto yawned loudly, his voice teasing. Well, you too, it's been, enlightening, but I think Hinata and I should probably get going. Hinata nodded, her eyes twinkling with amusement. Yes, it's getting late, and we wouldn't want to keep you from your, uh, self-admiration. Kaushin and Ino exchanged amused glances before turning to face their friends. Ino raised an eyebrow, a sly smile playing on her lips. Leaving so soon? We haven't even begun to scratch the surface of our greatness. Naruto rolled his eyes, grinning as he playfully retorted, Well, I think we've had our fill of your greatness for one evening. Hinata giggled, nodding in agreement. Besides, it's probably best if we leave you two to your activities. Kaushin winked at them, his voice filled with feigned disappointment. Ah, well. I suppose we'll just have to continue our session of self-appreciation without you. Eno laughed, playfully shoving Kaushin's shoulder. Yeah, I guess you'll just have to bask in our incredible good looks and talents on your own. Naruto shook his head, his voice dripping with mock disdain. You two really are the worst. Hinata giggled, covering her mouth with her hand. But in the most entertaining way. Kaushin bowed, his eyes filled with mischief. We aim to please, my dear friends. Eno smirked, crossing her arms over her chest. And we always hit our mark. Naruto and Hinata exchanged one last amused glance before they turned to leave. Naruto waved over his shoulder, his voice filled with teasing affection. Good night, you too. Try not to get too carried away with your self-admiration. Eno waved back, her voice equally playful. No promises, Naruto. Hinata giggled, offering a gentle wave to her friends. Good night, Eno, Kaushin. Take care. Kaushin grinned, raising a hand in farewell. Good night. You too. Sleep well, and dream of our incredible greatness. As Naruto and Hinata walked away, the sound of their laughter mingling with the soft rustle of leaves and the gentle chirping of crickets, Kaushin and Eno settled back onto the grass, their eyes twinkling with amusement. Eno sighed, her voice filled with mock seriousness. Well, Kaushin, it seems we've successfully driven away our friends with our overwhelming awesomeness. Kaushin chuckled, shaking his head. Indeed, Eno. It's a heavy burden we bear, being so incredibly good-looking and talented. Eno playfully nudged him, her eyes filled with affection. You know, I wouldn't trade our ridiculous banter for anything in the world. Kaushin's expression softened, and he leaned over to press a gentle kiss on Eno's forehead. Neither would I, Pumpkin. Neither would I. As they lay back on the grass, their fingers entwined and their hearts full of love and laughter, Kaushin and Ino knew that, despite their playful teasing, they were truly grateful for their friends and the bond they all shared. And as the stars twinkled overhead and the moon cast its gentle glow upon them, they knew that their friendship was something that would endure, no matter the trials and tribulations that life would bring. Chapter 85 Ready for Missions The next day, Kaushin and Naruto made their way to the Hokage building to pay a visit to Tsunade. The morning sun shone brightly on the bustling village, and the two friends walked side by side, chatting animatedly about various topics. They had both come a long way since their Jinin days, and their bond had grown even stronger over the years. As they entered Tsunade's office, they found Shikamaru and Tamari already there, deep in conversation with the Hokage about the upcoming Chunin exam. 
Tamari was acting as a liaison between Sunagakur and Kanadakur, while Shikamaru was set to be a proctor for the exams. The room was filled with the low hum of conversation, punctuated by the occasional rustle of paperwork. Sakura and Karen were also present, standing behind Tsunade as her students, while Shizen busied herself with her tasks, ensuring that the Hokage remained focused on her duties and didn't slip into her usual lazy habits. Upon their entrance, Tamari's eyes widened in shock as she took in the sight of Kaushin and Naruto. Both had changed significantly since she had last seen them, and she couldn't help but note the strength and confidence that seemed to emanate from them. Kaushin, noticing Tamari's gaze, offered her a friendly smile. Hey, Tamari. Long time no see. How have you been? Tamari blinked, quickly recovering from her surprise, and returned his smile. Kaushin, Naruto, it's good to see you both again. You both changed so much since we last met. Shikamaru glanced over, a lazy grin on his face. Well, if it isn't the dynamic duo. Here to offer your expert advice on the Chunin exams? Naruto chuckled, rubbing the back of his head sheepishly. Nah, we were just coming to say hi to Granny Tsunade. Tsunade, who had been listening to their conversation, looked up from her work and greeted them warmly. Ah, Kaushin, Naruto. Good to see you too. How have you been? Kaushin bowed respectfully, a hint of a smile on his lips. We've been well, Lady Tsunade. Thank you for asking. Naruto grinned, offering a quick bow as well. Yeah, we're doing great. As the conversation continued, Tamari found herself stealing glances at Kaushin and Naruto, still trying to reconcile the young boys she had known with the powerful shinobi standing before her. She could see the changes in their stance, the way they held themselves, and the confident gleam in their eyes. It was clear that they had both grown immensely during their time apart. Shikamaru, ever observant, noticed Tamari's scrutiny and smirked. You seem pretty interested in them, Tamari. Something on your mind? Tamari flushed slightly, but quickly composed herself. It's just, they both changed so much. I can tell they've gotten much stronger. Kaushin, sensing an opportunity for some light-hearted teasing, stealthily made his way over to Tamari, leaning in to whisper not so quietly in her ear. So, have you bagged the Narayar yet? Tamari's face immediately turned a deep shade of red, her eyes widening in shock at Kaushin's blunt question. She stammered, trying to formulate a response. W what? Kaushin, that's none of your business. Kaushin chuckled, enjoying her flustered reaction. Relax, Tamari. I'm just teasing. But seriously, you two seem to get along really well. Still blushing, Tamari huffed, crossing her arms over her chest. Well, yes, we do get along. But it's not like that. Kaushin smirked, deciding to let her off the hook. All right, all right. I believe you. Then, his expression turning playful once more, he added, Oh, by the way, you can look at me and Naruto as much as you want, but we're spoken for. Ino and Hinata would kill you, just saying. Tamari rolled her eyes, her blush fading as she regained her composure. Don't flatter yourself, Kaushin. I was merely observing how much you two have changed. Meanwhile, Karen, who had been watching the interactions from the sidelines, saw an opportunity to get closer to Naruto. She had harbored a crush on him for some time, and the thought of being near him set her heart racing. As she approached Naruto, she lightly touched his arm, drawing his attention. Hey, Naruto, she said softly, her eyes locked on his. Naruto blinked in surprise turning to face Karen. Oh, hey, Karen. What's up? Karen swallowed nervously, trying to appear casual. I just wanted to say that I've noticed how much you've grown as a shinobi, and I think it's really impressive. Naruto grinned, rubbing the back of his head sheepishly. Ah, thanks, Karen. That means a lot coming from you. Karen's cheeks flushed pink at his compliment, and she quickly looked away, trying to hide her obvious delight. Well, I mean it. You're really amazing, Naruto. Naruto's smile widened, 
his eyes shining with gratitude. Thanks, Karen. I really appreciate that. As the conversation between Naruto and Karen continued, Kaushin and Tamari rejoined Shikamaru and the others, resuming their discussion about the upcoming Chunin exams. Tsunade leaned back in her chair, her expression thoughtful. It's good to have all of you here. Your input will be invaluable in making this year's exams a success. Shikamaru nodded, his gaze serious. We'll do our best, Lady Tsunade. The future of our village depends on the success of the next generation. Tamari agreed, her eyes filled with determination. And we'll make sure to strengthen the ties between our villages through this event. Naruto, his conversation with Karen wrapping up, rejoined the group, nodding enthusiastically. Yeah, we've got this. We're going to make sure these exams are the best yet. After speaking for a while, Tamari and Shikamaru took their leave, bidding everyone farewell. Tsunade looked at Kaushin and Naruto, her expression a mix of pride and concern. Unable to contain his excitement, Naruto eagerly asked, So, Granny Tsunade, when can we start taking missions again? Tsunade sighed, rubbing her temples. She pulled a small cup and a bottle of sake from her drawer, pouring herself a drink before downing it in one gulp. You two are a headache, you know that, she grumbled. Seeing the serious look on Tsunade's face, Naruto sobered up. What's wrong? Tsunade put the bottle and cup away before continuing. It's hard to say. From what I saw during yesterday's spar, both you and Kaushin are already at Jounin level, and Hinata as well. Teaming the three of you with Kakashi would be a waste, but at the same time, you lack the experience that comes with taking on higher rank missions. Naruto frowned, considering Tsunade's words. He glanced at Kaushin, who seemed to be deep in thought. Tsunade then asked, Which elements have you two mastered during your training? Naruto perked up, eager to share his progress. I can use wind release pretty well now, and I've learned about ten fire release jutsu. Oh, and I created a really strong Raisingan wind variation. Shizun, who had been listening quietly, smiled and praised Naruto. That's very impressive, Naruto. You've come a long way. Sakura and Karen also chimed in, complimenting Naruto on his progress, their eyes shining with admiration. Tsunade nodded, looking pleased. Well done, Naruto. She then turned her attention to Kaushin, who had been grinning from ear to ear as he listened to Naruto's accomplishments. What about you, Kaushin? What have you learned? Kaushin's grin widened, his eyes glinting with mischief. Well, I can use lightning, fire, and earth release pretty well. Oh, and I've created ten or so other Raisin variations. The room fell silent, everyone staring at Kaushin with their jaws dropped. Even Tsunade looked taken aback. Shikamaru, who had lingered near the door after sending Tamari away, raised an eyebrow. You're joking, right? Kaushin shook his head, still grinning. Nope, not joking. I've really been working on my Raisin skills. Naruto gaped at his friend, his eyes wide with disbelief. Ten other variations? That's amazing, Kaushin. Sakura, Karen, and Shizun exchanged impressed glances, while Tsunade rubbed her forehead, looking both exasperated and proud at the same time. Finally, Tsunade spoke up. All right, you too. It's clear that you've both grown immensely during your time away. However, as I said before, you still lack experience. So, for now, I'll be assigning you both to a special team that will take on high-level missions. Naruto's eyes lit up, his excitement returning full force. Really? That's awesome. Kaushin nodded, his expression serious but determined. We won't let you down, Lady Tsunade. Tsunade smiled, her eyes filled with confidence in the young shinobi before her. I know you won't. You two have come a long way, and I'm sure you'll continue to grow even stronger. After Naruto nagged Tsunade more about the special team definition and what kind of missions they would take, she kicked them away, pretending to be busy with work. Chapter 86 Plot Begins The next day, 
Naruto excitedly pulled Kaushin and Hinata along to go and take a mission. When they arrived at the Hokage's office, they found Tsunade, Shizun, Karen, Sakura, and Kakashi all looking grim. Naruto's enthusiasm faded, replaced by concern as he asked, Hey, what's going on? Why the long faces? Tsunade looked up, her face solemn. We just received news that Suna has been attacked by the Akatsuki. Gara has been kidnapped, and Reisa, the fourth Kazakage, is critically injured. Naruto's eyes widened in shock, his heart pounding in his chest. What? Gara? They took Gara? The thought of his friend in the hands of the Akatsuki made him furious, and he clenched his fists tightly. They must be after the One Tail. We have to go save him. Tsunade nodded gravely, understanding the urgency of the situation. I agree, Naruto. That's why I'm assigning Team 7 to head to Suna immediately to support them. She looked at Kakashi, Kaushin, and Hinata, who all nodded their agreement. And Karen, you'll be joining them as well. Karen looked surprised but quickly nodded, determined to help. Of course, Lady Tsunade. Naruto glanced at his teammates, his eyes filled with determination. We'll save Gara, I promise. Kakashi placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder, his expression serious. We'll do everything we can, Naruto. Hinata nodded, her face set in a determined frown. We won't let the Akatsuki take Gara. Kaushin's eyes blazed with concern, but his voice was steady and strong. We're going to bring him back, Naruto, don't you worry. In his mind, he sighed as this meant the second part of the series had finally begun, and it seemed that the story was still unfolding according to the original. Sakura looked at her friends, her heart aching with worry. Be careful, all of you. The Akatsuki are dangerous. Shizu nodded, her eyes filled with concern. Yes, please take care of yourselves. Tsunade stared at the group, her expression a mix of pride and worry. I have faith in all of you. Now go, and may the spirits of our ancestors guide you. With that, Team 7 and Karen quickly gathered their gear and set off for Suna, traveling as fast as they could while making sure to conserve their energy. As they traveled, Naruto couldn't help but think about Gara and the bond they shared as Jinchuriki. He remembered how they had both struggled with the loneliness and isolation that came with being feared and hated by their own villages. Naruto knew firsthand the pain Gara must be feeling at the hands of the Akatsuki, and it only fueled his determination to save him. Kakashi, sensing Naruto's turmoil, spoke up. Naruto, I know you're worried about Gara, but you need to keep a clear head. We'll need to work together as a team if we're going to get him back. Naruto nodded, gritting his teeth. I know, Kakashi-sensei. It's just... Gara is like a brother to me. I can't stand the thought of him suffering. Hinata, who had been listening quietly, reached out to squeeze Naruto's hand reassuringly. We'll save him, Naruto. I know we will. Naruto looked at Hinata, his eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you, Hinata. I'm glad you're here with me. Kaushin, who had been walking slightly ahead, glanced back at his friends. We've got your back, Naruto. We're going to rescue Gara and put a stop to the Akatsuki's plans. Karen nodded, her eyes filled with determination. We won't let them get away with this. As they drew closer to Suna, the team could sense the tension in the air, they were joined by worried Tamari, who was returning to Suna. The village was on high alert, with guards posted at every entrance. In the Kazakage's room, old man Ebizo and old woman Chio sat alongside Baki, each with a grim expression on their face as they discussed the current situation. The atmosphere was heavy with worry and uncertainty. As Tamari entered the room with Team 7 and Karen, the trio looked up at them, their eyes filled with a mix of hope and desperation. Tamari quickly crossed the room, her heart aching for her brothers. What happened? How did they manage to capture Gara? Baki sighed, running a hand through his hair. Two Akatsuki members arrived in the evening, close to nightfall. One of them was floating on a white bird, while the other was on the ground. 
The one on the ground turned out to be the puppet master Sasori, Chiyosama's grandson. Chiyo clenched her fists, her eyes filled with a mix of anger and sorrow. My foolish grandson. To think he would join such a vile organization. Ebizo shook his head, his expression grave. Gara and Reisa attacked them in an effort to protect the village, but even after killing the man in the air twice, they couldn't bring him down. It was as if he had some sort of regenerative ability. Kaushin frowned, his mind racing as he tried to piece together the puzzle. Wait a minute. You said the man in the air died twice? Did his eyes have black scarab by any chance? Baki looked at Kaushin, surprised by his question, and nodded. Yes, that's right. How did you know? Kaushin's face darkened as he realized the implications of the situation. That's Edo Tensei, Orochimaru's technique that resurrects the dead. Both of them were probably already dead when they attacked. Naruto clenched his fists, anger coursing through him. So, they're using the bodies of dead shinobi to do their dirty work? That's disgusting. Kakashi put a hand on Naruto's shoulder, trying to calm him. It's a despicable technique, but we need to focus on rescuing Gara right now. Hinata looked at Chio, her eyes filled with determination. We'll bring your grandson to justice, and we'll save Gara. Kaushin's thoughts raised as he tried to make sense of the information they'd been given. He knew that Daidara and Sasori were members of the Akatsuki and not simply being used by them. But why were they dead and resurrected? Was this a consequence of something he had caused? Tamari's voice brought Kaushin out of his reverie. Where are Kankuro and my father? she asked urgently. Chio looked defeated, her eyes filled with sorrow. Ebizo took a deep breath before explaining. Both Kankuro and your father have been poisoned by Sasori's puppets. Even Chio has been unable to treat them. Karen, who had been quietly listening, suddenly spoke up. I can heal them. Just take me to them. Chio raised an eyebrow, skepticism written on her face. Young lady, I am one of the greatest medical nin in Suna, and even I cannot treat Sasori's poisons. What makes you think you can do any better? Karen met Chiyo's gaze, her expression resolute. I am Tsunade's student. I have been learning medical ninjutsu under her guidance for years. If there's a chance to save them, I'll do whatever it takes. Chiyo hesitated, clearly still skeptical, but the desperation in her eyes eventually won out. Very well. I will take you to them, but remember, Sasori's poisons are nothing to trifle with. Karen nodded, rolling up her sleeves. I understand, but I won't back down without trying. Chapter 87 Achiha Clan Members As Chio led Karen to Kankuro and Reisa, the others discussed their next course of action. Naruto's eyes blazed with determination. We have to find Gara and rescue him. We can't let the Akatsuki get away with this. Kakashi nodded, his gaze equally resolute. Agreed. We'll need to gather as much information as possible and plan our next move. Tamari looked at her friends, gratitude shining in her eyes. Thank you, all of you. I know Gara would be touched to see how much you care. Hinata smiled gently at Tamari. We're all in this together. Gara is our friend, too, and we won't abandon him. Kaushin clenched his fists, his expression grim. The Akatsuki won't know what hit them. We'll make sure of it. As they discussed their strategy, Karen and Chio reached the room where Kankuro and Reisa lay unconscious, their skin tinged with a sickly pallor. Karen's heart clenched at the sight of them, but she steeled herself, knowing she couldn't afford to hesitate. She knelt down beside Kankuro, placing her hands gently on his chest. Her hands began to glow with a soft green light as she channeled her chakra into his body, using her medical ninjutsu to identify and counteract the poison coursing through his veins. Karen's eyes narrowed in concentration as she worked tirelessly to identify the poison that was ravaging Kankuro and Reisa's bodies. After several tense moments, she let out a sigh of relief. I found the poison. Now I just need to create an antidote. Chio watched in amazement as Karen's hands continued to glow, working quickly and efficiently to synthesize an antidote directly within their bodies. 
Before long, Kankaro and Reisa's pallor began to improve, their breathing steadying as the poison was neutralized. With a final burst of chakra, Karen removed her hands from Kankaro's chest, slumping back in exhaustion. I did it, she panted, relief and pride shining in her eyes. Kankaro and Reisa slowly stirred, their eyes fluttering open as they looked around in confusion. What? What happened? Kankaro croaked, his voice weak but steady. Before Chio could respond, Karen interjected. You were both poisoned by Sasori's puppets. I managed to create an antidote and heal you. Kankaro looked at Karen, his eyes filled with gratitude. Thank you. I don't know what to say. Karen smiled, her exhaustion momentarily forgotten. You don't need to say anything. Just focus on recovering. As Kankaro and Reisa began to regain their strength, Kankaro handed Team 7 a piece of Sasori's clothing. This should help you track him down. Kakashi nodded, taking the cloth and summoning his ninkin, or summon dogs. The dogs sniffed the cloth intently, then began to follow the scent, leading Team 7, Chio, and Tamari towards Sasori's location. Naruto, eager to save Gara, wanted to rush ahead as fast as possible. Kaushin, however, placed a hand on Naruto's shoulder, urging him to calm down. Naruto, we need to rest. We won't be able to save Gara if we're too exhausted to fight. Reluctantly, Naruto agreed, and the group settled down for the night to regain their strength. The next morning, Team 7, Chio, and Tamari set off once more, leaving Karen behind to continue treating Kankaro and Reisa. They followed the Ninkin as they tracked Sasori's scent, determination, and resolve etched on their faces. As they hurried through the desert, the group was suddenly confronted by three unexpected figures, Inabi Uchiha, along with two other Uchihas, Taisiki and Muku. Kakashi's eyes widened in shock as he recognized the trio from the Kanoha police force, thought to have been killed by Itachi during the Uchiha massacre. Kakashi's gaze flicked to their eyes, noting the black scara that indicated they were resurrected using Edo Tensei. Inabi, Taisiki, Muku. You're supposed to be dead. Who brought you back? Inabi's eyes burned with a mixture of hatred and bitterness as he glared at the members of Team 7. We were brought back by someone who shares our hatred for Kanoha, he spat, his voice dripping with venom. Our entire clan was massacred, even our children, all because the village feared the power of the Uchiha. We've been given a chance for vengeance, and we intend to take it. Taisiki and Muku nodded in agreement, their faces twisted into snarls of fury. We don't care about your mission, Taisiki hissed. All we want is to see you Kanoha ninjas suffer as we have. Muku's eyes narrowed, his voice cold and unforgiving. We were once proud protectors of the village, and yet they turned on us, slaughtering our families without mercy. You won't be able to stop us from exacting our revenge. Kakashi looked at the trio with a mixture of sadness and resolve. I understand your pain, but attacking us won't change the past. We are not the one that killed you, he is the one who controls you. Inabi scoffed, his hatred unabated. Your words mean nothing to us. The village betrayed our trust, and for that, they will pay. Hinata's fists clenched at her sides, her heart aching for the Uchiha, but she knew they couldn't let their emotions get the better of them. We can't let you stand in our way, she said firmly. We have a mission to complete, and we won't let you or anyone else stop us. Naruto stepped forward, his eyes filled with determination. I know how it feels to be hated and feared, he said, his voice steady. But we can't let that hatred control us. We have to look towards the future, not dwell on the past. The resurrected Uchiha remained unmoved by Naruto's words, their eyes dark and unforgiving. Inabi sneered, your empty platitudes mean nothing to us. We will have our revenge, no matter the cost. Kaushin, who had been watching the exchange in silence, finally spoke up, his voice calm and soothing. In the end, you are following the person who massacred you all. Taisiki spat, his eyes narrowed. You think we care about your opinions? We will destroy everything you hold dear, just as our lives were destroyed. Muku's voice was cold and unforgiving. 
Kanoha will pay for what they did to our clan, and you will be the first to fall. Kakashi sighed, knowing that reasoning with the Uchiha would be futile. If you insist on standing in our way, we will have no choice but to fight. Inabi's eyes flashed with murderous intent. So be it. Prepare to meet your end, Kanoha Scum. Chapter 88 Team Seven's Prowess The tense atmosphere around them crackled with energy as both sides braced for battle. Naruto clenched his fists, determined to protect his friends and complete their mission. Hinata's eyes were filled with resolve, her hands glowing with chakra as she prepared to defend her teammates. Kaushin, his face set in grim determination, raised his hands in a defensive stance, ready to face the vengeful Uchiha. Kaushin turned to Kakashi, his expression resolute. Sensei, stay back and save your chakra. It's time to show you how much Team 7 has improved. He then addressed Hinata and Naruto, his voice steady and full of purpose. To defeat the resurrected, we have to seal them, otherwise, they'll keep regenerating. Hinata and Naruto nodded, understanding the gravity of the situation. They would take on the other two Uchiha, while Kaushin would battle with Inabi. Hinata faced her opponent, Taisiki, determination shining in her eyes. As she prepared for battle, she channeled her chakra, infusing it with her water release. With her gentle fist technique at the ready, she allowed the water to flow around her body like a graceful, deadly dance. Taisiki sneered at Hinata, clearly underestimating her abilities. You think your pretty little water tricks will stop me? Pathetic. Hinata's eyes narrowed, her resolve unwavering. My abilities are not to be taken lightly. With a burst of speed, Hinata launched herself at Taisiki, her hands glowing with chakra. Taisiki responded in kind, his Sharingan eyes flickering as he attempted to predict her movements. As they clashed, Hinata gracefully maneuvered around Taisiki's attacks, her water release creating an elegant and fluid dance that left her opponent struggling to keep up. She struck at his chakra points, her gentle fist technique precise and controlled. Taisiki gritted his teeth, frustration mounting as he found himself unable to land a solid hit on Hinata. He attempted to use his fire release to counter her water release, but the fluidity of her movements made it difficult for him to land a decisive blow. Hinata sensed an opening and swiftly closed the distance between them, her hands glowing with chakra as she aimed a strike at Taisiki's chest. He managed to dodge at the last moment, but Hinata's water release followed her movements, slashing at him like a whip and leaving a deep gash in his side. Taisiki hissed in pain, his anger flaring. You'll pay for that, girl. Undeterred, Hinata continued her assault, her dance of water only growing more intense and focused. She could feel Taisiki's chakra weakening with each successful strike, but she knew she couldn't afford to let her guard down. With the knowledge that he would regenerate if she didn't seal him, she began to weave the necessary hand signs for a sealing technique. Seeing Hinata's hands move, Taisiki realized her intentions and launched a desperate counterattack, a barrage of fireballs hurtling towards her. But Hinata's water danced around her, intercepting the flames and dousing them before they could reach her. As the last of the fireballs fizzled out, Hinata saw her opportunity. She lunged at Taisiki, her hand outstretched and glowing with chakra. Hinata, her hands glowing with chakra, formed the last hand sign necessary for her technique. Eight trigrams palms revolving heaven, she shouted, her voice ringing with determination. As she spun, her chakra-laden hands released a torrent of water, which swirled around her in a dome, enveloping both her and Taisiki. The sheer force of the water kept her opponent at bay, preventing him from retaliating. Taisiki's eyes widened as he realized what was happening, his anger turning to desperation. You won't get away with this, he snarled, trying to break free from the water's grasp. But Hinata was unyielding, her concentration unwavering. She focused her chakra into the water, causing it to slowly freeze, trapping Taisiki in a prison of ice. As the last of the water solidified, Hinata formed the necessary hand signs and channeled her chakra into the ice, sealing Taisiki within. I'm sorry, she whispered, her voice heavy with sorrow. But I can't let you continue down this path of hatred. 
Meanwhile, Naruto faced off against Muku, his eyes filled with determination. He grasped the hilt of his sword, channeling his chakra to add wind release to the blade. The wind followed each of his slashes, increasing both the range and sharpness of his attacks. Muku sneered at Naruto, undeterred by his opponent's skill. You think your wind tricks will be enough to defeat me? He taunted, his Sharingan eyes flickering menacingly. Naruto's expression remained steadfast. I'll show you just how strong I've become, he declared, lunging forward with his sword. The two fighters clashed, their weapons clashing and sparking with each strike. Naruto's wind release gave him an edge, but Muku's Sharingan allowed him to predict and counter many of his attacks. In an attempt to overwhelm Muku, Naruto used his Kage Bunshin technique to create multiple shadow clones, each wielding a wind-enhanced sword. Muku's eyes widened as he realized he was now facing an army of Naruto's, but he quickly regained his composure. You'll have to do better than that. Muku shouted, launching a barrage of fireballs at the clones. However, Naruto had anticipated this reaction. As the fireballs made contact with his clones, they exploded, using his clone explosion jutsu to create a series of devastating blasts that forced Muku on the defensive. While Muku was distracted, Naruto moved in for the attack, utilizing a series of wind release techniques to keep his opponent off balance. He sent gusts of wind slicing through the air, forcing Muku to dodge and weave to avoid being cut. Muku's frustration was palpable as he struggled to counter Naruto's relentless assault. You may be strong, but you're still no match for me, he spat, his voice shaking with anger. Naruto's eyes narrowed, his determination unwavering. I won't give up, no matter what, he shouted, continuing his barrage of wind-release attacks. As the battle raged on, Naruto noticed Muku's movements becoming slower and more labored. Sensing an opportunity, he increased the intensity of his attacks, pushing Muku to his limits. Finally, Naruto saw an opening and leaped forward, his wind-enhanced sword aimed directly at Muku's chest. Muku's eyes widened in surprise as he realized he couldn't dodge in time, and Naruto's blade found its mark, cutting a deep gash into his opponent's body. Before Muku could regenerate, Naruto quickly used Earth Release to create a stone tomb around him. Channeling his chakra, he sealed Muku within, ensuring he wouldn't be able to break free. At the same time, Kaushin and Inabi began their own battle. Inabi was a formidable opponent, with his Sharingan and expert-level fire release techniques combined with Earth Release. However, Kaushin was not one to be intimidated. Inabi glared at Kaushin, his eyes filled with hatred. You think you can defeat me? You're just a foolish child. Kaushin simply smirked, not taking Inabi's words to heart. Oh, come on, is that really the best you've got? I was hoping for a bit more of a challenge. This only served to enrage Inabi further, and he launched a powerful fire release technique at Kaushin. But Kaushin was prepared, using his own fire release to counter the attack. You might be a powerful Uchiha, Inabi, but let's see how you handle my Raisin variations. Kaushin taunted, a playful glint in his eyes. Inabi's expression darkened as he prepared to face Kaushin's onslaught. You'll regret underestimating me, brat. Chapter 89, Reinforcements Arrived Kaushin launched a series of Raisin attacks, each infused with one of his elemental affinities. As the attacks flew towards Inabi, he struggled to keep up, his Sharingan working overtime to predict and counter Kaushin's moves. Kaushin decided to change things up, using his Rasen shield to deflect Inabi's fire release. He then followed up with a Rasen Senbon, spinning Senbons of Chakra that he threw towards Inabi. The Uchiha barely managed to dodge the attack, his eyes wide with surprise. You're not bad, Inabi, but you're not great either, Kaushin taunted, continuing to barrage his opponent with his Raisin variations. Inabi gritted his teeth, frustration mounting as he struggled to land a decisive blow on Kaushin. You won't beat me with your childish tricks, he snarled, launching another powerful fire release technique. Kaushin simply laughed, using his katan, Raisin Gan to counter the attack. The two fire techniques collided, creating a massive explosion that sent a shockwave through the area. As the smoke cleared, 
Kaoshin decided it was time to finish the fight. He quickly created a Rasen spear infused with earth release, hurling it towards Inabi. The weapon impaled itself into the ground near the Uchiha, imploding upon contact and trapping him in a prison of earth. Inabi's eyes widened as he realized he was trapped, his anger and hatred quickly turning to desperation. You won't get away with this, he spat, struggling to break free. Kaoshin shook his head, his expression a mix of sympathy and determination. I'm sorry, Inabi, but we can't let you continue on this path of hatred. With a final hand sign, Kaoshin sealed Inabi within the earthen prison, effectively putting an end to the battle. Happy with their wins, Kaoshin, Hinata, and Naruto returned to Kakashi and Chio, who looked surprised. Especially Chio, who was utterly shocked. All three of them had demonstrated monstrous abilities in their battles. Kaoshin grinned, wiping the sweat from his brow. Well, that went better than expected. Hinata nodded, her eyes still reflecting a hint of sadness from her battle with Taisiki. Yes, but it's a shame it had to come to this. Naruto's expression mirrored Hinata's, his thoughts lingering on his own battle with Muku. I know what you mean, Hinata. But we had no choice. We had to stop them from causing any more harm. Kakashi approached the trio, clapping them on the back. You all did an excellent job. I'm proud of each of you. Chio, still awestruck, finally found her voice. I must admit, I never imagined you three would be so powerful. You truly are exceptional shinobi. Narek chuckled, rubbing the back of his head. We've all had our fair share of challenges and learned from them. We couldn't have done it without our mentors and friends. Hinata smiled softly at the compliment. Thank you, Chiyosama. We've worked hard to get where we are today. Naruto's eyes gleamed with determination even further. And we're not done yet. We'll continue to grow stronger and protect the people we care about. Kakashi nodded, his one visible eye crinkling with a smile. That's the spirit. But for now, let's continue going after Gara. There is a cave ahead and Gara must be there. As they arrived at the cave, Kaoshin was expected to see Guy's team, but to his absolute surprise they saw Tima Suma coming towards them as well. Kaoshin dashed toward Ino, visibly concerned. Ino, are you okay? he asked, scanning her for any injuries. Ino smiled reassuringly at him. I'm fine, Kaoshin. Thanks for worrying about me. Kaoshin sighed in relief, thinking to himself, why did Tsunade send Ino's team? In the anime, she sent Guy's team. Ino explained that her team had encountered a shark-like person, but they were able to defeat him using their newly improved techniques. Their attention then turned to the giant stone at the entrance of the cave. Kakashi inspected the seal on the stone and explained in his usual lazy demeanor, this is a five-seal barrier. The user connects five forbidden tags to each other using their own chakra. One of the tags is applied to a central location that the user wishes to shut access to, while the other four are applied to surfaces in the surrounding area. So long as at least one of the tags remains in place, a barrier will be created over the central location that prevents it from being opened or in any way physically damaged. He continued, if you want to remove the barrier, you'll need to break into two small teams for maximum efficiency, one team focuses on removing the four surrounding tags, while the second team removes the central tag and immediately afterwards storms the stronghold. Kakashi then instructed Hinata to use her Byakugan to search for the other four seals. After locating them, Asuma suggested that his team would handle the four surrounding seals while Kakashi's team dealt with the central one. Before they could go their separate ways, Kaoshin stopped them. Naruto, I think you should inspect the seal too, he said, an air of caution in his voice. Naruto and Kaoshin approached the seal, and Naruto soon realized there were traps within the seals that would form strong opponents when Chakra was transferred to break them. Kaoshin turned to Ino and Shikamaru. Ino, you should use a small animal to remove the tags, and Shikamaru, you can use your Kage control on a small animal as well. Once you defeat the opponents created by the seal, go and help Asuma and Choji. Everyone nodded in agreement and dispersed to their respective tasks. As Team Asuma set off to deal with the surrounding tags, Kaoshin, Naruto, 
Hinata, and Kakashi prepared to break the central seal. The atmosphere was tense, each of them knowing the stakes of their mission. Kakashi looked at his team, his voice serious. Everyone, be on your guard. We don't know what kind of opponents these seals will create. Hinata nodded, her eyes filled with determination. We'll be ready, Kakashi-sensei. Naruto clenched his fists, his eyes blazing. Yeah, we'll show them what we're made of. Kaoshin grinned, his confidence unwavering. Let's do this. Chapter 90, Gara. As they approached the central seal, they could feel the oppressive chakra emanating from it. They shared a quick glance, each silently acknowledging the potential danger ahead. When Team Asuman gave the signal, Kakashi removed the tag from the central stone, while Kaushin and Naruto prepared their Rasengan. With a shared nod, they unleashed their attacks, each hurling a giant Rasengan at the massive rock. The two techniques collided with the stone, sending a powerful shockwave through the area. As the dust cleared, they saw three figures inside the now-open cavern. Daidara sat smirking atop his white clay bird, Sasori stood within his puppet Hiroko, and Gara hovered on a patch of sand, his expression unreadable. Naruto's eyes widened with relief when he saw Gara. Gara, he exclaimed, starting to move towards him, only to be stopped by Kaushin's hand on his shoulder. Be careful, Naruto, Kaushin warned, his voice tense. We don't know what's going on yet. Naruto hesitated but nodded, keeping his gaze on Gara. Gara, are you all right? We're here to help you. Gara's eyes met Naruto's, a mixture of gratitude and sadness in his expression. Thank you, Naruto, he said softly. But I've joined the Akatsuki now. They removed the one tail from my body, freeing me from its burden. I'm also free from my father's control. Naruto stared at Gara in shock, his heart aching. But Gara, that's not the way. You don't have to join them. You have friends who care about you, who will stand by you no matter what. We can help you. Gara's eyes filled with pain, his voice barely a whisper. I appreciate your concern, Naruto, but this is my choice. I can't return to my old life. Kakashi spoke up, his voice firm. Gara, we can't let you stay with the Akatsuki. We know what they're capable of, and we can't risk them using you for their own purposes. Daidara scoffed from his perch on the clay bird. You think you can just waltz in here and take the kid back? I'd like to see you try. Sasori's voice echoed from within Hiroko. You're outmatched. Leave now, and we'll let you live. Chio stepped forward, her voice trembling with a mix of anger and sadness. Sasori, my dear grandson, why are you speaking in favor of the Akatsuki? Can't you see they brought you back from the dead only to enslave you to their cause? Daidara and Sasori burst into laughter, their mocking cackles echoing throughout the cavern. Naruto and Hinata exchanged concerned glances, while Kakashi and Chio remained stoic, waiting for the laughter to subside. Finally, Sasori spoke, his voice devoid of emotion. The true art is immortality. Daidara and I died willingly to be resurrected by Edo Tensei so we can create the arts we devoted ourselves to for the rest of eternity. We are controlled, we are as free as we can be. Naruto clenched his fists in frustration, his voice rising in anger. You call this freedom? You're both being used by the Akatsuki for their twisted goals. How can you not see that? Daidara smirked, his eyes narrowing. You just don't get it, do you, brat? We chose this path because it allows us to fully embrace our art without any limits. Hinata bit her lip, trying to find the right words. But is it worth it? To sacrifice your humanity, your connections with others, all for the sake of your art? What kind of life is that? Sasori's expression darkened, his tone bitter. It's better than living as a puppet, constantly manipulated by others. At least now, we're the ones pulling the strings. Chiyo's eyes filled with tears, her voice cracking. Sasori, I never wanted you to feel that way. I'm so sorry for everything that's happened to you, but this isn't the answer. You don't have to continue down this path. Sasori regarded his grandmother with a mix of anger and sadness. 
you don't understand, grandmother. This is the only way for me to be free. Kaushin shook his head, a grin spreading across his face as he mocked the two resurrected Akatsuki members. You guys really are something else, huh? So desperate for immortality that you've turned yourselves into living corpses, walking around like zombies. How pathetic. Didara's face twisted in anger at Kaushin's words. You little brat. What do you know about true art? You're just a foolish kid who's never faced the harsh reality of the world. Kaushin chuckled, though deep down, he was unsettled. This was yet another deviation from the anime caused by his actions. If the Akatsuki members turned into resurrected corpses with endless chakra, they would only become even stronger. He couldn't let his guard down, but he couldn't let his fear show either. But what bothered him most was Gara. He should have killed him when he had the chance. He thought, no he hoped that Gara would be useful at the end game, but he switched to enemy team. Reality, huh? Kaushin continued to taunt them, his tone light and mocking. Well, let me tell you something about reality. True strength doesn't come from living forever like some kind of twisted monster. It comes from the connections we make, the people we care about, and the things we're willing to fight for. What you guys are doing, it's just sad. Sassari's eyes narrowed, his voice cold and unfeeling. You think you understand us, but you don't. You can't possibly fathom the depths of our art. Naruto's eyes blazed with determination as he stepped forward, addressing Sasori and Daidara. Kaushin's right. No matter how powerful you think you are, you're still just puppets being controlled by the Akatsuki. We're going to stop you, and we're going to save Gara. Daidara scoffed, his voice dripping with disdain. As if you could even lay a finger on us. You're all just a bunch of naive fools. Before the situation could escalate further, a new figure appeared in the cave. Toby, the masked man of the Akatsuki, had arrived. What's all this noise? he asked, his voice deep and menacing. Daidara, Sasori, it's time to go. We have work to do. Daidara glared at Kaushin and the others. Fine. But this isn't over. We'll meet again, and when we do, you'll regret ever crossing paths with us. As they prepared to leave, Toby turned his attention to Kakashi. Ah, Kakashi Hataki, he said, a sinister edge to his voice. Before I go, I think I'll take back my gift. Chapter 91, Lost Sharingan Kakashi's eyes widened in shock, his mind racing to understand what Toby meant. Before he could react, Abito appeared out of nowhere, standing next to Kakashi. With a swift, precise movement, Abito's fingers closed around Kakashi's Sharingan eye, ripping it out of its socket. Kakashi cried out in pain, his hand flying to his face as blood poured from the empty eye socket. What have you done? he demanded, his voice a mix of agony and fury. Toby smirked behind his mask, his voice cold and devoid of emotion. It was never truly yours to begin with, Hataki. I gave you that Sharingan as a means to protect Rin, and yet you used it to kill her. Kakashi's eye widened in shock, his breathing heavy as he struggled to comprehend what he was hearing. Oh, Abido, he stuttered, his voice shaking with pain and disbelief. The realization that his long-lost friend was not only alive but filled with hatred for him was almost too much to bear. Abido's eyes burned with fury as he continued to berate Kakashi. Yes, that's right. I know what happened, Kakashi. I know that Rin was sealed with the Three Tails and that she was going to be used to destroy Kanoha. I know everything. Kakashi tried to speak, his voice weak and desperate. Abito, please, let me explain. I didn't want to kill Rin, but... Abito cut him off, his voice dripping with venom. But what, Kakashi? You still killed her. With the very gift I gave you to protect her. How could you betray me like that? Kakashi's face crumpled in anguish, tears streaming down his cheeks as he fought to find the words to explain himself. But there was no time, Abito was already turning away, preparing to leave with Daidara, Sasori, and Gara in tow. As the group prepared to vanish, Gara looked back at Naruto, his eyes filled with regret. Naruto, I'm sorry. 
I cannot stay in my village any longer. This is the only way for me. Naruto stared at Gara, his heart breaking as he saw his friend being taken away by the Akatsuki. Gara, please, don't go, he pleaded, desperation tinging his voice. We can help you. But it was too late. With a swirl of black and red, the Akatsuki members and Gara vanished, leaving Naruto and the others standing in the now empty cavern. Naruto's fists clenched, his entire body shaking with anger and sorrow. We'll get him back, he vowed, his voice filled with determination. We'll save Gara and bring him home. Hinata placed a comforting hand on Naruto's shoulder, her eyes filled with sadness. We'll do everything we can, Naruto. I promise. Kaushin looked at Kakashi, who was still reeling from the revelation of Abito's true identity and the loss of his Sharingan. The pain in Kakashi's eye was evident, and Kaushin couldn't help but feel a pang of sympathy for his sensei. He walked over to him, and as he did, he recalled an ability he had gained years ago but had never used. It was a long shot, but Kaushin was desperate to help Kakashi. Kakashi-sensei, Kaushin said gently, his hand hovering over the empty eye socket. I'm going to try something. It might help. Kakashi, still in shock, could only nod weakly, his breathing heavy as he tried to process everything that had just happened. Kaushin closed his eyes and took a deep breath, focusing his chakra. In his mind, he recited the words, Key of Redemption, this key grants the user the power to heal wounds. Once in three years, the user can use it to heal himself or someone else of physical or emotional wounds. When used on an item, it can repair and restore it to its original state, even if it was previously broken or damaged. As Kaushin concentrated on the power within him, a soft, warm light began to emit from his hand. The light enveloped Kakashi's eye socket, and Kaushin could feel the energy from the key of redemption flowing into his sensei. Kakashi winced as he felt a strange sensation in his empty eye socket. It started as a slight itch, but soon grew more intense, making him squirm in discomfort. But then, just as suddenly as it had begun, the itching sensation subsided, and Kakashi felt something he hadn't experienced in years, the presence of his original eye. Kaushin slowly removed his hand, revealing Kakashi's restored eye. It wasn't the Sharingan, but the eye he had lost all those years ago. Sighing in relief, Kaushin smiled at Kakashi, who stared back in amazement. The others looked on in shock, their expressions a mix of awe and fear. Naruto was the first to break the silence, his voice filled with wonder. Kaushin, how did you do that? Kaushin hesitated for a moment before explaining. It's an ability I gained due to my summons. I can only use it once every three years, though. Chio slumped down to the ground, her face etched with despair. Her last hope had been to save her grandson's soul, freeing him from the Akatsuki's control, and if not that, then to die saving Gara for the village. But she had failed in both. Sasori was acting freely against Suna, and Gara had betrayed them. Kakashi, his eyes still throbbing from Kaushin's healing, crouched down beside her, his voice gentle. Chiyosama, I'm so sorry. We'll find a way to save Sasori and Gara. We won't give up. Chiyo shook her head, tears streaming down her cheeks. What's the point, Kakashi? I've failed them both. I couldn't save Sasori from his own darkness, and now Gara has been taken by the Akatsuki. It's all my fault. Naruto knelt down beside her, his voice firm but kind. Chiyobasama, it's not your fault. You did everything you could. We all did. We'll keep fighting, and we'll bring them both back. I promise. Hinata joined them, her eyes filled with empathy. Naruto's right. We won't give up on them. We'll find a way to bring them back to the light. Chio looked up at their determined faces, her heart heavy with sadness. I appreciate your words, but I fear it's too late for me. I don't have much time left, and I've lost my will to live. My life has been filled with regrets and failures, and now. I don't see any reason to go on. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 4. Peace.